anti-corruption reforms in Ukraine. So the national security staff understood what was in the U.S. national security interests, and that was rooting out corruption. And they encouraged the president to talk about it. But as you see from the record of the call, and I joined the president saying, read the call, that topic was never addressed. The word corruption never escapes his lips. Instead, President Trump openly pressed President Zelensky to pursue the two investigations that would benefit him personally. In response to President Zelensky's gratitude for the significant military support the United States has provided to Ukraine, President Trump said, I would like you to do us a favor, though, because our country has been through a lot, and Ukraine knows a lot about it. I would like you to find out what happened with this whole situation with Ukraine. They say CrowdStrike. I guess you have one of your wealthy people, the server. They say Ukraine has it. That's that crazy conspiracy theory I talked about earlier, that there's this server somewhere in Ukraine that shows that, in fact, it was Ukraine that hacked the DNC, not the Russians. That's a Russian propaganda conspiracy theory, and here it is being promulgated by the President of the United States, and more than promulgated, he's pressuring an ally to further this Russian propaganda. Because he was referring to this extensively discredited conspiracy theory, that Ukraine was the one who really hacked the DNC, the Democratic National Committee servers, in 2016. And that reference to CrowdStrike, well, that's an American cybersecurity firm. And the theory, this kooky conspiracy theory, is that CrowdStrike moved the DNC servers to Ukraine to prevent U.S. law enforcement from getting them. If Ukraine announced an investigation into this fabrication, President Trump would remove what he perceived to be a cloud over his legitimacy, the legitimacy of his last election, Russia's assistance with his campaign, and suggest that it was the Democratic Party that was the real beneficiary of help. On the call, President Trump told Zelensky, whatever you can do, it's very important that you do it if that's possible. President Zelensky agreed that he would do the investigation, saying, yes, it is very important for me and everything that you just mentioned earlier. President Trump then turned to his second request, asking President Zelensky to look into the sham allegation into former Vice President Biden. President Trump said to President Zelensky, the other thing, there's a lot of talk of, about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution. And a lot of people want to find out about that, so whatever you can do with the Attorney General would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution, so if you could look into it, it, it sounds horrible to me. There is no question that President Trump intended in pressing the Ukraine leader to look into his political rival. Even after the impeachment inquiry began, he confirmed his desire on the South Lawn of the White House, declaring not only that Ukraine should investigate Biden, but that China should do the same. Let's, let's see what he said. Well, I would think that if they were honest about it, they'd start a major investigation into the Bidens. It's a very simple answer. Uh, they should investigate the Bidens, because how does a company that's newly formed and all these companies, if you look at, and by the way, likewise, China should start an investigation into the Bidens, because what happened in China is just about as bad as what happened with, uh, with Ukraine. Now, the day after that July 25th phone call, President Trump sought confirmation that President Zelensky understood his request to announce the politically motivated investigations and that he would follow through. After meeting with Ukrainian officials, President Zelensky and his top aide, the president's handpicked ambassador to the European Union, Gordon Sondland, called President Trump from an outdoor restaurant in Kiev to report back. This was the second conversation between the two about Ukraine in as many days. David Holmes, an American diplomat, dining with Sondland, overheard the call. 
including the President's voice through the cell phone. I described part of that call last night. Holmes testified that President Trump asked Sondland, so he's going to do the investigation? Sondland replied that he's going to do it, adding that President Zelensky will do anything you ask him to. After the phone call, Holmes took the opportunity to ask Ambassador Sondland for his candid impression of the President's views on Ukraine. According to Holmes, in particular, I asked Ambassador Sondland if it was true that the President did not give an expletive about Ukraine. Ambassador Sondland agreed that the President did not give an expletive about Ukraine. I asked why not. And Ambassador Sondland stated that the President only cares about big stuff. I noted there was big stuff going on in Ukraine, like a war with Russia. And Ambassador Sondland replied that he meant big stuff that benefits the President, like the Biden investigation that Mr. Giuliani was pushing. The conversation then moved on to other topics. Those three days in July, the 24th, the 25th, and the 26th, reveal a lot about President Trump's effort to solicit help from a foreign country in assisting his own reelection. On the 24th, Special Counsel Mueller testifies that Russia interfered in our 2016 election, election to assist the Trump campaign, which knew about the interference, welcomed it, and utilized it. That's the 24th. The 25th is the day of the call, when President Trump, believing he had escaped accountability for Russian meddling in the first election and his welcoming of it, asked the Ukrainian president to help him undermine the special counsel's conclusion and help him smear a political opponent, former Vice President Biden. And then the third day in a row in July, President Trump sought to ensure that Ukraine had received his request and understood it and would take the necessary steps to announce the investigations that he wanted. Three days in July. In many ways, those three days in July tell so much of this story. This course of conduct alone should astound all of us who value the sanctity of our elections and who understand that the vast powers of the presidency are reserved only for actions which benefit the country as a whole, rather than the political fortunes of any one individual. President Trump's effort to use an official head of state phone call to solicit the announcement of investigations helpful to his reelection is not only conduct unbecoming a president, but it is conduct of one who believes that the powers of his high office are political tools to be wielded against his opponents, including by asking a foreign government to investigate a United States citizen and for a corrupt purpose. That alone is grounds for removal from office of the 45th president. But these three days in July were neither the beginning nor the end of this scheme. President Trump acting through agents inside and outside of the U.S. government, including his personal attorney Rudy Giuliani, sought to compel Ukraine to announce the investigations by withholding the head of state meeting in the Oval Office until the president of Ukraine complied. Hosting an Oval Office of meeting for a foreign leader is an official act available only to one person the President of the United States. And it is an official act that President Trump had already offered to President Zelensky during their first phone call on April 21st and in a subsequent leader letter to the Ukrainian leader. Multiple witnesses testified about the importance of a White House meeting for Ukraine. For example, Deputy Assistant Secretary George Kent explained that a White House meeting was very important for Ukrainians to demonstrate the strength of their relationship with Ukraine's strongest supporter. Dr. Fiona Hill of the National Security Council explained a White House meeting would supply the new Ukrainian government with, quote, the legitimacy it needed, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Russians, and that the Ukrainians viewed a White House meeting as a recognition of their legitimacy as a sovereign state. This White House meeting would also prove to be important for three handpicked agents whom President Trump placed in charge of U.S.-Ukraine issues, 
Ambassador Sondland, Ambassador Volker, and Energy Secretary Rick Perry, the so-called Three Amigos. They hope to convince President Trump to hold an Oval Office meeting with Zelensky. During a meeting of the Three Amigos on May 23rd, President Trump told them that Ukraine had tried to take him down in 2016. He then directed them, talk to Rudy Giuliani about Ukraine. It was immediately clear that Giuliani, who was pursuing the discredited investigations in Ukraine on the President's behalf, was the key to unlocking an Oval Office meeting for President Zelensky. Giuliani by then had said publicly that he was actively pursuing investigations President Trump corruptly desired and planning a trip to Ukraine. Giuliani admitted, quote, we're not meddling in an election, we're meddling in an investigation. On May 10, however, Giuliani canceled the trip to Ukraine to dig up dirt on former Vice President Biden and the 2016 conspiracy theory, just as President Zelensky won elections for the presidency and parliament. Faced with a choice between working with Giuliani to pursue an Oval Office meeting, understanding it meant taking part in a corrupt effort to secure the political investigations or abandoning efforts to support our Ukrainian ally, the president's agents fell into line. They would pursue the White House meeting and explain to Ukraine that announcements of the investigations was the price of admission. As Ambassador Sondland made clear, I know that members of this committee frequently frame these complicated issues in the form of a simple question. Was there a quid pro quo? As I testified previously, with regard to the requested White House call and the White House meeting, the answer is yes. This quid pro quo was negotiated between the President's agents, Rudy Giuliani, and Ukrainian officials throughout the summer of 2019 in numerous telephone calls, text messages, and meetings, including during a meeting hosted by then National Security Advisor John Bolton on July 10th. Near the end of that July 10th meeting, after the Ukrainians again raised the issue of a White House visit, Ambassador Sondland blurted out that there would be agreement for a White House meeting once the investigations began. At that point, Bolton immediately stiffened and abruptly ended the meeting. During a subsequent discussion that day, Sondland was even more explicit. Lieutenant Colonel Alex Vindman, a director for Europe and Ukraine on the National Security Council, testified that Sondland began to discuss the deliverable required to get the White House meeting, which Sondland specifically mentioned was investigation of the Bidens. This is again in that meeting in the White House with Ukrainian, a Ukrainian delegation, and an American delegation. Sondland explained in that meeting he had an agreement with Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney, whereby President Zelensky would be granted the Oval Office meeting if he went forward with the investigations. After the meeting, Vindman's supervisor, Dr. Hill, reported back to Bolton, who told her to tell John Eisenberg, the National Security Council legal advisor, that he was not part of whatever drug deal Sondland and Mulvaney are cooking up on this. She reported her concerns, as did Vindman. It remains unclear what action, if any, Bolton or Eisenberg took once they were made aware of Mulvaney and Sondland's drug deal. Both refused to testify in our inquiry. However, Dr. Hill testified that she understood that Mr. Eisenberg informed Mr. Cipollone of her concerns about the drug deal. If this body is serious about a fair trial, one that is fair to the President and to the American people, we again urge you to allow the House to call both Eisenberg and Bolton, as well as other key witnesses with firsthand knowledge who refuse to testify before the House on the orders of the President. Additional testimony and documents are particularly important because, according to Sondland, everyone was in the loop when it came to the President's self-serving effort. In part relying on email excerpts, Sondland explained that the President's senior aides and cabinet officials knew that the White House meeting was predicated on Ukraine's announcement of the investigations beneficial 
to the President's political campaign. Hill characterized the quid pro quo succinctly. But it struck me one yesterday when you put up on the screen Ambassador Sondland's emails and who was on these emails, and he said, these are the people who need to know that he was absolutely right because he was being involved in a domestic political errand. And we were being involved in national security foreign policy, and those two things had just diverged. In effect, President Zelensky was being drawn into this domestic political errand. He grew wary of becoming involved in another country's election and domestic affairs. Bill Taylor, the acting U.S. ambassador to Ukraine at the time, described a conversation he had with a senior aide to the Ukrainian leader. He said, Also on July 20th, I had a phone conversation with Alexander Daniluk, President Zelensky's national security advisor, who emphasized that President Zelensky did not want to be used as an instrument in a U.S. re-election campaign. Remember that conversation when you hear counsel say that the Ukrainians felt no pressure to be involved in a U.S. re-election campaign. But that concern did not deter President Trump. In his conversation with Sondland short before, shortly before the 25th of July call, the President made clear that he not only wanted Ukraine to do the investigations or announce them, but also a White House meeting would only be scheduled if President Zelensky confirmed these investigations. As Volker communicated to President Zelensky's top aide by text less than 30 minutes before the phone call between Trump and Zelensky, and again, we're talking about July 25th, in a text 30 minutes before the Trump-Zelensky phone call, here's what is said. With Volker texting Andrei Yermak, a top aide to President Zelensky, good lunch. Thanks. Heard from White House. Assuming President Z convinces Trump he will investigate, quote, get to the bottom of what happened, unquote, in 2016, we will nail down date for a visit to Washington. Good luck. See you tomorrow. Kurt. Well, that, those words couldn't be much clearer. Assuming President Z convinces Trump he will investigate, get to the bottom of what happened in 2016, We'll nail down the visit to Washington. That's a text 30 minutes before that call. Counsel for the President would like to think, this is just about that call. You don't get to look outside the four corners of that call. They don't want you to look at the months that went into preparing for that call or the months of pressure that followed it. But you could just look at, right now, what happened 30 minutes before that call in this text message. Heard from White House, assuming President Z convinces Trump he will investigate, get to the bottom of what happened in 2016. If you are wondering how it seemed that President Zelensky was aware of what he was going to be asked on that call, this is how you can tell. He was prepped. Of course he was prepped. And in fact, the, the missing reference in the call record to Burisma was a signal Colonel Levinman recognized that clearly he had been prepped for that call. Why else would the name of this particular energy company come up in that conversation? Well, President Zelensky clearly got the message. Toward the end of the call with President Trump, President Zelensky said, I also want to thank you for your invitation to visit the United States, specifically Washington, D.C. On the other hand, I also want to ensure you, wanted to ensure you that we will be very serious about the case and we will work on the investigation. Thank you for the invitation. On the other hand, I want to assure you that we will be very serious about the case and we will work on the investigation. President Zelensky clearly understood the quid pro quo for the White House meeting on July 25th. But his reticence to be used as a political pawn kept President Trump from moving forward with a promise to schedule the meeting. 
And so the president and his agents pressed on. In August, Giuliani met with a top Ukrainian aide and made it clear that Ukraine must issue a public statement announcing the investigations in order to get the White House meeting. Fearful of getting involved in U.S. domestic politics and having entered office with a promise to clean up government and corruption, President Zelensky and his aides preferred a generic statement about investigations. But Giuliani insisted, no, the statement must include two specific investigations that would benefit President Trump. Let's look at a comparison between the statement the Ukrainians preferred and the one that Giuliani required. So on the left, and I will read it in case you can't see the screens, the draft, the Yermak draft, the Ukrainian draft, says we intend to initiate and complete a transparent and unbiased investigation of all available facts and episodes, which in turn will prevent the recurrence of this problem in the future. That's pretty generic. But here's the Giuliani Volker Sondland response. This is what had to be included. We intend to initiate and complete a transparent and unbiased investigation of all available facts and episodes. Up to that point, it's exactly the same until you get to including those involving Burisma and the 2016 U.S. elections. And then it goes back to the Ukrainian draft, which in turn will prevent the recurrence of this problem in the future. You can see in this such graphic evidence the Ukrainians did not want to do this. They didn't even want to mention this. Giuliani had to insist, no, no, no. We're not going to be satisfied with some generic statement. After all, I think we can see, this isn't about corruption. No, this isn't about announcing investigations to damage Biden and to promote this fiction about the last election. So here in these texts, you see that Giuliani, Volker, and Sondland have added these references to Burisma, a thinly veiled reference to former Vice President Biden and the 2016 election. They wish to ensure the Ukrainians mentioned the sham investigations President Trump required. Now, the Ukrainians recoiled at the new statement, recognizing that releasing it would run directly counter to the anti-corruption platform that Zelensky campaigned on and would embroil them in U.S. election politics. As a result, Zelensky didn't get his White House meeting. He still hasn't gotten his White House meeting. Senators, witness testimony, text messages, emails, and the call record itself confirm a corrupt quid pro quo for the White House meeting, an official act available only to the President of the United States in exchange for the announcement of political investigations, the President and his allies have offered no explanation for this effort. Except the President can abuse his office all he likes, and there's nothing you can do about it. Can't indict him. Can't impeach him. That is because they cannot seriously dispute that President Trump corruptly used an official White House visit for a foreign leader to compel the Ukrainian president into helping him cheat in the next election. The White House meeting, of course, was not the only official act that President Trump conditioned on the announcement of investigations into Biden and the conspiracy theory meant to exonerate President Trump from Russians' interference on his behalf in the last election. In a far more draconian step, as we have discussed, the President withheld $391 million of military aid. Several weeks before this phone call with President Zelensky, but after Giuliani was already pressing Ukrainian officials to conduct the investigations his clients sought, President Trump ordered the hold on Ukraine's military aid. Significantly, this was after Congress had already been notified that most of it was prepared to be spent. Ukraine had met all of the critical conditions for anti-corruption and defense reforms in order to receive the funds. We conditioned the funds. They met the conditions. The funds were ready to go. At the time, and even today, witnesses uniformly testified that the order to hold the funding came without explanation to the foreign policy and national security officials 
responsible for Ukraine. The only message from the Office of Management and Budget was that the hold was implemented at the direction of the President. Since Russia's illegal incursion into Ukraine in 2014, the U.S. has maintained a bipartisan policy of delivering hundreds of millions of dollars of military aid to Ukraine each year, which several senators here have personally invested significant time and effort to ensure. And it was President Trump himself who originally authorized additional financial support for military assistance to Ukraine in 2017 and 2018, without reservation, making his abrupt decision to withhold assistance in 2019 without explanation all the more surprising to those responsible for Ukraine policy. That confusion, however, would soon disappear. The president used the whole on military aid as leverage to pressure Ukraine to announce these investigations that he hoped would help his reelection campaign. The only difference between the prior years when the president approved the aid without question and the inexplicable aid on hold in 2019 was the emergence of Joe Biden as a potentially formidable obstacle to the president's reelection. These funds that the president withheld, these funds, they don't just benefit Ukraine. They benefit the security of the United States. By ensuring that Ukraine is equipped to defend its own borders against Russian aggression. As Ambassador Taylor noted at his deposition, the United States provides Ukraine with radar and weapons and sniper rifles communication that save lives. It makes Ukrainians more effective. It might even shorten the war. That's what our hope is, to show the Ukrainians can defend themselves. And the Russians, in the end, will say, OK, we're going to stop. That's in our interest. This isn't just about Ukraine or its national security. It's about our national security. This isn't charity. It's about our defense as much as Ukraine's. Ambassador Taylor also said that the American aid was a concrete demonstration of the United States' commitment to resist aggression and to defend freedom. That's what this country is supposed to be about, right? Resisting aggression, defending freedom, not exporting corrupt ideas. That's what we're supposed to be out, right? It was against this backdrop that American officials responsible for Ukraine policy sat in astonishment, according to Ambassador Taylor, when they learned about the hold. Officials immediately expressed concerns about the legality of President Trump's hold on assistance to Ukraine. Their concerns were well warranted as the Government Accountability Office, which was just last night poo-pooed by the President's Council, well, that's just some institution of Congress. Right, they're going to be just inherently biased, right? Well, they're a nonpartisan organization that both parties have come to rely upon. But I'm not surprised they don't like the conclusion of the GAO because the Defense Department warned them that this was going to be the conclusion, and that conclusion was the hold on aid was not only wrong, it was not only immoral, it was also illegal. It violated the law, a law that we passed so that presidents could not refuse to spend funny that we allocated for the defense of others and for ourselves. The Empowerment Control Act prevents the president and other government officials from unilaterally making funding decisions when Congress has made its intent clear. In fact, the, the act exists precisely because of previous presidential abuses of Congress's power of the purse during the Nixon era. The nonpartisan GAO ruled that the hold on military aid was not only illegal, but that holding underscores the president's efforts to go to any lengths to ensure his own personal benefit rather than take care that the laws be faithfully executed, as he swore he would do when he took his oath of office. Now, because of recent Freedom of Information Act responses and media reports, we 
Now no additional details about how senior officials expressed serious reservations about the legality of the hold at the time. So this is, this is not like some new surprise. This is not like something that just came out of the blue. Oh, an independent watchdog agency found this was illegal. No, they knew this was illegal at the time. These concerns were raised at the time. Certain individuals who may have further information about the hold have refused to testify the President's direction, including his Chief of Staff, Mick Mulvaney, his Deputy, Robert Blair, OMB official Michael Duffy, all of them, all of them, defied congressional subpoenas. But were included in important email communications that have been made public only recently. As you know, these and many other categories of documents from the White House, Defense Department, OMB were subpoenaed by the House, and none was produced, none, at the President's direction and through Mr. Cipollone's intervention. Although the investigation developed an overwhelming body of evidence that clearly proves that the President implemented this hold to pressure Ukraine to announce investigations, the full story <clears throat> Behind the hold, the full and complete story is within your power to request. As you consider the evidence we present to you, ask yourselves whether the documents and witnesses that have been denied by the President's complete and unprecedented obstruction could shed more light on this critical topic. You may agree with the House managers that the evidence of the President's withholding of military aid to coerce Ukraine is already supported by overwhelming evidence, and no further insight is necessary to convict the President. But if the President's lawyers attempt to contest these or other factual matters, you are left with no choice but to demand to hear from each witness with firsthand knowledge. A fair trial requires nothing less. Let's look at some of the evidence that we gather, notwithstanding this obstruction. First, the President withheld the aid without explanation and against the advice of his own agencies, cabinet officials, national security experts, including Secretary Pompeo, Secretary Esper, Ambassador Bolton, and others. Only Mick Mulvaney, a central figure in this effort, reportedly supported the hold, and he told us why. During a press briefing, Mulvaney personally acknowledged that the hold was ordered as part of a quid pro quo designed to get Ukraine to undertake the investigation President Trump sought. Second, the reason for the security assistance hold was undoubtedly on the President's mind during the telephone call with President Zelensky on July 25th. Near the beginning of their conversation, President Zelensky expresses gratitude for U.S. military assistance, noting the United States, quote, great support in the area of defense. Immediately after President Zelensky's reference to defense and military support, President Trump responded by saying, I would like you to do us a favor, though, because our country has been through a lot, and Ukraine knows a lot about it. President Trump then proceeded to openly press Ukraine to conduct these investigations. Third, numerous officials were aware that President Trump was withholding the White House meeting until the Ukrainian president announced the investigations. That the president would ratchet up pressure on Ukraine to compel its action stunned Ukraine experts like Ambassador Taylor, but followed logically for those engaged in the president's corrupt scheme. Fourth, by the end of August, there was still no explanation for the hold, despite ongoing efforts from numerous officials to persuade the President to release the money. And the leverage of the White House meeting had not succeeded in coercing Ukraine to announce the investigations, providing the President and his agents every reason to use the most aggressive lever of influence, hundreds of millions of dollars of military support, to compel Ukraine to act. If they didn't feel pressure, they would have done it. They would have done it. But of course they did. Imagine if this country were dependent on a more powerful country for our defense. Imagine we were at war. Imagine we were waiting for weapons to defend ourselves. 
something our framers could have understood. Imagine that we found ourselves in those circumstances. And much to our astonishment, we couldn't even get a meeting with our ally. Much to our astonishment, they were withholding aid from us. You think we'd feel pressure? Of course we would. The framers had common sense, and so must we. Are we to accept, well, the president said there was no quid pro quo? I guess that closes the case. In every courtroom in America, jurors, and I know you're not just jurors, I read the Clinton trial, you're jurors and judges. Jurors all over America are told you don't leave your common sense at the door. Well, we don't have to leave our common sense at the door here, too. Two plus two equals four. The aid is withheld. You're asking for it. We're asking for it. His own aides are asking for it. No one can get an explanation. Ukrainians can't get an explanation. All the Ukrainians get is, we want you to do these investigations. They're promised a White House meeting. They want a White House meeting. They need a White House meeting. They're going to be going into negotiations with Putin. They want to show strength. They can't get in the door. They see the Russian foreign minister get in the door of the White House. We see the photos of the president, the Russian foreign minister, or the ambassador. What a great time they're having. But, but no, the president our, of Ukraine, our ally, can't get in the door. They're not stupid. They know what's going on here. They're not stupid. That conversation I referenced yesterday when the Ukrainians threw it right back in our face. When Ambassador Volker said to his Ukrainian counterpart, you shouldn't investigate the former president. You shouldn't engage in those political investigations. Oh, the Ukrainian response was, you mean like the one you want us to do of the Bidens and the Clintons? They're not stupid. By the end of August, there was still no explanation for the hold, despite efforts by numerous people to seek the release of the funding. The leverage hadn't succeeded in getting the president to, in course of Ukraine, to announce the investigations. And so the aid was withheld. Two witnesses privy to this scheme testified that the only logical conclusion to reach about the president's con continued hold on the aid was that it was intended to put more pressure on Ukraine to announce the investigations. As I said, they testified it was as simple as 2 plus 2 equals 4. We can do math, and more importantly, so can the Ukrainians, and maybe even more importantly than that, so can the Russians. Multiple senior officials, including President Trump himself, have confirmed this logical conclusion. On September 7th, Ambassador Sondland spoke directly to President Trump who by that point was aware that a whistleblower complaint was circulating that alleged the contours of his scheme, and that Congress and the public were beginning to ask probing questions about the hold on aid, including whether the withholding of the aid was in exchange for re-election help. During that call, September 7th, so July, you've got Bob Mueller's testimony, You've got the call itself. You've got the follow-up call the next day where the president is speaking to Sondland and wants to make sure they're going to do the investigations. You've got August while they're trying to hammer out a statement, and the Ukrainians are still resisting, and then you have September. September 7th, Ambassador Sondland on the phone with President Trump. At that point, he is aware that a whistleblower has filed a complaint alleging the contours of this scheme and Congress and the public are beginning to ask questions about the hold on aid, including whether this was to get help in his reelection. And during this call between the President and Ambassador Sondland, without a prompt, President Trump told Sondland, there's no quid pro quo. Now, why would he do that? That's not something that comes up in normal conversation, right? Hello, Mr. President, how are you today? No quid pro quo. That's the kind of thing that comes up in a conversation if you're trying to put your alibi out there. 
If you've heard about a whistleblower complaint, if you've seen allegations, if you know Congress is starting to sniff around, no quid pro quo. But, and I know this is astonishing, so much of the last three years has been a combination of shock and yet no surprise. And yet even while the president is saying no quid pro quo, what does he say? Zelensky must publicly announce the two political investigations and he should want to do it. No quid pro quo except this quid pro quo. Sondland immediately relayed the message to President Zelensky, informing him that without the announcement of the political investigations, they would be at a stalemate. Sondland made clear that this reference to a stalemate meant the release of the security assistance. President Zelensky, after hesitating for weeks to join the president's corrupt scheme, finally relented. President Zelensky informed Sondland that he agreed to do a CNN interview. And Sondland understood that he would use that occasion to mention these items, meaning the two investigations at the heart of the scheme. The candidate, Zelensky, who was swept into office with a landslide victory on a promise of fighting corruption, would be forced to undertake just the same kind of corrupt act he'd been elected to clean up. Upon learning this, Ambassador Taylor called Sondland to register his deep concern, telling him that it was crazy, crazy. Taylor later texted Sondland to reinforce the point, as I said on the phone, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with a political campaign as I said on the phone. Clearly, they had discussed it, as I said on the phone. Taylor testified about the message and the events leading up to it. Taylor said that security system was so, assistance was so, I'm sorry, security system was so important for Ukraine, as well as our own national interest. To withhold that assistance for no good reason other than help with the political campaign made no sense. It was counterproductive to all of what we had been trying to do. It was illogical. It could not be explained. It was crazy. What's more, Ambassador Taylor also came to learn that President Trump wanted Zelensky in a public box. He testified <coughs> Mr. Goldman asking the question, now you referenced the television interview and a desire for President Trump to put Zelensky in a public box, which you also have in quotes. Was that in your notes? Now, this is a reference, I think, to his written testimony. Was that reference to in a public box in his notes? Remember, he kept detailed notes. Taylor's answer, it was in my notes. And what did you understand to mean to put Zelensky in a public box? And Taylor responds, I understood that to mean that President Trump, through Ambassador Sondland, was asking for President Zelensky to publicly commit to these investigations, that it was not sufficient to do this in private, that this needed to be done, this needed to be a very public statement. So we saw earlier the side-by-side -side comparison, right, of what the Ukrainians wanted to say. They wanted to make no mention of these specific investigations and how Giuliani insisted, no, 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 this isn't going to be credible unless you mention these specific investigations. This is what it's going to take. And now you see Ambassador Sondland has acknowledged to Ambassador Taylor that not enough to use even the right language, apparently, got to be done in public. We're not going to take any private commitment. It's got to be done in public. As we would later come to understand, this is because President Trump didn't care about the investigations being done. He just wanted them announced. He wanted Zelensky in a public box. He wanted it announced publicly. And Master Taylor also testified that he understood from Solomon that because 
President Trump was a businessman, he would expect to get something in return before signing a check. During our meeting, during our call on September 8th, Ambassador Sondland tried to explain to me that President Trump is a businessman. When a businessman is about to sign a check to someone who owes him something, the businessman asked that person to pay up before signing the check. Ambassador Volker used the same language several days later while we were together at the Yalta European Strategy Conference. I argued to both that the explanation made no sense. The Ukrainians did not owe President Trump anything. I, I, this is very telling. Ambassador Taylor, Vietnam veteran, West Point graduate. The Ukrainians didn't owe us anything. Clearly, Donald Trump felt the Ukrainians owed him, right? This is not about Ukraine's national security. It's not about our national security. It's not about corruption. No, it's about what's in it for me. Those Ukrainians owe me. Before I sign a check, and by the way, that's not his money. That's your money. That's the American people's money for their defense. But here we see Ambassador Sondland expect, explaining, no, President Trump's a businessman. Before he's going to sign a check, he wants to get something. And of course, that's something that he, he was going to sign that check for. He's going to make that payment for with our tax dollars. That thing that he was going to buy with those tax dollars was a smear of his opponent and an effort to lift whatever cloud he felt was over his presidency because of the Russian interference on his behalf in the last election. Now, the president has offered a, an assortment of shifting explanations after the fact for the hold on aid, including that he withheld the money because of corruption in Ukraine or concerns about burden sharing with other European countries. But those arguments are completely without merit. First, the president's own administration had determined by the time of the hold that Ukraine had undertaken all necessary anti-corruption and defense reforms in order to receive the funds. The Defense Department and State Department officials repeatedly made this clear as the hold remained and threatened the ability of the agencies to spend the money before the end of the fiscal year. Second, the evidence revealed that the president only asked about foreign contributions to Ukraine in September, nearly two months after the president implemented the hold and as it became clear that the public Congress and a whistleblower were becoming aware of the president's scheme. The after-the-fact effort to come up with a justification also belies the truth. The European countries provide far more financial support to Ukraine than the United States. Their support is largely economic. Ours also includes a lot of military support. But Europe is a substantial financial backer of Ukraine. Something else remarkable about this, I was struck by yesterday, as we're going through the importance of the witness testimony and looking at some of those redacted emails in which the administration sought to hide its misconduct. In those redactions, when we got to see what was beneath them, and there was an indication, this is very close hold. This is a need-to-know basis only. Remember that? We'll show you that again, but one of those emails that only came to light, I believe, recently, and not because the administration wanted you to see this information, we see there's a desire not to let people know about this hold. If the president was fighting corruption, if he wanted the Europeans to pay more, why would he hide it from us? Why would he hide it from the Ukrainians? Why would he hide it from the rest of the world? If this was a desire to get Europe to pay more, why wouldn't he charge Sondland to go ask Europe for more? Why wouldn't he be proud to tell the Congress of the United States, I'm holding up this aid, and I'm holding it up because I'm worried about corruption? Why wouldn't he? Because, of course, it wasn't true. There's no evidence of that. 
And what's more, the White House admitted why the president held up the money. The president's own chief of staff explained precisely why during October 17th and October 17th press conference. Let's see again what he had to say. So, um, that was, those were the driving factors. Did he also mention to me in the past that the, 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 the corruption related to the DNC server? Absolutely. No question about that. Um, but that's it. And that's why we held up the money. Now, there was a report. So, 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 so the demand for an investigation into the Democrats was part of the reason that he it was ordered to withhold funding to Ukraine. The, the look back to what happened in 2016 certainly was, was part of the thing that he was worried about in corruption with that nation. And that is absolutely appropriate. But Mulvaney didn't just admit that the president withheld the crucial aid appropriated by Congress to apply pressure on Ukraine to do the president's political dirty work. He also said that we should just get over it. Let's, let's watch. But to be clear, what you just described is a quid pro quo. It is funding will not flow unless the investigation into the, into the Democratic server uh, happened as well. We, we, do, we do that all the time with foreign policy. If you read the news reports and you believe them, what did McKinney say yesterday? Well, McKinney said yesterday that he was really upset with the political influence in foreign policy. That was one of the reasons he was so upset about this. And I have news for everybody. Get over it. There's going to be political influence in foreign policy. Should the Congress just get over it? Should the American people just come to expect that our presidents will corruptly abuse their office to seek the help of a foreign power to cheat in our elections? Should we just get over it? Is that what we've come to? I hope and pray that the answer is no. We cannot allow a president to withhold military aid from an ally at war for illicit help in a really election campaign. I hope that we don't have to just get over that. I hope that we just don't have to get accustomed to that. Is that what we want to tell our constituents? Yeah, the president withheld aid from an ally. Yeah, it damaged our national security. And yeah, he wouldn't meet with a foreign leader who's important to us unless he got help in the next election, and yeah, it's wrong to try to get a foreign power to help. It's kind of cheating, really, if we're going to be honest about it and blatant about it. It's cheating. Americans are supposed to decide American elections, but, you know, I guess we just need to get over it. I guess that's just what we should now expect of a president of the United States. I guess there's really no remedy for that anymore. The impeachment, I mean, maybe that was a good idea 200 years ago. But I guess we just need to get over it. I guess maybe the president really is above the law because they say you can't indict the president. The president says you can't even investigate the president. The president is, is in court saying you can not only not indict the president, you can't even investigate the president. The Attorney General's position is you can't even investigate the president. Are we really prepared to say that? The only answer to presidential misconduct is we just need to get over it? What are we going to say with the next president? What are we going to say with the president who's from a different party, who refuses the same kind of subpoenas? And the president says to you, or his chief of staff says to you, or her chief of staff says to you, just get over it. I'm not doing anything different than Donald Trump did. Just get over it. He asked for help in the next election. I'm asking for help in the next election. Just get over it. We do this kind of thing all the time. People are cynical enough as it is about, about politics, about people's commitment to their good. Cynical enough without having us confirm it for them. I think it's more than crazy. That was Ambassador Taylor's work. I, word. I think it's more than crazy. I think it's a, 
gross abuse of power. And I don't think that impeachment power is a relic. If it is a relic, I wonder how much longer our republic can succeed. For months, President Trump and his agents had pressured Ukraine to announce the investigations. And President Zelensky finally yielded. As previously noted, he scheduled a CNN interview and planned to publicly announce the politically motivated investigations. He informed Sondland of this plan during a September 7th phone call. In the same call, Sondland relayed to President Zelensky that Trump required that the Ukrainian leader make the public announcement in order to get the critical military aid. President Trump's corruption had finally worn down President Zelensky, overcoming his effort to remain true to his anti-corruption platform until events intervened. Before Zelensky could do the interview, President Trump learned that his scheme had been exposed. Facing public and congressional pressure on September 11th, the president finally released the hold on aid to Ukraine. Just like with the implementation of the hold, he provided no reason for the release. But the reason is quite simple. The president got caught. In late August, President Trump learned about a whistleblower complaint that was winding its way through the intelligence agencies on its way to Congress. On September 9th, three House committees announced an investigation into President Trump's Ukraine misconduct and that of his proxy, Rudy Giuliani. Later that day, again September 9th, the Intelligence Community Inspector General notified the Senate and House Intelligence Committees of the existence of the complaint and the fact that it was being withheld from Congress contrary to law and in an unprecedented fashion. Facing significant public pressure on September 11th, the President gave up and released the money to Ukraine. One week later, President Zelensky canceled the CNN interview. And rather than demonstrate contrition or acknowledge wrongdoing, the President instead has continued his effort, even after the impeachment investigation began. He not only continued to call on Ukraine to investigate his political opponent and called on China to do the same. This should concern all of us. It's a confirmation not only of the scheme to pressure Ukraine to help his political campaign, but a clear sign that the president believes that these corrupt acts are acceptable. A president this unapologetic, this lawless, this unbound to the Constitution, and the oath of office must be removed from that office, lest he continue to use the vast presidential powers at his disposal to seek advantage in the next election. President Trump's abuse of powers of his office undermined the integrity of our free and fair elections and compromised America's national security. If we don't stand up to this peril today, we will write the history of our decline with our own hand. If President Trump is not held to account, we send the message to future presidents, future Congresses, and generations of Americans that the personal interests of the president can fairly take precedent over those of the nation. The domestic effects of this descent from democracy will be a weakened trust in the integrity of our elections and the rule of law and a steady decline of the spread of de democratic values throughout the world. For how can any country trust the United States as a model of governance if it is one that sanctions precisely the political corruption an invitation to foreign meddling that we have long sought to help eradicate in burgeoning democracies around the world. To protect against foreign interference in our elections, we have guardrails built into our democratic system. We have campaign finance laws to ensure that political assistance can come only from domestic actors, and we take seriously the need to shore up the integrity of our voting systems so that a foreign government or actor cannot change vote tallies. The promise of one person, one vote is only effective if each vote is cast free of foreign interference. 
Americans decide American elections. At least they should. Now, what if electoral corruption is even more insidious? <clears throat> what happens when the invitation comes from within? Our framers understood that threat too. George Mason noted at the Constitutional Convention that impeachment was a necessary tool because the man who has practiced corruption and by that means procured his appointment in the first instance could seek to repeat his guilt. In June of last year, President Trump was clear that if a foreign government offered dirt on his political opponent, he would take it. A statement deeply at odds with the guidance provided at the time by his own FBI director, the formal Federal Elections Commissioner and Chair, and our Constitution, written some 233 years ago. In no uncertain terms, it admonishes that any person holding office of profit or trust, it admonishes against them accepting of any present from a foreign state. But President Trump did more than take the foreign help in 2019, as he had done in 2016. This time, he not only asked for it in the July 25th call, but when he didn't get the help from the Ukrainian president in the form of the announced investigations, he withheld hundreds of millions of dollars in taxpayer-funded military aid and a coveted White House meeting to increase the pressure on Ukraine to comply. And later, he demonstrated no remorse and continued to encourage Ukraine to conduct the political investigations he wanted, even asking other countries to do so. The consequences of these actions alone have shaken our democratic system. What message will we send if we choose not to hold this president accountable for his abuse of power to solicit re-election inter interference in our upcoming election? The misconduct undertaken by this president may lead future presidents to believe that they too can use the substantial power conferred on them by the Constitution in order to undermine it. Nothing could weaken the integrity of your elections more and no campaign finance law or statement by a future FBI director could stand up to the precedent of electoral misconduct set by the President of the United States if we do not say clearly that this behavior is unacceptable and more than unacceptable, impeachable. We also undermine our global standing as a country long viewed as a model for democratic ideals worth emulating. We have, for generations, been the shining city upon a hill that President Reagan described. America is not just a country, but also an idea. But what worth is that idea if, when tried, we do not affirm the values that underpin it? What will those nascent democracies around the world conclude that democracy is not only difficult, but maybe that it's too difficult, maybe that it's impossible? And who will come to fill the void that we leave when the light from that shining city upon a hill is extinguished? The autocrats with whom we compete, who value not freedom and fair elections, but the unending rule of a repressive executive. Autocrats that value not freedom of the press and open debate, but disinformation, propaganda, and state-sanctioned lies. Vladimir Putin would like nothing better. The Russians have little democracy left, thanks to Vladimir Putin. It's an autocracy. It's a thugocracy. The Russian storyline, the Russian narrative, the Russian propaganda, the Russian view they would like people around the world to believe is that every country is just the same, just the same corrupt system. There's no difference. It's not a competition between autocracy and democracy. No, it's just between autocrats and hypocrites. They make no bones about their loss of democracy. They just want the rest of the world to believe you can't find it anywhere. Why take to the streets in Moscow to demand something better if there's nothing better anywhere else? 
That's the Russian story. That's the Russian story. That's who prospers by the defeat of democracy. That's who wins by the defeat of our democratic ideals. It's not other democracies. It's the autocrats who are on the rise all over the world. I think all of us in this room have grown up in a generation where each successive generation lived with more freedom than the one that came before. We each had more freedom of speech and association, freedom to practice our faith. This was true at home, it was true all over the world. And I think we came to believe this was some immutable law of nature, only to find it isn't, only to come to the terrible realization that this year, fewer people live in freedom than last. And there's no guarantee that next year, people will live in more freedom than today. And the prospect for our children is even more in doubt. Turns out, there's nothing immutable about this. Every generation has to fight for it. We're fighting for it right now. There's no guarantee that this democracy that has served us so well will continue to prosper. We will struggle to protect this idea. And even as we do, we will struggle to protect our security in more tangible ways. Support for an independent and democratic Ukraine, which is the literal bulk work against Russian expansionism in Europe is essential to our security. Russia showed that when it invaded Ukraine in 2014 and sought to redraw the map of Europe. Was our commitment to Ukraine's independence and sovereignty just an empty promise? Or are we prepared to support its efforts to keep Russia contained so that they and we may all eventually enjoy a long peace? Russia is not a threat, I don't need to tell you, to Eastern Europe alone. Ukraine has become the de facto proving ground for just the types of hybrid warfare that the 21st century will become defined by. Cyber attacks, disinformation campaigns, efforts to undermine the legitimacy of state institutions, whether that is voting systems or financial markets. The Kremlin showed boldly in 2016 that with the malign skills it honed in Ukraine, they would not stay in Ukraine. Instead, Russia employed them here to attack our institutions, and they will do so again. Indeed, they've never stopped. Will we allow the primary country now fighting Russia to be weakened, placing our troops in Europe at greater risk, and opening the door to greater interference in our affairs at home? If we allow the President of the United States to pursue his political and personal interests rather than the national interest, we send a message to our European allies that our commitment to a Europe free and whole is for sale to the highest bidder. The strength of our global alliances relies on a shared understanding of what that alliance stands for, one built on the rule of law, on free and fair elections, on a shared struggle against aggression from autocratic regimes, we are countries built on a commitment to our people, not on yielding loyalty to a president who would be king. A president has a right to hold a call with a foreign leader, yes. And he has a right to decide the time and location of a meeting with that leader, yes. And he has a right to withhold funding to that leader should the law be followed and the purpose be just. But he does not under our laws and under our Constitution, have a right to use the powers of his office to corruptly solicit foreign aid, prohibited foreign aid in his reelection. He does not. He does not have the right to withhold official presidential acts to secure that assistance, and he certainly does not have the right to undermine our elections and place our security at risk for his own personal benefit. No president, Republican or Democrat, can be permitted to do that. 
Now let me turn to the second article of impeachment, which charges the president with misusing the powers of his office to obstruct and interfere with the impeachment inquiry. The evidence you'll hear during the House presentation is equally undeniable and damning. President Trump issued a blanket order directing the entire executive branch not to cooperate with the impeachment inquiry and to withhold all documents and testimony. His order was categorical, it was indiscriminate, and historically unprecedented. No president before President Trump has ever ordered the complete defiance of an impeachment inquiry or sought to obstruct and impede so comprehensively the ability of the House of Representatives to investigate high crimes and misdemeanors. The president <clears throat> was able to block agencies across the executive branch from producing any records or documents to the House investigative committees despite duly authorized subpoenas. The White House continues to refuse to produce a single document or record in response to a House subpoena that remains in full force and effect. The Department of State and Office of Management and Budget, the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense continue to refuse to provide a single document or record in response to House subpoenas that remain in full force and effect. It is worth underscoring this point. The House has yet to receive a single document from the executive branch agencies pursuant to its subpoenas. Not a single piece of paper, email, or other record has been turned over, not one. And while I pause to get a drink of water, let me let you know for your timing, I have about 10 minutes left in my presentation. So the end is in sight. President Trump has also successfully blocked witnesses, nine of them, under subpoena from testifying. Witnesses with firsthand knowledge of the president's actions, including his closest aides, some of whom were directly involved in executing the president's improper orders. These witnesses include Mick Mulvaney and Robert Blair, Russell Vaught, the acting head of the Office of Management and Budget, Michael Duffy, a senior official, and the president's chief legal advisor, on the National Security Council, John Eisenberg, among others. The managers will present in detail what these officials knew about their role in executing different parts of the President's scheme. There is no dispute, nor could there be, that President Trump's order substantially obstructed the House impeachment inquiry. That obstruction continues unabated today, even as we stand here at the start of the president's trial. And the president has been able to do so only because of the uniquely powerful position that he holds as our commander in chief. No other American could seek to obstruct an investigation into his own wrongdoing this way. No other American could use the vast powers and levers of his government to conduct a corrupt scheme to benefit themselves and then use those same powers to suppress evidence and bar any cooperation with the authorities investigating them. Not a police chief, not a mayor, not a governor, not any elected official in the country, and certainly not any non-elected official in the country. All those folks watching us from around the country, you know what would happen to them if they defied a lawful subpoena. They got a subpoena commanding them to appear. You know what would happen to them because they're not above the law. They'd be arrested, they'd be detained, they'd be incarcerated, they would be forced to comply. They're not above the law, and neither are we, and neither is the president. And yet, despite the fact that he is not above the law, the president's extensive and persistent efforts, the president, the House heard from courageous witnesses who did obey lawful subpoenas. And we gathered overwhelming evidence. The House built a formidable case that forms the basis of these articles. The second article for obstruction of Congress is not simply about President Trump's decision to obstruct a congressional investigation or even an impeachment inquiry. 
It should not be misunderstood as some routine dispute between two branches of government, nor should it be reduced to the notion that the President was simply protecting himself or fighting back against a partisan or overzealous Congress. The charges in the second article are much more serious and urgent than that. First, the President's attempt to obstruct the inquiry so categorically and comprehensively is part and parcel of the President's furious effort to conceal, suppress, and cover up his own misconduct. From the very first moment his actions were at the risk of coming to light, President Trump sought to hide and cover up key evidence, even as his scheme to pressure Ukraine was still underway. As the House presentation will make clear, the President's cover-up started even before the House began to investigate the President's Ukraine-related activity. The President learned early on of the existence of a lawful whistleblower complaint from within the intelligence community that would ring the first alarm. He deployed the White House and Justice Department to intervene in an unprecedented fashion to conceal and then withhold from Congress for the first time ever a credible and urgent whistleblower complaint, even though the law requires that it be provided to the Congressional Intelligence Committees. Once the impeachment inquiry was underway in late September, the President used the immense and unique power at his disposal to direct and maintain at every turn the categorical defiance of congressional scrutiny, even as he attacked the inquiry itself and its witnesses. The President offered multiple and shifting justifications obstructing, for obstructing the House's inquiry, each of them deficient, while his actions and statements powerfully reflect his own consciousness of guilt. Second, the ramifications of the President's obstruction go beyond the sinister motives of simply covering up his actions. His obstruction strikes at the heart of our Constitution. It threatens the last line of defense our founders purposely enshrined in our system to protect our democracy. If presidents can obstruct an impeachment inquiry undertaken by the House and evade accountability in the Senate for doing so, they usurp an essential power granted exclusively to the Congress and for a reason. Presidents could seize for themselves the power to neutralize and nullify the impeachment clause in order to shield themselves from any accountability. And if Congress is unable to investigate and impeach a president for abuse of their office, our democracy's essential check on a rogue president would fail. It would no longer protect the American people from a corrupt president who presents an ongoing threat. This is the outcome every American should be concerned about and one that the founders warned us about. Through the impeachment clause, the framers of the Constitution empowered Congress to thoroughly investigate presidential malfeasance and to respond, if necessary, by removing the president from office. This entire framework depends upon Congress's ability to discover and then to thoroughly and effectively investigate presidential misconduct. Without the ability of Congress to do that, the impeachment power is a nullity. If you can't investigate it, you can't enforce it, you can't apply it. What we confront here in the second article of impeachment is therefore an impeachable offense aimed at destroying the impeachment power itself. When a president abuses the power of his office to so completely defy House investigators and does so without lawful cause or excuse, he attacks the Constitution itself. He confirms that he sees himself as above the law. His actions destabilize the separation of powers that defines our democracy and preserves our freedom and establish an exceedingly dangerous precedent. And he proves that he is willing to destroy a vital safeguard against tyranny, a safeguard meant to protect the American people just to advance his own personal interest in covering up evidence. The House presentation of the second article will therefore focus on three core areas that confirm the President's obstruction and require his removal from office. First, the singular importance and role of the impeachment clause for our democracy and why an effort by a President to obstruct an impeachment inquiry is in and of itself an impeachable offense. Second, 
why the president's extensive effort to cover up evidence of his misconduct is unprecedented in American history and without lawful cause or justification. And finally, why the president's obstruction poses a direct threat to our system of self-governance with consequences for all Americans today and in the future and for both chambers of Congress. Over the coming days, you will hear from the House managers details of this scheme and the effort to hide it from Congress. The articles of impeachment that the House presented go to the heart of those efforts. And let me share a few key takeaways. The House of Representatives has found that using the powers of his eye office, President Trump solicited the interference of a foreign government, Ukraine, in the 2020 U.S. presidential election. He did so through a scheme or course of conduct that included soliciting the government of Ukraine to publicly announce investigations that would benefit his reelection, harm the election prospects of a political opponent, and influence the 2020 U.S. presidential election improperly and to his advantage. President Trump also sought to pressure the government of Ukraine to take these steps by conditioning official United States government acts of significant value to Ukraine on Ukraine's public announcement of these investigations. And he engaged in this scheme or course of conduct for corrupt purposes in pursuit of his personal political benefit. In doing so, President Trump used the powers of the presidency in a manner that compromised the national security of the United States and undermined the integrity of the U.S. democratic process. He thus ignored and injured the interests of the nation. As part of the House's impeachment inquiry, the committees undertaking that investigation serve subpoenas, seeking documents and testimony deemed vital to the inquiry from various executive branch agencies and offices, current and former officials. In response and without lawful cause or excuse, President Trump directed executive branch agencies, offices and officials not to comply with those subpoenas. President Trump thus interposed the powers of the presidency against the lawful subpoenas of the House of Representatives and assumed to himself functions and judgments necessary to the exercise of the sole power of impeachment vested by the Constitution in the House of Representatives. <clears throat> As George Washington and his troops retreated across the Delaware River in early 17, December 1776, they were read the words of Thomas Paine published that month in his pamphlet, The American Crisis. These are the times the tri men's souls, the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot, will in this crisis shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Seventeen days later, George Washington crossed the Delaware, leading to a decisive victory for those who would come to shape our promising young country. <clears throat> as much as our founders feared an unchecked chief executive able to pursue his own will over the will of the people, they also feared the poison of excessive factionalism that could divert us from a difficult service to our country. As George Washington warned in his farewell address, the common and continual mischiefs of the spirit of party are sufficient to make it the interest and duty of a wise people to discourage and restrain it. Now, our political parties and affiliations are central to our democracy, ensuring that good and bad political philosophies alike are considered in the marketplace of ideas. Here, the American people can choose between the policies of one party or another and make decisions about their political leaders up to and including the President of the United States based on the degree to which that person represents their interests and values. That is not factionalism. That is the foundation of our democracy. But when a leader takes the reins of the highest office in our land, 
and uses that awesome power to solicit the help of a foreign country to gain an unfair advantage in our free and fair elections, we all, Democrats and Republicans alike, must ask ourselves whether our loyalty is to our party or whether it is to our Constitution. If we say that we will align ourselves with that leader, allowing our sense of duty to be usurped by an absolute executive, that is not democracy. It is not even factionalism. It is a step on the road towards tyranny. The damage that this president has done to our relationship with a key strategic partner will be remedied over time. And Ukraine continues to enjoy strong bipartisan support in Congress. But if we fail to act, the damage to our democratic elections, to our national security, to our system of checks and balances will be long-lasting and potentially irreversible. As you will hear in the coming days, President Trump has acted in a manner grossly incompatible with self-governance. His conduct has violated his oath of office and his constitutional duty to faithfully execute the law. He has shown no willingness to be constrained by the rule of law and has demonstrated that he will continue to abuse his power and obstruct investigations into himself, causing further damage to the pillars of our democracy if he is not held accountable. He cannot be charged with a crime, so says the Department of Justice. There is no remedy for such a threat but removal from office of the President of the United States. If impeachment and removal cannot hold him accountable, then he truly is above the law. We are nearly two and a half centuries into this beautiful experiment of American democracy, but our future is not assured. As Benjamin Franklin departed the Constitutional Convention, he was asked, what have we got, a republic or a monarchy? He responded simply, a republic if you can keep it. A fair trial? Impartial consideration of all of the evidence against the president is how we keep our republic. That concludes our introduction. The majority leader is recognized. Chief Justice, colleagues, I uh, suggest we have a recess until 10 minutes to 4, at which uh, moment we'll reconvene the subject to call the chair. Without objection, so ordered.
The Senate will come to order. Leaders may resume if they're ready. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, before I begin, I would like to thank the Chief Justice and the Senators for your temperate listening and your patience last night as we went into the long hours. Truly thank you. The House managers will now undertake to tell you the story of the President's Ukraine scheme. As we tell this story, it is important to note that the facts before us are not in dispute. There are no close calls. The evidence shows that President Trump unlawfully withheld military assistance appropriated by Congress to aid our ally in order to extort that government into helping him with his reelection, then tried to cover it up when he got caught. This is the story of a corrupt government-wide effort that drew in ambassadors, cabinet officials, executive branch agencies, and the office of the president. This effort threatened the security of Ukraine in its military struggle with Russia and compromised our own national security interests because the President cared only about his personal political interests. In the spring of 2019, the people of Ukraine elected a new leader, Volodymyr Zelensky, who campaigned on a platform of rooting out corruption in his country. This pledge was welcomed by the United States and its allies. But the new government also threatened the work of President Trump's chief agent in Ukraine, Rudy Giuliani. As President Zelensky was taking power, Mr. Giuliani was already engaged in an effort to convince Ukrainian officials to announce two sham investigations. The first was an effort to smear former Vice President Joe Biden. The second, was designed to undermine the intelligence community's unanimous assessment that Russia interfered in the 2016 election. One obstacle to Mr. Giuliani's work was Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch. A 33-year veteran of the Foreign Service, Ambassador Yovanovitch had partnered with Ukraine to root out the kind of corruption that would have allowed Mr. Giuliani's lies to flourish. In order to complete his mission, Mr. Giuliani first needed Ambassador Yovanovitch out of the way. And so in early 2019, Mr. Giuliani launched a public smear campaign against the ambassador, an effort that involved Mr. Giuliani's allies in Ukraine, the president's allies in the United States, and eventually President Trump himself. Please remember that the object of the president's Ukraine scheme was to obtain a corrupt advantage for his re-election campaign. As we will show, the President went to extraordinary lengths to cheat in the next election. That scheme begins with the attempt to get Ambassador Ivanovich, quote, out of the way, unquote. By all accounts, Ambassador Ivanovich was a highly respected and effective ambassador. Witnesses uniformly praised her 33-year career as a nonpartisan public servant, and told us that she particularly excelled in fighting corruption abroad. President George Bush named her as an ambassador twice, and President Obama nominated her as ambassador to Ukraine, where she represented the United States from 2016 to 2019. Eradicating corruption in Ukraine has been a key policy priority of the U.S. government for years. During the House inquiry, the ambassador explained why implementing this anti-corruption policy was so important. As critical as the war against Russia is, Ukraine's struggling democracy has an equally important challenge, battling the Soviet legacy of corruption which has pervaded Ukraine's government. Corruption makes Ukraine's leaders ever vulnerable to Russia, and the Ukrainian people understand that. That's why they launched the Revolution of Dignity in 2014, demanding to be a part of Europe, demanding the transformation of the system, demanding to live under the rule of law. 
Ukrainians wanted the law to apply equally to all people, whether the individual in question is the president or any other citizen. It was a question of fairness, of dignity. Here again, there is a coincidence of interest. Corrupt leaders are inherently less trustworthy, while an honest and accountable Ukrainian leadership makes a U.S.-Ukrainian partnership more reliable and more valuable to the United States. On the evening of April 24, 2019, Ambassador Yovanovitch was hosting an event at the U.S. Embassy, honoring the memory of an anti-corruption fighter who had been killed when acid was thrown in her face the previous year. At about 10 that night, the embassy event was interrupted by a telephone call from Washington. Ambassador Yovanovitch described this conversation with the head of the State Department's Human Resources Department. She said that there was uh, great concern on the seventh floor of the State Department. That's where the leadership of the State Department sits. There was great concern. Uh, they were worried. Um, she just wanted to give me a heads up about this. Um, and, you know, things seemed to be going on. And so she just wanted to give me a heads up. Confused, the ambassador asked for more information from Washington. Three hours later, they spoke again. Ambassador Ivanovich learned that there were concerns about her, quote, up the street, that is, at the White House. The ambassador was told to get, to get on the first plane home. Why was this suspected career diplomat abruptly removed from her post? Why was she, in fact, urged by the State Department to catch the first plane home, that she was in danger, she shouldn't wait? At the time, the White House would not say, but today we know the truth. The truth is that Ambassador Ivanovich was the victim of a smear campaign organized by Rudy Giuliani, amplified by President Trump's allies, and designed to give President Trump the pretext he needed to recall her without warning. Mr. Giuliani has admitted as much to the press. In order to understand Mr. Giuliani's smear campaign, against Ambassador Yovanovitch, you need to know about a few additional characters who Mr. Giuliani drew into his scheme. The first of these characters is Viktor Shokin, the disgraced former prosecutor general of Ukraine who was fired by the Ukrainian government for gross corruption. In 2016, at the urging of the U European Union, the International Monetary Fund, and the United States government, the Parliament of Ukraine voted to remove Mr. Shokin as Prosecutor General because he was corrupt and refused to prosecute corruption cases. At the urging of the United States, the European Union, the International Monetary Fund, all urged the Ukraine government to dismiss Mr. Shokin. The second character is Yuri Lutsenko, who succeeded Mr. Shokin as Prosecutor General. Mr. Lutsenko also proved reluctant to prosecute corruption cases, and several witnesses testified that he also had a reputation for dishonesty and corruption. Ambassador Yovanovitch and Deputy Assistant Secretary George Kent both testified that the U.S. Embassy in Kiev eventually stopped working with Mr. Lutsenko altogether. Shokin, Lutsenko, and Giuliani the goals of all three characters were aligned. Shokin had it out for Vice President Biden because of the role that the Vice President played in his 2016 firing. The Vice President, carrying out U.S. policy, urged the Ukrainian government to dismiss the corrupt Shokin. I note that the Vice President, the former Vice President, has been has been criticized for, urge, for urging that he be fired. Lutsenko found his career trajectory fading and wanted President Trump's support to boost his political prospects in Ukraine. Giuliani needed partners in Ukraine willing to announce two sham investigations meant to boost President Trump's own campaign. All three wanted Ambassador Yovanovitch out of the way. And so in early 2019, the smear campaign began. Ms. Lutsenko became the primary vector for false allegations against Ambassador Yovanovitch. 
Deputy Assistant Secretary George Kent testified that Lutsenko's allegations against Ambassador Yovanovitch were motivated by revenge. Over the course of 2018 and 2019, I became increasingly aware of an effort by Rudy Giuliani and others, including his associates Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman, to run a campaign to smear Ambassador Yovanovitch and other officials at the U.S. Embassy in Kyiv. The chief agitators on the Ukrainian side of this effort were some of those same corrupt former prosecutors I had encountered, particularly Yuri Lutsenko and Viktor Shokin. They were now peddling false information in order to extract revenge against those who had exposed their misconduct, including U.S. diplomats, Ukrainian anti-corruption officials, and reform-minded civil society groups in Ukraine. As Mr. Kent indicated, the smear campaign against Ambassador Ivanovich was orchestrated by a core group of corrupt Ukrainian officials working at Mr. Giuliani's direction. This group included two additional characters who have been in the news of late, Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman. Mr. Parnas and Mr. Fruman were, of course, indicted last year on several charges, including charges related to large donations they made to support President Trump. Simply put, in doing her job well, Ambassador Yovanovitch drew Mr. Lutsenko's ire. And as Mr. Kent observed, you can't promote principled anti-corruption efforts without pissing off corrupt people. As it turned out, this statement applied to Yuri Lutsenko and to Rudy Giuliani, who feared that the ambassador would stand in the way of his corrupt efforts to coerce Ukraine into conducting investigations that would benefit the political interests of his client, President Trump. Giuliani's coordinated smear campaign against Ambassador Yovanovitch became public in the United States in late March 2019, with the publication of a series of opinion pieces in The Hill based on interviews with Lutsenko. On March 20th, 2019, in one piece in The Hill, Lutsenko falsely alleged that Ambassador Yovanovitch had given him a so-called do not prosecute list. <coughs> not only was the allegation false, but after having helped originate the claim, Lutsenko himself would later go on to retract it. The same piece also falsely stated that Ambassador Yovanovitch, Yovanovitch had, quote, made disparaging statements about President Trump, unquote. A statement issued by the State Department declared the allegations to be a total fabrication. President Trump promoted Solomon's article in a tweet, which intensified the public attacks against Ambassador Yovanovitch. Then on March 24th, Donald Trump Jr. called Ambassador Yovanovitch a joker on Twitter and called for her, called for her removal. You can see the slides of the two tweets. These unfounded smears by the president and his son reverberated in Ukraine. Deputy Assistant Secretary George Kent testified that starting in mid-March, Rudy Giuliani was almost unmissable in this, quote, campaign of slander, close quote. And according to Mr. Kent, Mr. Lutsenko's press spokeswoman retweeted Donald Trump Jr.'s tweet attacking the ambassador further undermining her standing in Ukraine. Her standing, the United States ambassador's standing. Mr. Giuliani was not content to stay behind the scenes either. He promoted the same attacks on the ambassador, on Twitter, Fox News, and elsewhere. At the end of March, the attacks intensified. Ambassador Yovanovitch sent Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs David Hale an email detailing her concerns and asking for a strong statement of support from the State Department. In reply, the State Department told her that they were unwilling to help her, their own ambassador, because if they issued a public statement supporting her, quote, it could be undermined, unquote, by the president, and their concern that, quote, the rug would be pulled out from underneath the State Department. The State Department cannot express support for an American ambassador threatened abroad because they are concerned 
that if they express support for that American ambassador, the rug will be pulled out from under them by the President. What it must have taken to convince our State Department to refuse support to its ambassador. Phone records show that Giuliani also kept the White House surprised of these developments, as you can see from these slides. Again, it is worth remembering that smearing Ambassador Ivanovich was a means to an end. Removing her would allow the President's allies the freedom to pressure Ukraine to announce their sham investigations. So we should talk for a few minutes about the investigations that Rudy Giuliani and his henchmen were promoting on behalf of the President. Let's focus first on the allegation that Ukraine, not Russia, interfered in our last presidential election. In February 2017, shortly after the intelligence community, the CIA, the FBI, all the intelligence agencies of the United States unanimously assessed that Russia interfered in the election to help Donald Trump, this alternative theory gained some attention when Russian President Putin promoted it at a press conference. Second, he said, I'm quoting from him, it's in the Russian on the slides, I think. Second, as we all know, during the presidential campaign in the United States, the Ukrainian government adopted a unilateral position in favor of one candidate. More than that, certain oligarchs, certainly with the approval of the political leadership, funded this candidate, or female candidate, to be more precise. That's President Putin talking, shifting the blame to Ukraine. Dr. Fiona Hill best explained how the Ukraine narrative is a fictional narrative being propagated by the Russian security services. Based on questions and statements I've heard, some of you on this committee appear to believe that Russia and its security services did not conduct a campaign against our country, and that perhaps, somehow, for some reason, Ukraine did. This is a fictional narrative that has been perpetrated and propagated by the Russian security services themselves. The unfortunate truth is that Russia was the foreign power that systematically attacked our democratic institutions in 2016. This is the public conclusion of our intelligence agencies confirmed in bipartisan congressional reports. It is beyond dispute, even if some of the underlying details must remain classified. The impact of the successful 2016 Russian campaign remains evident today. Our nation is being torn apart. Truth is questioned. Our highly professional and expert career foreign service is being undermined. U.S. support for Ukraine, which continues to face armed Russian aggression, has been politicized. The Russian government's goal is to weaken our country, to diminish America's global role, and to neutralize a perceived U.S. threat to Russian interests. President Trump knew this, too. His former Homeland Security Advisor, Tom Bossert, said that the idea that Ukraine hacked the the DNC server was, quote, not only a conspiracy theory, it is completely debunked, close quote. And he and other U.S. officials spent hours with the president explaining why. The second false allegation that the president wanted the Ukrainians to announce was that Vice President Biden used his power to protect the company on whose board his son sat by forcing the removal of Viktor Shokin, the corrupt former prosecutor general. It is true that Vice President Biden helped remove Mr. Shokin, who was widely believed to be corrupt. And as I said a few minutes ago, it was official policy of the United States, the European community, and others in order to fight corruption in Ukraine to ask that Shokin and Lutsenko be removed. So the Vice President, Vice President Biden, in fulfilling U.S. policy, pressured Ukraine to remove Shokin, not to secure some personal benefit, but to advance the official policy of the United States and its allies. Even Ms. Lutsenko, who initially ceded the allegations against Mr. Biden in American media, later admitted that the allegations 
against the Vice President were false. And Rudy, and Rudy Giuliani told Kurt Volker, the Special Representative for Ukrainian Negotiations, who had a prominent role in the scheme, that he also knew the attacks on Joe Biden were a lie. With Ambassador Yovanovitch out of the way, the first chapter of the Ukraine scheme was complete. Mr. Giuliani and his agents could now apply direct pressure to the Ukrainian government to spread these two falsehoods. And who benefited from this scheme? Who sent Mr. Giuliani to Ukraine in the first place? Of course, we could rephrase that question as the former Republican leader of the Senate, Howard Baker, asked it in 1973. What did the president know, and when did he know it? Mr. Chief Justice, Senators, President's Council. President Trump and President Zelensky's relationship started out well. President Trump wanted the two investigations from Zelensky and he had no reason to believe that he would not get what he wanted. On April 21st, 2019, Zelensky, who was new to politics, won a landslide victory in Ukraine's presidential election. That evening, President Trump called Zelensky to congratulate him. On that first call, the first call, Zelensky invited President Trump to visit Ukraine for the upcoming inauguration. President Trump, in turn, promised that his administration would send someone at a very, very high level. During that same April call, President Trump invited Zelensky to the White House, saying, when you're settled in and ready, I'd like to invite you to the White House. We have a lot of things to talk about, but we're with you all the way. Zelensky immediately accepted the president's invitation, adding that the whole team and I are looking forward to that visit. Numerous witnesses testified about the significance of a White House meeting for the political newcomer. A White House meeting would show Ukrainians that America supported Zelensky's anti-corruption platform, the clear backing of the President of the United States, Ukraine's most important patron, would also send a powerful message to Russia that we had Ukraine's back. During that April 24th call, President Trump never even uttered the word corruption. But the White House call recap falsely stated that the two presidents had discussed Ukraine's anti-corruption efforts. Shortly after the phone call, Jennifer Williams, advisor to Vice President Pence, learned that President Trump asked Vice President Pence to attend Zelensky's inauguration. Williams and her colleagues began planning for Pence's trip to Kyiv. At the same time, Giuliani was trying to get Ukraine to investigate the Bidens and the alleged 2016 election interference. On April 24, Giuliani went on Fox and Friends and had this to say. Keep your eye on Ukraine. Because in Ukraine, a lot of the dirty work was done in digging up the information. American officials we used, Ukrainian officials we used, that's like collusion with the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. And, uh, or actually in this case, conspiracy with the Ukrainians. I think it gets some interesting information about Joe Biden uh, from uh, Ukraine, about his son, Hunter Biden, about a company he was on the board of for years, ceilings. which may be one of the most crooked companies in Ukraine. For this campaign to be truly beneficial to his boss, President Trump, Giuliani needed access to the new government in Ukraine. He dispatched his associates, Lev Parnas and Igor Fruman, to try to make inroads with the Zelensky team. 
on April 25, former Vice President Biden publicly announced his bid for the presidency, and immediately he was at the top of the polls. That same day, David Holmes, an American diplomat at our embassy in Ukraine, learned that Giuliani had reached out to the head of President Zelensky's campaign. As Mr. Holmes explained, the new Ukrainian government began to think that Giuliani was a significant person in terms of managing their relationship with the United States. As Giuliani and his associates worked behind the scenes to get access to the new leadership in Ukraine, President Trump was publicly signaling his interest in the investigations. On May 2nd, the president appeared on Fox News, who had asked, should the former vice president explain himself on his feeling in Ukraine and whether there was a conflict with his son's business interests, President Trump replied as follows. I, I'm hearing it's a major scandal, major problem, mm -hmm. very bad things happened, and we'll see what that is. And they even have him on tape talking about it. They have Joe Biden on tape talking about the prosecutor, and I've seen that tape. A lot of people are talking about that tape. But that's up for them. They have to solve that problem. The tape President Trump referenced is a video from January 2018, in which Vice President Biden explained he placed an ultimatum to the Ukrainian president to remove the corrupt prosecutor general to ensure that the taxpayer money would be used appropriately. The vice president's actions were consistent with official U.S. policy, as well as the opinions of the international community. On May 9, the New York Times published an article about Giuliani's plan to visit Ukraine. In the article, Giuliani confirmed that he planned to meet Zelensky. At that meeting, he wanted to press the Ukrainian government to pursue the investigations, investigations that President Trump promoted only days earlier. Giuliani said, we're not meddling in an election, we're meddling in an investigation which we have a right to do. Giuliani even went so far as to acknowledge that his actions could benefit President Trump personally. He said, and I quote, this isn't foreign policy. I'm asking them to do an investigation they're doing already and that other people are telling them to stop. And I'm going to give them reasons why they shouldn't stop it because that information would be very, very helpful to my client and may turn out to be helpful to my government. That's it. Right there, Giuliani admitting he was asking Ukraine to work on investigations that would be very, very helpful to the president. He was not doing foreign policy. He was not doing this on behalf of the government. He was doing this for personal interests of his client, Donald J. Trump. The next morning on May 10, amid coverage of his planned trip to Ukraine, Giuliani tweeted further about Biden, then had a flurry of calls with partners who was helping in planning his trip to Ukraine. That same day, Giuliani also spoke with Ambassador Volker on the phone for more than 30 minutes. Ambassador Volker had learned that Giuliani intended to travel to Ukraine and had called to warn Giuliani that Prosecutor General Lusensko is not credible. Don't listen to what he is saying. Later that day, Giuliani had a 17-minute call with a masked White House number before speaking again with Parnas for 12 minutes. That same day, on May 10, Politico asked President Trump about Giuliani's upcoming trip, and he replied, I have not spoken to him at any great length, but I will. I will speak, speak to him before he leaves. But that evening, on Fox News, Giuliani announced, 
I'm not going to Ukraine because I think I'm walking into a group of people that are enemies of the president. Separately, in a text message to Politico, Giuliani alleged that the original offer for a meeting with Zelensky was a setup. He said it was a setup orchestrated by several vocal critics of President Trump who were advising Zelensky. Giuliani declared, Zelensky is in the hands of about enemies of President Trump. But Giuliani had not stopped trying. He had Parnas sent a letter from him to Zelensky's senior aide on May 11, asking for a meeting. That later made it clear that Giuliani was representing the pres President Trump as a private citizen and that he was working with President Trump's knowledge and consent. The letter is on the slide and reads, quote, in my capacity as personal counsel to President Trump and with his knowledge and consent, I request a meeting with you on this upcoming Monday, May 13, or Tuesday, May 14. I will need no more than half an hour of your time, and I will be accompanied by my colleague, Victoria Tunzing, a distinguished American attorney who is very familiar with this matter. But it did not appear that Giuliani and Parnas' attempts to get the meeting were working. That same day, Giuliani sent a text to Parnas asking, this guy is canceling meeting, I think. Approximately three hours later, Giuliani sent Parnas drafts of a public statement that people advising the president-elect are no friends of the president. Three days later, President Trump instructed Vice President Pence not to attend the inauguration in Ukraine. Just three days later, Vice, president, Vice Presidential Staffer Jennifer Williams received a surprising call from Prince's Chief of Staff. She described it during her public testimony. On May 13th, an assistant to the Vice President's Chief of Staff called and informed me that President Trump had decided that the Vice President would not attend the inauguration in Ukraine. She did not provide any further explanation. I relayed that instruction to others involved in planning the potential trip. I also informed the NSC that the Vice President would not be attending so that it could identify a head of delegation to represent the United States at President-elect Zelensky's inauguration. Notably, Williams confirmed that the inauguration date had not yet been decided, scheduled, been scheduled at the time of that phone call. So the reason for President Trump's decision was certainly not due to a scheduling conflict. Secretary of Energy Rick Perry ultimately left the delegation to the inaugural. Accompanying Secretary Perry were Ambassador to the European Union, Gordon Sondland, Ambassador Volker, and NSC Director for Ukraine, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman. Senator Rob Johnson also attended many of the inaugural events with the delegation. When asked if this delegation was a good group, Holmes replied, it was not as senior a delegation as we might have expected. After the inauguration, Ambassadors Volker and Sondland left Kyiv with a favor very favorable impression of President Zelensky. Ambassador Volker said they believed it was important that, that President Trump personally engaged with the President of Ukraine in order to demonstrate full U.S. support for him. When the inauguration team returned to the United States, <clears throat> they had a meeting with President Trump on May 23. The May 23 meeting with President Trump proved to be important for two good reasons. First, with Ambassador Yovanovitch out of the way, President Trump authorized Ambassador Sondland, 
Secretary Perry and Ambassador Volker to lead engagement with the new administration in Ukraine. And two, President Trump instructed them to satisfy Giuliani's concerns in order to move forward on Ukraine matters. These officials were all political appointees, and Ambassador Sondland had donated a million dollars to the president's inauguration. The president saw these three political appointees <clears throat> as officials who would fulfill his requests. <clears throat> Ambassador Volker testified that he, Ambassador Sondland, Secretary Perry, and Senator Johnson took turns making their case that this is a new crowd. It's a new president in Ukraine. He's committed to doing the right things, including fighting corruption. They recommended that the president, President Trump follow through on his invitation for President Zelensky to meet with him in the Oval Office. But President Trump did not receive the recommendation well. At his public hearing, Ambassador Volker described the May 23rd Oval Office meeting with President Trump. Let's listen. We stressed our finding that President Zelensky represented the best chance for getting Ukraine out of the mire of corruption it had been in for over 20 years. We urged him to invite President Zelensky to the White House. The President was very skeptical. Given Ukraine's history of corruption, that's understandable. He said that Ukraine was a corrupt country full of terrible people. He said, they tried to take me down. In the course of that conversation, he referenced conversations with Mayor Giuliani. It was clear to me that despite the positive news and recommendations being conveyed by this official delegation about the new president, President Trump had a deeply rooted negative view on Ukraine rooted in the past. He was receiving other information from other sources, including Mayor Giuliani, that was more negative, causing him to retain this negative view. Witnesses said the reference to taking me down was to unfounded allegations that Ukraine had interfered in the 2016 election. This was what President Trump considered to be corruption in Ukraine. The president's words echoed Giuliani's public statements about Ukraine in early May. Rather than committing to an Oval Office meeting with the Ukrainian leader, President Trump directed the delegation to talk to Giuliani. Here is how Ambassador Sondland described that instruction from the president. If we wanted to get anything done with Ukraine, it was apparent to us we needed to talk to Rudy. Right. You understood that Mr. Giuliani spoke for the president, correct? That's correct. Ambassador Sondland saw the writing on the wall. Sondland concluded that if we did not talk to Rudy, nothing would move forward on Ukraine. The three amigos, as they called themselves, did as the president ordered and began talking to Giuliani. Dr. Hill testified, Volker, Sondland, and Perry gave us every impression that they were meeting with Rudy Giuliani at this point, and Rudy Giuliani was also saying on the television, and indeed has, has, said, has said subsequently that he was closely coordinating with the State Department. Like Dr. Hill, Ambassador Bolton closely tracked Giuliani's Ukraine-related activities. Hill testified about a conversation she had with Bolton in May of 2019. That conversation was revealing, so let's listen. And, uh, on television making these statements, and I had already brought to Ambassador Bolton's um, attention the attacks, the smear campaign against Ambassador Ivanovich and expressed uh, great regret about how this was unfolding and, um, in fact, the shameful way in which uh, um, Ambassador Ivanovich was, um, was being smeared and attacked. And I'd asked if there was anything that we could do about it. And Ambassador Bolton had looked pained, um, basically uh, indicated with body language that there was nothing which we could do about it. 
And he then, in the course of that discussion, said that Rudy Giuliani was a hand grenade that was going to blow everyone up. Did you understand what he meant by that? I did, actually. What did he mean? Well, I think he, he meant that, obviously, what Mr. Giuliani was saying was pretty explosive in any case. Um, he was frequently on television making quite incendiary remarks about um, everyone um, involved in this, and that he was clearly pushing forward issues and ideas that would, uh, you know, probably come back to haunt us. And, in fact, I think... According to Hill's description, Bolton said that Giuliani's influence could be an obstacle to increased White House engagement with Ukraine. He instructed his staff not to meet with Giuliani. In June, Volcker and Sondland relayed to Ambassador Taylor that President Trump wanted to hear from Zelensky before scheduling the meeting in the Oval Office. Ambassador Taylor testified that he did not understand at the time what that meant. Around this time, the president publicly expressed that he thought it would be okay to accept foreign interference to assist his campaign if it was in the form of opposition research on his opponent. Let's listen to that shocking interview. Campaign this time around, if foreigners, if Russia, if China, if someone else offers you information on an opponent, should they accept it or should they call the FBI? I think maybe you do both. I think you might want to listen. I don't, there's nothing wrong with listening. If somebody called from a country, Norway, we have information on your opponent. Oh, I think I'd want to hear it. You want that kind of interference in our elections? It's not an interference. They have information. I think I'd take it. Shocking video. Meanwhile, Giuliani continued to press Ukraine to do the president's political dirty work. On June 21, for instance, Giuliani tweeted the following. New press of Ukraine still silent on investigation of Ukrainian interference in the 2016 election and alleged Biden bribery of President Poroshenko time for leadership and investigate both if you want to purge how Ukraine was abused by Hillary and Obama people. The quid pro quo scheme was taking shape. Giuliani was publicly advocating for Ukraine to conduct politically motivated investigations while President Trump refused to schedule an Oval Office meeting for Ukraine's new president. As Ambassador Sondland testified, the scheme to pressure Ukraine to conduct these investigations would only get more insidious with time. Mr. Chief Justice, uh, the majority leader expressed a preference for a break about two hours in, so it's the House manager's uh, request that I present, and then we take the break if that's uh, acceptable for everybody. Mr. Chief Justice, members of the Senate, counsel for the President, and the American people, where were you on July 25th, 2019? It was a Thursday. Members of the U.S. Senate were here in this chamber. On July 25th, across the Atlantic, our 68,000 troops stationed throughout Europe were doing what they do every day, training and preparing to support our allies and defend against Russia. The professionalism and sacrifice of our men and women in uniform is a source of great strength. But America is also strong, and America is also secure because we have friends. On July 25th, 2019, one of those friends was a man named Oleksandr Markiv. 
In a story told by Sabra Ayers of the Los Angeles Times, Alexander was a soldier in the Ukrainian army defending his country and Europe against Russian-backed forces on Ukraine's eastern front. He was in a trench. He was 38 years old. Alexander would later die defending his country during a mortar attack on his fighting position, giving his life, just like over 13,000 of his fellow Ukrainians, on the front lines of the fight for liberty in Europe. That same Los Angeles Times article painted a picture of what the Ukrainians were going through during this time. Quote, tens of thousands of Ukrainians, like Markiv, volunteered to help fight the Russian-backed separatists in the East. Many of them were sent to the front line wearing sneakers and without flak jackets and helmets, let alone rifles and ammunition. Ukrainians across the country organized in an unprecedented united civil movement not seen since World War II to raise money to supply their ragtag military with everything from soldiers' boots to bullets. And while our friends were at war with Russia, wearing sneakers, some without helmets, something else was happening. On July 25th, President Trump made a phone call. He spoke with Ukrainian President Zelensky and asked for a favor. And on that same day, just hours after his call, his administration was quietly placing an illegal hold on critical military aid to support our friends. So why should any American care about what's happening in Ukraine? Timothy Morrison, former senior director for Europe and Russia at the NSC, put it bluntly. Third, I continue to believe Ukraine is on the front lines of a strategic competition between the West and Vladimir Putin's revanchist Russia. Russia is a failing power, but it is still a dangerous one. The United States aids Ukraine and her people so they can fight Russia over there, and we don't have to fight Russia here. Support for Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty has been a bipartisan objective since Russia's military invasion in 2014. It must continue to be. We help our partner fight Russia over there so we don't have to fight Russia here. Our friends on the front lines and trenches with sneakers. Following Russia's invasion of Ukraine in 2014, the United States has stood by Ukraine. Our diplomats and military commanders have long said that supporting Ukraine makes us safer. But you don't need me to tell you that. You all know it very well. When the funding for this security assistance came up for a vote under this roof, 87 of you voted for the aid. And many of you have been staunch advocates for Ukraine, working in a nonpartisan way to support our friends. And that support makes a lot of sense, because politics should not play a part in ensuring that Ukraine can battle Russian aggression and ensure that freedom wins in Europe. This body has in so many ways set that example. Protecting Europe from Russia is not a political game. Let me provide some background. In early 2014, in what became known as the Revolution of Dignity, Ukrainian citizens demanded democratic reforms and an end to corruption, ousting the pro-Russian president. Within days, Russian military forces and their proxies invaded Ukraine, annexing Crimea and occupying portions of eastern Ukraine. Since 2014, more than 13,000 Ukrainians have been killed because of the conflict, and over 1.4 million have been forced from their homes. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is the first attempt to redraw Europe's borders since World War II. In 2017, then-Secretary of Defense James Mattis 
summed it up well. He said, quote, Despite Russia's denials, we know they are seeking to redraw international borders by force, undermining the sovereign and free nations of Europe. And as Ambassador Taylor put it, Russian aggression in Ukraine dismissed, quote, dismissed all the principles that have kept the peace and contributed to prosperity in Europe since World War II. It's clear that Russia is not just a threat in Europe, but for democracy and freedom around the world. Our friends and allies have also responded, imposing sanctions on Russia and providing billions of dollars in economic, humanitarian, and security assistance to Ukraine. This has been an international effort. Today, the European Union is the single largest contributor of foreign assistance to Ukraine, having provided roughly $12 billion in grants and loans since 2014. And the United States has provided over $3 billion in assistance in that time. Because we all know that we can't separate our own security from the security of our friends and allies. That's why the U.S. has provided economic security and humanitarian assistance in the form of equipment and training. Ambassador Taylor testified that American aid is a concrete demonstration of our, quote, commitment to resist aggression and freedom and defend freedom. He also detailed the many benefits of our assistance for Ukraine's forces. Mr. Chairman, the security assistance that we provide it takes many forms. One of the components of that assistance is counter-battery radar. Another component are sniper weapons. These weapons um, and this assistance um, it allows the Ukrainian military to deter further incursions by the Russians uh, against their own, against Ukrainian territory. If that further incursion, further aggression, um, were to take place, more Ukrainians would die. So it is a, a deterrent effect that these weapons provide. It's also the ability, it gives the Ukrainians the ability to negotiate from a position of a little more strength when they negotiate an end to the war in Donbas, negotiating with the Russians. This also is a way that would reduce the number of Ukrainians who would die. I would like to make a finer point of how this type of aid helps, because I know something about counter-battery radar. In 2005, I was an Army Ranger serving in a Special Operations Task Force in Afghanistan. We were at a remote operating base along the Afghan-Pakistan border. And frequently, the insurgents that we were fighting would launch rockets and missiles onto our small base. But luckily, we were provided with counter-battery radar. So 20, 30, 40 seconds before those rockets and mortars rained down on us, an alarm would sound. And we would run out from our tents and jump in to our concrete bunkers and wait for the attack to end. This is not a theoretical exercise. And the Ukrainians know it. For Ukraine, aid from the U.S. actually constitutes about 10% of their military budget. It's safe to say that they can't fight effectively without it. So there is no doubt U.S. military assistance to Ukraine makes a real difference in the fight against Russia. In 2019, Congress provided $391 million in security assistance. This included $250 million through the Department of Defense, the uh, Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, USAI, and $141 million through the State Department's Foreign Military Financing Program, FMF. President Trump signed the bill to authorize this aid in August 2018 and signed another bill to fund it the following month. The aid was underway. The train was leaving the station and following the same track it had followed every single year. But all of this was about to change. 
In July of 2019, President Trump ordered the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, to put a hold on all of the aid. The President personally made this decision even after his own appointed advisors warned him that it wasn't in our country's interest to withhold the aid. After overwhelming support in this Senate and against long-standing policy even in his own administration. But what's most interesting to me about this is that he was only interested in the Ukraine aid. Nobody else. The U.S. provides aid to dozens of countries around the world. Lots of partners and allies. He didn't ask about any of them. Just Ukraine. The most important question here is why would he do that? What was his motivation? Well, we now know why. This hold shocked people across our own government. The Department of Defense, along with the State Department, had already certified to Congress that Ukraine had implemented sufficient anti-corruption reforms to get the funds. And the Defense Department had already notified Congress of its intent to deliver the assistance. So let's recap all of this. Congress had already funded it. Our own government had already certified that it met all the standards it had met every other year. And Congress had already been notified just like every other year. In a series of meetings of the national security agencies, everyone except the OMB supported the provision of the assistance. And OMB, as we know, is headed by Mick Mulvaney, the president's chief of staff. Ukraine experts at DOD, the State Department, and the White House emphasized that it was in the national security interest of the U.S. to continue to support Ukraine in its fight. But it wasn't just the national security concern, because many people thought that the hold was just outright illegal. And they were right. It was. The president's hold did violate the law, because just last week, Congress's independent Nonpartisan watchdog, the Government Accountability Office, released an opinion finding that the hold was illegal. President Trump held the military aid money for so long that the administration ran out of time to spend the money. Ultimately, even after the president lifted the hold on September 11th, again with no clear explanation why, we, the Congress, had to pass another law to extend the deadline delaying the delivery of the aid. In the same LA Times article that told the story about our friend Mr. Markiev, Ukrainian defense spokesperson said that even though the hold had been lifted, this was in September, quote, it has not reached us yet. That spokesperson went on to say, quote, it is not just money from the bank, it is arms, equipment, and hardware. And to this day, millions of dollars still haven't been spent. Although our government neither informed Ukraine of the hold nor publicly announced it, Ukraine quickly learned about it. On July 25th, the same day as President Trump's call with President Zelensky, officials at Ukraine's embassy here in Washington emailed DOD to ask about the status of the funding. By mid-August, officials at DOD, the State Department, and the NSC received numerous questions from Ukrainian officials about the hold. Everyone was worried. And not just because of the urgent need for the equipment on the front lines, but also because of the message that it sent. You see, President Zelensky had just been sworn in. They were very vulnerable. And as we all know, Vladimir Putin looks for vulnerability. He looks for hesitation. He looks for delay. And any public sign of a hold on that aid could be a sign of weakness that could show him it was time to pounce. President Trump's hold on the Ukraine assistance was eventually publicly reported on August 28th. As we will explain, Ukraine fully understood that the hold was connected to the investigations that President Trump wanted. On February 28th, DOD notified Congress that it had intended to deliver $125 million of assistance appropriated in September, including, quote, more than $50 million of assistance to deliver counter-artillery radar and defense lethal assistance. 
Congress cleared the notification which enabled DOD to begin spending the funds. For Ukraine, for Ukraine to receive the remaining $125 million, Congress required that the Secretary of Defense, in coordination with the Secretary of State, certify that the government of Ukraine had taken substantial anti-corruption reforms. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Laura Cooper and senior officials across our government conducted a review to evaluate whether Ukraine had met the required benchmarks. Ms. Cooper explained that the review involved, quote, polling in all the views of the key experts on Ukraine defense and coming up with a consensus view, which was then run up the chain in the Defense Department to, to quote, ensure we have approval. By May 23rd, the anti-corruption review was complete and DOD certified to Congress that Ukraine had complied with all of the conditions and that the remaining half of the aid should be released. But again, you don't have to take my word for it. On May 23rd, in a letter to Congress, one of President Trump's senior political appointees, the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy, wrote, quote, on behalf of the Secretary of Defense, and in coordination with the Secretary of State, I have certified that the government of Ukraine has taken substantial actions to make defense institutional reforms for the purposes of decreasing corruption, increasing accountability, and sustaining improvements of combat capability enabled by U.S. assistance." End quote. Congress then cleared the funding, which should have allowed Ukraine to receive the aid, but we know that's not what happened. On June, 20, on June 18th, as DOD was preparing to send the aid, they issued a press release like they normally do, announcing that it would provide $250 million in security assistance to Ukraine for, quote, additional training, equipment, and advisory efforts to build the capacity of Ukraine's armed forces. So this included sniper rifles, rocket-propelled grenades, counter-artillery radar, command and control, electronic warfare, secure communications, vehicles, night vision, and medical equipment. However, according to the New York Times, one day after the Defense Department issued this press release, one day, assistant to the President Robert Blair, who works for Mick Mulvaney, called OMB Acting Director Russell Vaught to tell him, quote, we need to hold it up. The it was the assistance. That same day, June 19th, President Trump gave an interview on Fox News where he raised the so-called crowd strike conspiracy theory that Ukraine, not Russia, had interfered in the 2016 election, a line he would echo during his July 25th call with President Zelensky. This theory, by the way, has been advanced by Russian propaganda to try to take attention away from Russian interference and shift it onto Ukraine. And it's a theory that has been universally debunked by U.S. intelligence and law enforcement. Nonetheless, the president, spurred by the June 18th press release, and with the false theory that Ukraine interference in the 20, with the false theory about the Ukraine interference, supposedly in the 2016 election, the president started asking about the Ukraine assistance. And on June 19th, OMB. Associate Director for National Security, Michael Duffy, emailed Elaine McCusker, the DOD comptroller. He said, quote, the president had questions about the press report and that he was seeking additional information. This was a reference to an article in the Washington Examiner, shown here on the slide in front of you. The White House withheld this email from the House, of course, we first learned of it from, Mr. from Duffy's deputy, Mark Sandy, who testified that he was copied on it. Subsequently, as a result of a lawsuit under the Freedom of, of Information Act, the public, and therefore Congress, received a copy of that email. But, but, the, but the White House still refuses to comply with the subpoenas for this and other documents. On June 20th, McCusker responded to President Trump's inquiry by providing Sandy information on the security assistance program. Sandy shared the information with Duffy, but he did not know whether Duffy shared the information with the White House. 
Laura Cooper also recalled receiving an email inquiry about Ukraine security assistance, quote, a few days after DOD's June 18th press release. She noted that it was, quote, relatively unusual to receive questions from the president. In response, DOD provided materials explaining that the $250 million funding package was for additional training equipment advisory efforts to build the capacity of Ukraine's armed forces. DOD emphasized, quote, almost all of the dozens of vendors are U.S. companies, meaning that this funding also benefited U.S. businesses and workers. Nonetheless, President Trump put the wheels in motion to freeze the funds shortly after learning about DOD's plan to release the funds. According to a New York Times article on June 27th, Chief of Staff Mulvaney emailed Blair, quote, I'm just trying to tie up some loose ends. Did we ever find out about the money from Ukraine and whether we can hold it back? Blair reportedly responded that it would be impossible, but not pretty. He added, quote, expect Congress to become unhinged. And I suppose he said that for all the reasons we talked about earlier, because this chamber and our chamber on the other side of the Capitol resoundingly, resoundingly supports it. And that was just the, de the Defense Department assistance to Ukraine. For 2019, Congress also appropriated $141 million to Ukraine through the State Department. Unlike the Defense Department funding, which was approved by Congress and ready to be spent, OMB blocked the State Department from even seeking Congress's approval to release the funds. And I'd like to pause here to once again stress that we have learned a lot about the circumstances around the initial hold only from the public release of and reporting about these emails in the past few weeks. The White House has refused to provide these emails in response to a subpoena. Mick Mulvaney and Rob Blair refused to comply with the subpoena to testify. These emails are just a few of the many thousands that likely exist on this topic, but which have been concealed from Congress and the American people because of the ongoing obstruction. In fact, last night, as we were here late into the night, sometime around midnight, a new tranche of documents were released under a Freedom of Information Act request by an independent watchdog that had been asking for them. They were released last night between Mr. Duffy and Elaine McCusker and others on the things that I'm talking about right now. Unfortunately, as you can see, there isn't a lot to read here because it's all blacked out. So if the president's lawyers contest any of the facts that I'm talking about, you should demand to see the full record. The American people deserve to see the full truth when it comes to presidential actions. But back to the timeline. From July to September 2019, the president and his advisors at the White House and OMB implemented the hold on Ukraine assistance through an unusual and unlawful process. First, on July 3rd, the State Department notified DOD and NSC staff that OMB was blocking this notification to Congress. According to Jennifer Williams, Vice President Pence's aide, the hold on this assistance, quote, came out of the blue because it had not been previously discussed by OMB or NSC. Around July 12th, President Trump directed that a hold be placed on the DOD security assistance as well. That day, Mr. Blair sent an email to Duffy at OMB informing him that, quote, that the president is directing a hold on military support funding for Ukraine. Around July 15th, Tim Morrison learned from Deputy Director or Advisor Charles Kupperman, quote, that it was the president's direction to hold the assistance. Several days later, Duffy and Blair again exchanged emails about Ukraine and security assistance. And Sandy testified that in these emails, Duffy asked Blair about the reason for the hold. Blair provided no explanation. Instead, he said, quote, we need to let the hold take place. And then, quote, revisit the issue with the president. Between, between July 18th and July 31st, 
the NSC staff convened several interagency meetings at which the hold on security assistance was discussed. Remember those dates, July 18th to July 31st. According to Mark Sandy and other witnesses, several facts emerged. First, the agencies learned that the president himself had directed the hold through OMB. Second, no justification or explanation was provided for the hold, despite repeated questions. Third, except for OMB, all agencies supported military aid because it was in the national security interest of the United States. And fourth, many were concerned that the hold was outright illegal. Ambassador Taylor learned of the hold on July 18th. He said, quote, the directive had come from the president to the chief of staff to OMB and that he, quote, sat in astonishment because one of the key pillars of our strong support for Ukraine was threatened. David Holmes, a diplomat at the U.S. Embassy in Kyiv, testified that he was shocked by the hold. Although there was an initial there was initially some question as to whether the hold applied to DOD funds, which was already cleared by Congress. It soon became clear that the hold applied to all $391 million. Tim Morrison testified that DOD officials raised concerns at a meeting on July 23rd about whether it was, quote, actually legally permissible for the president to not allow for the disbursement of the funding. These concerns related to possible violations of the Impoundment Control Act the law that gives the president the authority to delay or withhold funds only if Congress is notified of those intentions and approves the proposed action. Of course, neither of those things had been done. The issue was escalated quickly, and at a senior-level meeting on July 26th, OMB remained the lone voice for holding the aid. According to Tim Morrison, OMB said that President Trump was concerned about corruption in Ukraine. Cooper from DOD also attended the July meeting. She received no further understanding of what was meant by corruption. There was never a principals meeting con convened on this issue. But there was a fourth and final interagency meeting on July 31st. Remember that date? A fourth and final one. There is a process for making sure that U.S. aid money makes it to the right place to the right people. And Mr. Chief Justice, uh, I, I, see, I do see uh, a lot of members moving and, and taking a break. Would you like to take a break at this time? I have another probably 15 minutes. Oh, I think we can continue. Okay. If, if I may, what I was going to suggest was at 6.30, we take a 30-minute break for dinner. Okay. If that yes. would work. So break at 6.30? Yep, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, what I was going to suggest was a break for dinner at 6.30 for about 30 minutes. Does that work? Yeah. So we know there was a hold, but there was no lawful way to implement that hold. So the OMB had to use creative methods. There is a process for making sure that U.S. aid money makes it to the right place to the right people, a process that has been followed every year since Congress approved security assistance to Ukraine. The administration needed to find a way, a creative way of getting around that process. Later in the evening of July 25th, the OMB found that way, even though DOD had already notified Congress that the funds would be released. Here is how it worked. First, OMB issued guidance asserting that there was an ongoing review of assistance, even though none of the witnesses who te testified were aware of any review of assistance. Second, OMB also attempted to hide the hold in a series of technical footnotes and funding documents. And third, OMB's leadership also transferred responsibility for approving funding obligations from career civil servant Mark Sandy to a political appointee. Mark Duffy, someone with no relevant experience in this funding. Based on recent public reporting and documents DOD released under the Freedom of Information Act, we learned that on July 25th, 
approximately 90 minutes after President Trump's phone call with President Zelensky, Mr. Duffy put this, this three-pronged plan into motion when he sent an email to senior DOD officials copying Sandy. The email is in front of you. In this email, Duffy stated, quote, based on guidance I have received and in light of the administration's plan to review assistance to Ukraine, please hold off on any additional DOD obligations of these funds pending direction from that process. Duffy also underscored, quote, given the sensitive nature of the request, I appreciate you keeping that information closely held to those who need to know to execute the direction. In other words, don't tell anybody about it. Later that day, Sandy approved and signed the first July 25th funding document, which delayed funding until August 5th. Sandy testified that the purpose of this and subsequent footnotes, quote, was to preclude obligation for a limited period of time, but enable planning and casework to continue. Sandy also testified that his use of footnotes was unusual, and that in his 12 years of OMB experience, he could, quote, not recall another event like it. On July 29th, Duffy told Sandy he would no longer be responsible for approving the release of DOD Ukraine funding. This was only weeks after Sandy had raised questions about the legality of the president's hold. Duffy also revoked the authority for approving the release of the State Department funding from Sandy's colleague at OMB. In short, Duffy assumed approval authority for all $391 million of the assistance. Over the next several weeks, with Duffy in charge, OMB continued to issue funding documents that kept kicking the can down the road, supposedly to allow for an interagency process. And remember, an interagency inter process that had already wrapped up back in July. While inserting the whole time footnotes throughout the apportionment documents, stating that the delay wouldn't affect the program. And yet concerns continued to be relayed within DOD that it had. In total, OMB issued nine of these documents between July 25th and September 10th. Even as OMB was implementing the president's hold, officials inside OMB advocated for the release of the funds. On August 7th, OMB staff sent a memo to Director Vaught recommending removing the hold because the assistance was consistent with the national security strategy in terms of, one, supporting a stable, peaceful Europe, two, the fact that the aid countered Russian aggression, and three, that there was bipartisan support for the program. This meant that experts at every single relevant agency involved opposed the hold. By mid-August, DOD raised concerns that it might not be able to fully spend the DOD funds before the end of the fiscal year. Laura Cooper testified that DOD estimated $100 million of the aid was at risk of not getting to Ukraine. DOD concluded that it could no longer support OMB's claim that the footnotes, quote, that in the footnotes, that, quote, this brief pause in obligations will not preclude DOD's timely execution of the final policy direction, end quote. Sandy testified that this sentence in the footnote was, quote, at the heart of that issue about ensuring that we don't run afoul of the Impoundment Control Act. Records produced in response to a FOIA lawsuit show that Mr. Duffy and Ms. McCusker exchanged emails on August 20th, and on that date, OMB modified the footnote. These emails are almost entirely redacted. However, all the subsequent footnotes issued by OMB during the pendency of the hold removed the sentence regarding DOD's ability to fully obligate the funds by the end of the fiscal year. Nevertheless, OMB continued to implement the hold at the President's direction. We know from emails released last night that as of September 5th, OMB was continuing to instruct DOD to hold the aid. OMB gave these emails to a private organization just because of a FOIA lawsuit. On September 5th, Duffy emailed McCusker the following, quote, no movement from Ukraine, footnote forthcoming to continue hold through Friday, end quote. 
We know that McCusker responded to OMB with a lengthy email detailing DOD's serious concerns, but OMB redacted almost the whole thing. As I explained last night, OMB has key documents that, the, that President Trump has refused to turn over to Congress, key documents that go to the heart of one of the ways in which the President abused his power. Concerns about whether the administration was bending, if not breaking, the law contributed to at least two OMB officials resigning, including an attorney in OMB. According to Sandy, one colleague specifically disagreed with OMB General Counsel about the application of the Empowerment Control Act. As I mentioned earlier, the independent and nonpartisan Government Accountability Office has already said that the hold was illegal. But you remember the OMB correspondence remembering the, uh, referencing the, quote, interagency process. As we now know, there was no interagency process. It had ended months before. They made it up. They had to make it up because they couldn't say the real reason for the hold. Sometime prior to August 16th, Ambassador Bolton had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with President Trump. According to Morrison, at that meeting, the president, quote, was not ready to approve the release of the assistance. Ambassador Bolton instructed Morrison to look for other opportunities to get the president's cap uh, cabinet together to, quote, have the direct in-person conversation with the president about this topic. Everyone was worried, including the president's national security advisor. In mid-August, Colonel Vidman drafted a presidential decision memorandum for Ambassador Bolton to present to President Trump for a dis decision on Ukraine security assistance. The memorandum rec recommended that the hold be lifted. Morrison testified that the memorandum was never provided to the president because of other competing issues. Morrison testified that a meeting with the president was never arranged in August, reportedly because of scheduling problems. According to recent press reports, on August 30th, Secretary of Defense Esper, Secretary of State Pompeo, met with President Trump and implored him to release the security assistance because doing so was in the interests of the United States. However, President Trump continued to ignore everybody. Later that day, Duffy emailed Under Secretary of Defense Elaine McCusker and wrote, quote, clear direction from POTUS to hold. The Ukrainian government knew of President Trump's hold on security assistance well before it was publicly reported on August 28th. This was not surprising. U.S. diplomat Catherine Croft testified it was, quote, inevitable that it was eventually going to come out. She said two individuals from the Ukrainian embassy here in Washington approached her approximately a week apart, quote, quietly and in confidence, to ask me about an OMB hold on, sec on Ukraine security assistance. She could not precisely recall the dates of these conversations, but testified that she was, quote, very surprised at the effectiveness of my Ukrainian counterparts. Everyone was worried. So why would these diplomats quietly make this inquiry? It's because if it had gone public, it would show that weakness against Russia that was so concerning to everybody involved. She said, quote, I think that if, if, that if this were public in Ukraine, it would be seen as a reversal of our policy. It would be a really big deal in Ukraine and an expression of declining U.S. support for Ukraine. Meanwhile, Laura Cooper testified that DOD heard from the Ukrainian embassy on July 25th, the same day as President Trump's call to President Zelensky. On July 25th, a member of my staff got a question from a Ukraine embassy contact asking what was going on with Ukraine security assistance. Because at that time, we did not know what the guidance was on USAI. Uh, the OMB notice of apportionment arrived that day, but the staff member did not find out about it until later. I was informed that the staff member told the Ukrainian official that we were moving forward on USAI 
but recommended that the Ukraine embassy check in with state regarding the FMF. USAI referred to the $250 million that OMB blocked DOD from sending to Ukraine. FMF referred to the $141 million that they blocked from the State Department. On July 25th, Cooper's staff also received two emails from the State Department revealing that the Ukrainian embassy was, quote, asking about security assistance and that the Hill knows about the FMF situation to an extent, and so does the Ukrainian embassy. One of Cooper's staff members reported additional contacts with Ukrainian officials about the hold in August. Finally, we know the Ukrainians knew about the hold because the New York Times published an interview with the former Deputy Foreign Minister of Ukraine, Elena Zirkel. She stated that she and President Zelensky's office received a cable in late July informing them of the hold. In short, by the time of Politico's report on August 28th, the Ukrainians were well aware that the aid was not only important, was not, was not the only important official act that the White House was withholding from them. The long sought White House visit for President Zelensky was also in limbo. As all of this transpired, Ukrainian troops were still on the front lines in eastern Ukraine, facing off against Russian backed forces, dying in defense of their country. Ambassador Bill Taylor visited those Ukrainian troops on July 26. He recalled seeing, quote, the armed and hostile Russian-led force on the other side of the damaged bridge across the line of the contact. When asked to reflect on that visit, here is what Ambassador Taylor had to say. Let's talk about July 26th, a lot of years later. You go to the front, you go to Donbass with Ambassador Volker, I believe, and you're on the bridge and you're looking over on the front line at the Russian soldiers. Is that, is that what you recalled? Yes, sir. And you said the commander there, the Ukrainian commander, thanked you for the American military assistance that you knew was being withheld at that moment. That's correct. How'd that make you feel, sir? Badly. Why? <laughs> because it was clear that that commander counted on us. It was clear that that commander had confidence in us. It was clear that that commander had, was appreciative of the capabilities that he was given by that assistance, but also the reassurance that we were supporting him. Like me, Ambassador Taylor is a combat veteran. In fact, he was awarded a Bronze Star Ambassador Taylor knew how vital our military aid was to those Ukrainian troops because he knows what it feels like to have people counting on you. Members of the U.S. Senate, I know you believe that aid is important too because 87 members of this body voted to support it. President Trump did not think the aid was important last year. He ignored you and the direction of Congress. He betrayed the confidence of our Ukrainian partners and U.S. national security when he corruptly withheld that aid. And he did so because he simply wanted to help his own political campaign. Our men and women in uniform deserve better. Our friends and allies deserve better. The American people deserve better. Chief Justice Roberts, Senators, and Counsel for the President. Now I want to talk to you about the White House meeting that President Trump offered to President Zelensky during their first phone call in April. But as you know, that meeting has not been scheduled. It was never scheduled. Ambassador Sondland testified that after the May 23rd meeting with President Trump, it became clear that President Zelensky would not be invited to the Oval Office until he announced the opening of investigations that would benefit President Trump's re-election. During his testimony, Ambassador Sondland stressed 
that it was a clear quid pro quo. Let's listen. I know that members of this committee frequently frame these complicated issues in the form of a simple question. Was there a quid pro quo? As I testified previously, with regard to the requested White House call and the White House meeting, the answer is yes. Mr. Giuliani conveyed to Secretary Perry, Ambassador Volcker, and others that President Trump wanted a public statement from President Zelensky committing to investigations of Burisma and the 2016 election. Mr. Giuliani expressed those requests directly to the Ukrainians, and Mr. Giuliani also expressed those requests directly to us. We all understood that these prerequisites for the White House call and the right White House meeting reflected President Trump's desires and requirements. Ambassador Sondland also testified that the scheme to pressure Ukraine into fulfilling the president's requirements for an Oval Office meeting became progressively and more specific and problematic. What he described as a continuum of insidiousness, he explained the evolution from generic requests to investigate corruption to calls to pursue specific allegations against President Trump's political opponents. Here is Ambassador Sondland again. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, when we left the Oval Office, uh, I believe on May 23rd, uh, the request was very generic for an investigation of corruption in a very vanilla sense and uh, dealing with some of the oligarch problems in Ukraine, which were longstanding problems. And then as time went on, uh, more specific items got added to the menu, uh, including the uh, Burisma and 2016 election uh, meddling specifically, the DNC service specifically. And over this, over this continuum, uh, it became more and more difficult to secure the White House meeting because more conditions were being placed on the White House meeting. In short, Ambassadors Volker and Sondland understood that to get the meeting scheduled, they needed to get Mr. Giuliani's agreement first. On Ju June 27, Ambassador Sondland explained to Ambassador Taylor that President Trump needed to hear from the Ukrainian leader before he would consent to a White House meeting. Here is how Ambassador Taylor explained it. On June 27th, Ambassador Sondland told me during a phone conversation that President Zelensky needed to make clear to President Trump that he, President Zelensky, was not standing in the way of investigations. Diplomat David Holmes testified that he understood early on the investigations to mean the Burisma Biden investigations that Mr. Giuliani and his associates had been speaking about publicly. Mr. Holmes noted that while President Trump was withholding an oval meeting with Ukraine's newly elected leader, he agreed to meet with Ukraine's chief foe, Vladimir Putin. Mr. Holmes had this to say. Also on June 28th, while President Trump was still not moving forward on a meeting with President Zelensky, we met with, he met with Russian President Putin at the G20 summit in Osaka, Japan, sending a further signal of lack of support to Ukraine. Ambassador Volker did not dispute other witnesses' testimony that President Trump conditioned Oval Office meetings on President Zelensky's willingness to announce investigations. Indeed, Ambassador Volker helped matters along. Ambassador Volker testified that at a conference in early July, he suggested that President Zelensky speak to President Trump on the phone to discuss the investigations. During his testimony, Ambassador Volker described that encounter. And in the July 2nd or 3rd meeting in Toronto that you had with President Zelensky, 
you also mentioned investigations to him, yes. right? And again, you were referring to the I was, Burisma I was thinking and the 2016. Of Burisma in 2016. Okay. And you understood that that's what the Ukrainians interpreted references to investigations to be related to Burisma and the 2016 election. I, I don't know specifically at that time if we had talked to that specifically, Burisma 2016 with President Zelensky. That was my assumption, though, that they would have been thinking that, too. Mr. Giuliani became an inescapable presence to both Ukrainian officials and American diplomats. To the Ukrainians, Rudy Giuliani was seen as both a potential channel to President Trump and an obstacle to a productive U.S.-Ukraine relationship. A top aide to President Zelensky texts to Volker that, I feel that the key for many things is Rudy, and I'm ready to talk with him at any time. But everyone understood that Mr. Giuliani was no rogue agent. He was acting at the direction of the president. Ambassador Sondland clearly described Mr. Giuliani's role in regard to the president. Let's listen. Mr. Giuliani's requests were a quid pro quo for arranging a White House visit for President Zelensky. Mr. Giuliani demanded that Ukraine make a public statement announcing the investigations of the 2016 election, DNC server, and Burisma. Mr. Giuliani was expressing the desires of the President of the United States and we knew these investigations were important to the president. Concerned about Mr. Giuliani's influence began to grow. On July 10th, at a meeting between Ambassador Taylor and two Ukrainian officials in Kyiv, Ukrainian officials said they were very concerned because Mr. Giuliani had told the corrupt Prosecutor General Lysenko that President Trump would not meet with the Ukrainian leader. Back in Washington, two important encounters at the White House further revealed the existence of a corrupt quid pro quo. Ambassador Sondland first broached the investigation in a meeting in Ambassador Bolton's office with Bolton's Ukrainian counterpart and President Zelensky's top aide. Also present were Secretary Perry, Ambassador Volker, and NSC officials Dr. Hill and Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. Toward the end of the meeting, the Ukrainians raised the topic of an Oval Office meeting between President Trump and President Zelensky. Ambassador Bolton started to respond when Ambassador Sondland interjected and raised the demands of the investigation. Here is how Lieutenant Colonel Vindman recalled the conversation. To the best of my recollection, Ambassador Sondland said that in order to get a White House meeting, the Ukrainians would have to provide a deliverable, which is investigations, specific investigations. And Ambassador Volker separately confirmed this recollection during his testimony. I participated in the July 10th meeting between National Security Advisor Bolton and then Ukrainian Chairman of the National Security and Defense Council, Alex Daniliuk. As I remember, the meeting was essentially over when Ambassador Sondland made a general comment about investigations. I think all of us thought it was inappropriate. Ambassador Bolton also found Ambassador Sondland's reference to be inappropriate, and he abruptly ended the meeting. However, Ambassador Sondland was not deterred. He convened a second meeting where he discussed what needed to happen before an Oval Office meeting. Apparently, Ambassador Sondland had received his marching orders from the President, and he was determined to carry them out. Bolton sent Dr. Hill to join that meeting and report back. And this is what Dr. Hill 
had to say. And so when I came in, uh, Gordon Sondland uh, was basically saying, well, look, we have a deal here that there will be a meeting. I have a deal here with, uh, with uh, Chief of Staff Mulvaney. There will be a meeting if the Ukrainians open up or announce these investigations and, uh, into 2016 in Burisma. And I cut it off immediately there. Because by this point, having heard Mr. Giuliani over and over again on the television and all of the issues uh, that he was um, asserting, by this point, it was clear that Burisma was code for the Bidens because Giuliani was laying it out there. After the meeting, Dr. Hill followed up with Ambassador Bolton and relayed what transpired. Bolton was alarmed. In other words, Ambassador Bolton didn't want any part of it. He directed Dr. Hill to brief the NSC's top attorney, John Eisenberg, as she explained during her hearing. What was that specific asking, instruction? The specific instruction was that I had to go to the lawyers, to John Eisenberg, uh, our senior counsel for the National Security Council, uh, to basically say, you tell Eisenberg, Ambassador Bolton told me, that I am not part of uh, this whatever drug deal that Mulvaney and Sondland are cooking up. What did you understand him to mean by the drug deal that Mulvaney and Sondland were cooking up? I took it to mean investigations for a meeting. Did you go speak to the lawyers? I certainly did. Senators, as a former chief of police, I think it's quite interesting that Ambassador Bolton categorized the corrupt scheme, the pressure campaign, as a, quote, drug deal. I think that Ambassador Bolton was trying to send, send us a very powerful message, a message that not only would the lawyers, the top lawyer, understand, but that every person would understand. Every member of the House, every member of the Senate, every member of our great country, every citizen. And Ambassador Bolton also wanted to make clear, especially to the top attorney, that he did not want to have anything to do with a drug deal in progress. But we do know, we know now, of course, that Ambassador Bolton can testify directly about this. He can testify directly for himself about this meeting if he appears before this body, as he has indicated that he is prepared to do if this body is willing to issue a subpoena. We need to hear from Ambassador Bolton, and I know the American people want to hear from Ambassador Bolton as well. Dr. Hill testified that she spoke to Mr. Eisenberg twice. Dr. Hill also indicated that Mr. Eisenberg took notes of their meeting, which we, to no surprise now, do not have, we have not received because of the president's obstruction. It's clear Ambassador Sondland was not operating a rogue operation. He testified that everyone, everyone was in the loop. Let's listen once again. Everyone was in the loop. It was no secret. Everyone was informed via email on July 19th, days before the presidential call. As I communicated to the team, I told President Zelensky in advance that assurances to run a fully transparent investigation and turn over every stone were necessary in his call with President Trump. In the email referenced, Ambassador Sondland wrote the following to Secretary Pompeo, Secretary Perry, and Mr. Mulvaney regarding President Zelensky. He is prepared to receive POTUS's call. We'll assure him that he intends to run a fully transparent investigation. 
and will turn over every stone. Both Mulvaney and Perry responded to the email noting that the head of state call would be scheduled right away. Now you may be asking, what did Mulvaney know about these investigations? And did he have any conversations with President Trump about them? Senators, this body is entitled to see all of the evidence. And you know what? The American people are entitled to hear all of the evidence. And while the nature of the drug deal we've talked about was uncontested, it is important for the country to know that everyone was involved because we've heard it, everyone was in the loop. Now, later that day, July 19th, Ambassador Sondland texted Ambassadors Volker and Taylor about the upcoming head of state telephone call. And the text said, looks like POTUS called tomorrow. I spoke directly to Zelensky and gave him a full briefing. He's got it. Ambassador Volker replied to Sondland's text, most important is for Zelensky to say that he will help investigations. The evidence shows that the Ukrainians understood what they needed to do to earn a White House meeting with the president. On July 20th, the day after Ambassador Sondland's phone call with President Zelensky, Ambassador Taylor spoke with the Ukrainian National Security Advisor. Ukraine's National Security Advisor conveyed that the Ukrainian president did not want to become an instrument in U.S. politics. Here is how Ambassador Taylor explained that concern. What did you understand it to mean when that Zelensky had concerns about being an instrument in Washington domestic reelection politics? Mr. Donnelly understood uh, that these investigations um, were pursuant to uh, Mr. Giuliani's request to develop information, to find information uh, about Burisma and the Bidens. This was very well known. Uh, in public, um, Mr. Giuliano had made this point clear in several uh, instances in the beginning, in, in the, in the uh, springtime, um, and Mr. Donaluk was aware that that was a problem. And would you agree that because President Zelensky is worried about this, they understood at least that there was some pressure for them to pursue these investigations? Is that fair? Mr. Donaluk indicated um, that President Zelensky certainly understood it, that he did not want to get involved in uh, these type of activities. The next day, Ambassador Taylor relayed the Ukrainian leaders' concerns to Volker and Sondland. But Ambassador Sondland did not back down. Specifically, Ambassador Sondland texted in response to Ambassador Taylor's worry. Absolutely. But we need to get the conversation started and the relationship built, irrespective of the pretext. Again, Ambassador Sondland had his marching orders, and he was determined to carry them out. A call between President Trump and President Zelensky was scheduled for July 25th. Before the call, President Trump spoke to Sondland and reiterated his expectation that the Ukrainian leader would commit to the investigations. Ambassador Sondland subsequently contacted Ambassadors Volker and relayed the message to him. Volker then text Zelensky's top aide with President Trump's instructions. Assuming President Z convinces Trump he will investigate, 
get to the bottom of what happened in 2016, we will nail down the date for a visit to Washington. Senators, in other words, even before the July 25th phone call with President Zelensky, before it ever took place, Ukraine understood what it needed to initiate, that it needed to initiate the investigations into the debunked conspiracy theory about the 2016 election as a condition for President Zelensky, the newly elected Ukrainian president, to visit the White House. Ambassador Sondland testified that acting on President Trump's direct orders. He and Ambassador Volker prepped President Zelensky for the telephone call. And you would agree that the message in this that is expressed here is that President Zelensky needs to convince Trump that he will do the investigations in order to nail down the date for a visit to Washington, D.C. Is that correct? That's correct. By this time, nonpartisan career officials involved with Ukraine policy had become aware of this quid pro quo. Here is what three of them said during their testimony. Ambassador Taylor, the meeting President Zelensky wanted was conditioned on investigations of Burisma and alleged Ukrainian influence in the 2016 elections. Ambassador David Holmes, it was made clear that some action on a Burisma Biden investigation was a precondition for an Oval Office visit. Dr. Hill, there seems to be an awful lot of people involved. You know, basically turning a White House meeting into some kind of asset that was dangled out to the Ukrainian government. A White House visit, a visit to the Oval Office dangled out to the Ukrainian government. Senators, I ask you to think about those words as we decide, as you decide, what action you will take. Think about those words. There was no doubt the direction came from the President of the United States. The President was the center of this scheme. Ambassador Sondland testified that Mr. Giuliani was expressing the desires of the President of the United States, and we knew these investigations were important to the President. Ambassador Sondland added that Mr. Giuliani followed the direction of the President, and we followed the President's orders. However, as Ambassador Taylor testified, Ambassador Bolton was not interested in having did not want to have the call because he thought it was going to be a disaster. He thought that there could be some talk of investigations or even worse than that. He thought, what was Ambassador, I, I, I ask you today, Senators, what was Ambassador Bolton so afraid that President Trump would say to the newly elected Ukrainian president, what was the national security advisor so afraid that President Trump would say to President Zelensky? And this is another topic we'd like to ask Ambassador Bolton about if and when he appears before this body.
Mr. Chief Justice, distinguished members of the Senate, uh, I thank you once again for your indulgence and for your courtesy as we all undertake our solemn constitutional responsibilities during this Senate trial. George Washington once observed in his farewell address to the nation that the Constitution is sacredly obligatory upon all. That means everyone. And in fact, that is what makes our great country so distinct from authoritarian regimes and enemies of democracy. Vladimir Putin is above the law in Russia. Erdogan is above the law in Turkey. Kim Jong-un is above the law in North Korea. But in the United States of America, no one is above the law, not even the President of the United States. That is what this moment is all about. As we all know, Congress is a separate and co-equal branch of government. We don't work for this president or any president. We, of course, work for the American people. We have a constitutional responsibility to serve as a check and balance on an out-of-control executive branch. That is not the Democratic Party playbook. That is not the Republican Party playbook. That is the playbook in a democratic republic. James Madison once observed in Federalist 51 that the Congress should serve as a rival to the executive branch. In my humble opinion, why would Madison use the word rival? It's because the framers of the Constitution, I think, did not want a king. They did not want a dictator. They did not want a monarch. They wanted a democracy. The Constitution is sacredly obligatory upon all. It is through that lens that we proceed today. For the next few moments, I would like to discuss President Trump's July 25th phone call with Ukraine's newly elected leader. The president claims that his call was perfect. Nothing can be further from the truth. The call is direct evidence of President Trump's solicitation of foreign interference in the 2020 election as part of a corrupt scheme. It is important, of course, to remember the context of this call. The new Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, was in a vulnerable position and viewed American and diplomatic military support as critical to his standing and to Ukraine's fragile future as a democracy. Equally significant, as outlined by my colleagues, America has a strong national security interest in supporting Ukraine against Russia's continued aggression. William Taylor, West Point graduate, Vietnam War hero, ambassador to Ukraine, appointed by Donald Trump, testified, Ukraine is a strategic partner of the United States, important for the security of our country as well as Europe. Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, National Security Council officer, Trump appointee, Purple Heart recipient, Iraq War veteran, testified a strong and independent Ukraine is critical to our national security interests. Ukraine remains under attack by Russian-backed separatists in Crimea. It is an ongoing hot war. Ukraine is a friend, Russia is a foe. 
Ukraine is a democracy. Russia is a dictatorship. The United States may very well be one of the only things standing between Russia and Ukraine being completely overrun. As part of Vladimir Putin's continued aggression against the free world. That is why this Congress allocated $391 million in military and security aid to a vulnerable Ukraine on a bipartisan basis, because it is in America's national security interests. On the July 25th call, Mr. Trump could have endeavored to strengthen the relationship with this new Ukrainian leader. Instead, President Trump focused on securing a personal favor. He wanted Ukraine to conduct phony investigations designed to enhance his political standing and solicit foreign interference in the 2020 election. On a July 25th call, President Trump maligned a highly respected American ambassador known as an anti-corruption crusader. At the same time, he praised a corrupt former Ukrainian prosecutor. And on multiple occasions, President Trump directed Ukraine's new leader to speak with his personal lawyer, Rudolph Giuliani, on an official call. Mr. Giuliani is not a member of the Trump administration. For these and other reasons, the July 25th call warrants our close scrutiny. It presents significant and shocking evidence of President Trump's corrupt intent. The call lays bare the president's willingness to do whatever it takes to get what he wants, even if his behavior undermines the national security interests of the United States of America. At the beginning of the call, President Zelensky mentioned U.S. military aid, and he states, I would also like to thank you for your great support in the area of defense. The great support in the area of defense includes the security assistance passed by this Congress on a bipartisan basis that Donald Trump held up in violation of the law. Immediately after President Zelensky raised the issue of defense support, President Trump responded, I would like you to do us a favor, though. These words will live in infamy. First, President Trump said to President Zelensky, as part of the two demands that he requested, I would like you to find out what happened with this whole situation in Ukraine. They say crowd strike. I guess you have one of your wealthy people, the server, they say, Ukraine has it. President Trump continued, I would like to have the Attorney General call you or your people, and I would like you to get to the bottom of it. As you saw yesterday, that whole nonsense ended with a very poor performance by a man named Robert Mueller, a Vietnam War hero, by the way. A very poor performance by a man named Robert Mueller, an incompetent performance. But they say a lot of it started with Ukraine. Whatever you can do, it's a very important that you do it if that's possible. Who is the they referred to by President Trump putting forth the baseless conspiracy theory that the Ukrainians, not the Russians, were behind the hack of the Democratic National Committee server in 2016? They means Russia. They means Putin. They 
are enemies of the United States. Not a single witness who testified before the House knew of any factual basis for President Trump's belief in the crowd strike Ukraine fairy tale. To the contrary, the U.S. intelligence community and this Senate Intelligence Committee assessed that Russia interfered in the 2016 election. As Dr. Fiona Hill testified, the theory that Ukraine interfered in the 2016 election is, quote, a fictional narrative that has been perpetrated and propagated by the Russian security services. The conspiracy theory that President Trump advanced on the July 25th phone call is stone cold Russian propaganda. As early as February 2017, Vladimir Putin began to promote this lie during a press conference saying, quote, the Ukrainian government adopted a unilateral position in favor of one candidate. More than that, certain oligarchs, certainly with the approval of the political leadership, funded this candidate or female candidate, to be precise. Those are the words of Vladimir Putin, a script apparently adopted by President Donald John Trump. If there was any doubt about who benefits from this unfounded, Russian-inspired conspiracy theory advanced by Donald Trump, Vladimir Putin made it clear when he said in November of 2019, thank God no one is accusing us anymore of interfering in U.S. elections. Now they're accusing Ukrainians. Unfortunately, this is not the first time President Trump tried to capitalize on Russian propaganda and misinformation for his own political benefit. On July 24th, just one day before this call, Special Counsel Robert Mueller testified before Congress that the Russian government interfered in the 2016 election in sweeping and systematic fashion in order to support the Trump campaign and divide America. Mr. Mueller also found that the Trump campaign welcomed Russian interference in the 2016 election and utilized it as part of its campaign messaging. Despite the clear and overwhelming conclusion of U.S. intelligence agencies, as well as the distinguished Senate Intelligence Committee, that Russia, not Ukraine, interfered in the 2016 election, President Trump continued to press the new Ukrainian leader to announce an investigation into the crowd strike Ukraine conspiracy theory. Why? President Trump sought a political favor. That's why. As part of a scheme to solicit foreign interference in the 2020 election. The second demand made by President Trump on the July 25th call related to the campaign of Vice President Joe Biden, who announced his intention to run for the office of the presidency last April. Throughout the spring and early summer of last year, public polling consistently showed that Biden would decisively defeat President Trump. In fact, on June 16th of last year, June 16th, a Fox News poll showed that President Trump would lose to Joe Biden by 10 points. The concern with Joe Biden's candidacy provides motive 
for President Trump's demand that the Ukrainian government investigate the former vice president and his son, Hunter. Here is what President Trump said on that call. The other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution. And a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the attorney general would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution. So if you can look in to it, it sounds horrible to me. Now, the Trump administration officials who participated in the impeachment inquiry unanimously testified that there was no factual support for the allegation that Vice President Biden did anything wrong or misused his authority when he pressed for the removal of Ukraine's corrupt former prosecutor general. Joe Biden did nothing wrong. The witnesses testified that Vice President Biden was, in fact, carrying out official U.S. policy to clean up the prosecutor general's office in Ukraine. This policy, of course, aligned with the perspective of many in this very distinguished body, as well as our European allies throughout the world, as well as the International Monetary Fund. Vice President Biden did not remove Yuri Lutsenko, the corrupt, corrupt prosecutor. The Ukrainian government did, with the support of the free world. Nonetheless, on October 3, 2019, when a reporter asked President Trump, what exactly did you hope Zelensky would do about the Bidens after your phone call, President Trump responded as follows. Well, I would think that if they were honest about it, they'd start a major investigation into the Biden. It's a very simple answer. Start a major investigation into the Bidens. The evidence of wrongdoing by President Trump is hiding in plain sight. During the July 25th call, President Trump also repeatedly pressed the Ukrainian president to coordinate with his personal attorney, Rudolph Giuliani. Why was Rudolph Giuliani's name mentioned multiple times during the July 25th phone call? Giuliani is not the Secretary of State. He's not an ambassador. He's not a member of the diplomatic corps. Rudolph Giuliani is a cold-blooded political operative for President Trump's re-election campaign. That is why he was referenced multiple times on that July 25th phone call. And it is evidence of corrupt intent by President Trump. By the time the call took place, President Zelensky understood Giuliani's connection to the shakedown scheme. He recognized Giuliani's role as the president's political operative, as matters related to Ukraine. Zelensky informed President Trump that one of his aides spoke with Mr. Giuliani just recently and we are hoping very much that Mr. Giuliani will be able to travel to Ukraine and we will meet once he comes. The Ukrainian leader knew Giuliani represented President Trump's political interest 
in his country and could help unlock the long sought after Oval Office meeting that President Zelensky desired. The phony investigation sought by President Trump on the July 25th call were not designed to bolster the national security interests of the United States of America. Quite the contrary, President Trump sought to benefit himself and his own reelection prospects. On a July 25th call, President Trump also suggested that President Zelensky speak with the Attorney General, William Barr, about the two fake investigations that the President sought. This is important to keep in mind. At no time during this entire sordid scheme was there an ongoing American law enforcement investigation into the phony slander related to Joe Biden or the conspiracy theory related to Ukrainian interference in the 2016 election. At no time was there an ongoing American law enforcement investigation. America is the leader of the free world. We do not urge other sovereign countries to target American citizens, absent any legitimate basis whatsoever, absent any scintilla of evidence. Apparently, President Trump does not play by those rules. During the July 25th call, President Trump didn't raise legitimate corruption concerns as it relates to Ukraine. President Trump did not mention the word corruption once. The president did, however, viciously malign former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine, Marie Yovanovitch, a distinguished anti-corruption advocate whom he abruptly removed because she was seen as an obstacle to his geopolitical shakedown. Ambassador Yovanovitch joined the diplomatic corps under President Ronald Reagan and subsequently served three other Republican presidents. She is a highly respected diplomat and foreign service professional. Yet, President Trump told the new Ukrainian leader, the former ambassador from the United States, the woman, was bad news. And the people she was dealing with in the Ukraine were bad news. So I just want to let you know that. He didn't stop there. Later in the call, President Trump ominously added, well, she's going to go through some things. These are the words of the President of the United States of America. Ambassador Yovanovitch did not know of President Trump's disparaging remarks at the time. She didn't learn of them until the call record became public in September. Asked whether she felt threatened by President Trump's statement that she was going to go through some things. Ambassador Yovanovitch answered that she did. Here is what she said. The next excerpt, when the pre president references you, <clears throat> was a short one. But he said, well, she's going to go through some things. What did you think when President Trump told President Zelensky and you read that you were going to go through some things? I didn't know what to think, um, but I was very concerned. What were you concerned about? She's going to go through some things. It didn't sound good. It sounded like a threat. Did you feel threatened? I did. During that same call, 
President Trump also took the opportunity to praise Yuri Lonsenko. Mr. Lonsenko is the former Ukrainian prosecutor general who was widely regarded by the entire free world, including our European allies and the International Monetary Fund, to be corrupt and incompetent. But Donald John Trump, our president, praised him on that call. He told President Zelensky, quote, I heard you had a prosecutor who was very good, and he was shut down, and that's really unfair. A lot of people are talking about that, the way they shut your very good prosecutor down. And you had some very bad people involved. Think about this contrast. The president bashed a career American diplomat, an anti-corruption champion, who he unceremoniously removed because she was viewed as an obstacle to his efforts to solicit foreign interference in the 2020 election, and at the same time, praise someone who we thought could be an asset a corrupt Ukrainian prosecutor who the free world viewed as an obstacle to the rule of law. The idea that President Trump cares about corruption is laughable. It's laughable. Plain reading of the rough transcript of the July 25th call also sheds light on the quid pro quo involving the Oval Office meeting that had been sought. President Zelensky said on the call, I also wanted to thank you for your invitation to visit the United States, specifically Washington, D.C. On the other hand, I also wanted to ensure that we will be very serious about the case and will work on the investigation. As all of you know, here in this distinguished body, quid pro quo is a Latin term. It means this for that. Statement that I just read shows that President Zelensky fully understood at the time of this July 25th call that if he yielded to President Trump's demand for phony investigations, he would get the White House meeting in the Oval Office that he desperately sought. This for that. President Trump has repeatedly insisted that his July 25th conversation with President Zelensky was a perfect call. His staff at the White House apparently believed otherwise. The press office issued a short and incomplete summary of the July 25th call. Let me Read it for your hearing. Today, President Donald J. Trump spoke by telephone with President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine to congratulate him on his recent Senate will be in order. The Sergeant in Arms will restore order in the gallery. And the scripture says, for the Lord loves justice and will not abandon his faithful ones. Official White House call readout, July 25th, 2019. Today, 
President Donald J. Trump spoke by telephone with President Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine to congratulate him on his recent election. President Trump and President Zelensky discussed ways to strengthen the relationship between the United States and Ukraine, including energy and economic cooperation. Both leaders also expressed that they look forward to the opportunity to meet. That is the official White House call readout dated July 25th, 2019. The official readout provided to the American people omitted key elements of the President's conversation. Let's review. The official readout did not mention the phony investigations requested by President Trump. The official readout did not mention the Oval Office meeting sought by President Zelensky. The official readout did not mention President Trump's elevation of a debunked conspiracy theory promoted by Vladimir Putin about 2016 election interference. The official readout did not mention President Trump's demand that Ukraine investigate his domestic political rival, Joe Biden. The official readout did not mention that President Trump maligned and threatened Ambassador Yovanovitch. And the official readout did not mention that President Trump praised a corrupt former Ukrainian prosecutor. The complete conversation, however, between President Trump and President Zelensky that we just outlined offers powerful evidence that President Trump abused his power and solicited foreign interference in the 2016 election, the 2020 election. Several members of the President's staff listening in on the call immediately grew concerned. As he sat in the White House Situation Room, listening to the conversation, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman realized that the President's demands of the Ukrainian leader were inappropriate and improper. He quickly recognized that as the President began referencing the Bidens and CrowdStrike, the call was diverging from the official National Security Council approved talking points that he helped prepare. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman, 20-year Iraq War veteran, Purple Heart recipient, and American patriot. He testified in the context of the call that due to the unequal bargaining position of the two leaders and Ukraine's dependence on the United States, the favor that President Trump sought would have been perceived by President Zelensky as a demand. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman worried that the call would undermine U.S. national security interests, and he knew immediately that he had a duty to report the contents of the call to White House lawyers. I was concerned by the call. What I heard was inappropriate, and I reported my concerns to Mr. Eisenberg. It is improper for the President of the United States to demand a foreign government investigate a U.S. citizen and a political opponent. I was also clear that if Ukraine pursued an investigation, it was, it was also clear that if Ukraine pursued an investigation into the 2016 elections, the Bidens and Burisma, it would be interpreted as a partisan play. This would undoubtedly result in Ukraine losing bipartisan support, undermining U.S. national security, and advancing Russia's strategic objectives in the region. Recounting the content of the call based on his detailed handwritten notes, Lieutenant Colonel Vindman told the lawyers that he believed it was wrong for President Trump to ask President Zelensky to investigate Vice President Biden. Other witnesses were also troubled by what they heard. 
Vice President Pence's advisor, Jennifer Williams, expressed concern that President Trump raised a domestic political matter on an official call with a foreign leader. She testified that the mention of investigations struck her as unusual and possibly political in nature. She said, I guess for me, it shed some light on possible other motives behind a security assistance hold. Timothy Morrison, a former Republican congressional staffer who replaced Dr. Fiona Hill in July of 2019, also reported the call to National Security Council lawyers. After the call, President Trump continued to push the scheme forward. On July 26, the very next day, Ambassador Sondland and Ambassador Taylor met with President Zelensky and other Ukrainian officials in Kyiv. According to David Holmes, the Ukraine-based U.S. diplomat who served as the note taker, the Ukrainian leader mentioned that President Trump had brought up some very sensitive issues during the July 25th call. Very sensitive issues. Ambassador Sondland then had a private meeting with Andre Yermark, President Zelensky's top aide. The two men insisted that the meeting be one-on-one -on -one with no note taker, perhaps due to the sensitive issues that might come up. Ambassador Sondland testified that he and President Zelensky's aide probably discussed the issue of investigations. After these key moments in Ukraine, Ambassador Sondland went to lunch with David Holmes and two other American officials. Mr. Holmes sat directly across from Ambassador Sondland, close enough to hear the details of an extraordinary telephone call between Mr. Sondland and President Trump. As Mr. Holmes relayed during his sworn testimony under oath, Ambassador Sondland pulled out his unsecured cell phone and said that he was going to call President Trump to give him an update. What happened next was shocking. While Ambassador Sondland's phone was not on speakerphone, I could hear the President's voice through the earpiece of the phone. The President's voice was loud and recognizable, and Ambassador Sondland held the phone away from his ear for a period of time, presumably because of the loud volume. I heard Ambassador Sondland greet the President and explain he was calling from Kyiv. I heard President Trump then clarify that Ambassador Sondland was in Ukraine. Ambassador Sondland replied, yes, he was in Ukraine, and went on to state that President Zelensky, quote, loves your ass. I then heard President Trump ask, so he's going to do the investigation. Ambassador Sondland replied that he's going to do it, adding that President Zelensky will do anything you ask him to do. He's going to do it. He will do anything you ask him to do. Immediately after this call with President Trump, Mr. Holmes followed up with Ambassador Sondland. After the call ended, Ambassador Sondland remarked that the President was in a bad mood as Ambassador Sondland stated, it was often the case early in the morning. I then took the opportunity to ask Ambassador Sondland for his candid impression of the President's views on Ukraine. In particular, I asked Ambassador Sondland if it was true that the President did not give a expletive about Ukraine. Ambassador Sondland agreed that the President did not give an expletive about Ukraine. I asked why not, and Ambassador Sondland stated that the President only cares about big stuff. I noted there was big stuff going on in Ukraine, like a war with Russia. And Ambassador Sondland replied that he meant big stuff that benefits the president, like the Biden investigation that Mr. Giuliani was pushing. The conversation then moved on to other topics. During the July 25th call, President Trump asked for the favor of these two phony political investigations immediately after the Ukrainian president brought up defense assistance for Ukraine. And the following day, Ambassador Sondland confirmed to President Trump that Ukraine would indeed 
initiate the investigations discussed on the call, which was the only thing President cared about with respect to Ukraine. He didn't care that Russia was forcefully occupying eastern Ukraine. President Trump didn't care that thousands of Ukrainians apparently have died fighting for their democracy. He didn't seem to care that supporting Ukraine bolsters America's national security. But he cared about himself as it relates to the prospects of his reelection in 2020. In November, President Trump denied that he spoke to Ambassador Sondland on July 26, telling reporters, I know nothing about that. But in his public testimony, Ambassador Sondland contradicted that assertion with official records he obtained from the White House. Ambassador Sondland further explained that Holmes' testimony refreshed his reelection about the July 26 call, which Ambassador Sondland had not originally described when he first appeared at a deposition before the House. Also, on July 26, shortly after our Kiev meetings, I spoke by phone with President Trump. The White House, which has finally, finally shared certain call dates and times with my attorneys, confirms this. The call lasted five minutes. I remember I was at a restaurant in Kiev, and I have no reason to doubt that this conversation included the subject of investigations. Again, given Mr. Giuliani's demand that President Zelensky make a public statement about investigations, I knew that investigations were important to President Trump. President Trump said that his July 25th conversation was a perfect call. It was far from perfect. In a perfect call, the president would not demand a political favor from a vulnerable Ukraine, Ukraine under attack by a Russian foe. In a perfect call, the president would not demand that a foreign leader investigate a Russian-inspired conspiracy about the 2016 election. In a perfect call, the president would not pressure a foreign government to target an American citizen for political personal gain. In a perfect call, the president would not solicit foreign interference in the 2020 election. In a perfect call, the president would not threaten the well-being of a highly respected American ambassador and say that she was going to go through some things. In a perfect call, the president would not praise a disgraced former prosecutor who the free world viewed as corrupt and incompetent. And in a perfect call, the president would not have directed a foreign leader to follow up with Rudolph Giuliani, a human hand grenade. This was not a perfect call. It is direct evidence that President Donald John Trump corruptly abused his power and solicited foreign interference in the 2020 election. The majority leader is recognized. Uh, Mr. Chief Justice, colleagues, we'll now take a 30-minute break for dinner and reconvene at uh, five minutes after seven. So I ask consent the Senate stand in recess until that time. Without objection, so ordered.
Mr. Schiff. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Um, just so senators have an idea of the evening, um, we expect to go about two to two and a half hours. Uh, I'll make a presentation. Uh, Representative Lofgren from California will make a presentation. I'll make a final presentation. Uh, and then we will be done for the evening. Uh, as an encouraging voice told me, keep it up, but don't keep it up too long. Um, so we will do our best not to keep it up too long. Um, I'm going to turn now to the part of the chronology that picks up right after that July 25th call uh, and walk through the increasingly explicit pressure campaign waged on Ukraine in order to get President Trump's deliverable, the investigations meant to tarnish his opponent and help his reelection. Now remember, by the end of July, Ukraine was aware of President Trump's requests for investigation to help his political efforts and had come to know that President Trump put a freeze on security assistance. So this is by the end of July. They also clearly understood that President Trump was withholding an Oval Office meeting until those investigations were announced. Both were very critical to Ukraine as a sign of U.S. support and as a matter of their national security. And their national security, of course, implicates our national security. In the weeks after the July 25th call, President Trump's hand-picked representatives escalated their efforts to get the public announcement of the investigations from Ukraine. So let's go through this step by step because the three weeks following the July 25th call tell so much about this pressure scheme. Let's start with July 26th. On July 26th, so this is the day after the call, Ambassador Volker sends a text message to Giuliani. And that text message says, Hi, Mr. Mayor. You may have heard the president had a great call with Ukrainian president yesterday. Exactly the right messages as we discussed. Please send dates when you will be in Madrid. I am seeing Yermak tomorrow morning. He will come to you in Madrid. Thanks for your help, Kurt. So, here we are the day after that call. Uh, as my colleague uh, demonstrates uh, this same day, so July 26, so the date of that second infamous call between President Trump this time and Gordon Sondland that you heard the diplomat uh, David Holmes describe. So that's same day, July 26, that we're talking about right now where there's this text message. Now, of course, in that July 25th call, the president wants to connect Rudy Giuliani with the president of Ukraine and his people. And so this is a follow-up where Ambassador Volker is saying to Giuliani, it was a great call with Ukraine president, exactly the right messages as we discussed. And we know, of course, those messages were the need to do this political investigation. Please send dates when you'll be in Madrid. I'm seeing Yermark tomorrow morning. He will come to you in Madrid. So here is Ambassador Volker, one of the three amigos, following up arranging this meeting between Giuliani and the Ukrainians. Giuliani replied, setting a meeting in Europe with President Zelensky's top aide for the very next week. Quote, I will arrive on August 1 and until 5, he wrote. Now remember, on July 22nd, so a few days before this and before the call, Ambassador Volker had connected Giuliani originally with the Yermak, and they agreed to meet. So this is a follow-up. You have that arrangement being made by Volker and Giuliani before the call, then you have the call, and now you have the follow-up to arrange the meeting in Madrid. And so they do meet in Madrid. Madrid. This is August 2nd. Andrei Yermak, Zelensky's top aide, flew to Madrid, meets with Rudy Giuliani, who they know represented the president's interests. Both Giuliani and Yermak walk away from this meeting in Madrid, clearly understanding that a White House meeting is linked to Zelensky's announcement of the investigations. In separate conversations with Giuliani and Yermak after this Madrid meeting, Volker said he learned that Giuliani wanted the Ukrainians to issue a statement, including specific mentions of the two investigations that the president wanted. According to Ambassador Volker's testimony, Yermak told him that his meeting with Giuliani was very good. 
and immediately added that the Ukrainians asked for a White House meeting during the week of September 16th. Yermak presses Volker on the White House meeting date, saying that he was waiting for confirmation. Maybe you know the date. And this is a recurrent theme that we've seen through the text messages and other documents, and that is the recurrent request for this meeting, the pressing for this meeting by the Ukrainians because it was so important to them. Giuliani's objective was clear to Ambassadors Volker and Sondland, who took over communications with Yermak. Here's Ambassador Sondland. I first communicated with Mr. Giuliani in early August, several months later. Mr. Giuliani emphasized that the President wanted a public statement from President Zelensky committing Ukraine to look into the corruption issues. Mr. Giuliani specifically mentioned the 2016 election, including the DNC server, and Burisma as two topics of importance to the President. Giuliani exerted significant influence in this process. In fact, when on August 4th, Yermak inquired again about the presidential meeting, Ambassador Volker turned not to the National Security Council staff or to the State Department to arrange it and follow up. He turns to Giuliani again. Volker told Yermak that he would speak with Giuliani later that day and would call the Ukrainian president's aide afterward. Volker then texts Giuliani to ask about the Madrid meeting and to set up the call that he had mentioned to Yermak. Giuliani replies that the meeting with Yermak was excellent and that he would call later. Phone records obtained by the committees show a 16-minute call on August 5th between Ambassador Volker and Giuliani. Ambassador Volker then texts Yermak, Hi, Andre. Had a good long talk with Rudy. Call anytime, Kurt. Separately, Volker told Ambassador Sondland, Giuliani was happy with that meeting, and it looks like things are turning around. A reference to Volker's hope that satisfying Giuliani would break down President Trump's reservations concerning Ukraine. But things had not turned around by the end of that first week of August, by August 7th. The aid was still on hold, and there had been no movement on setting a date for the White House meeting. Ambassador Volker then reaches out to Giuliani to try to get things moving. Ambassador Volker texts Giuliani to recommend that he report to the boss, meaning President Trump, about his meeting with Yermak in Madrid. Specifically, he wrote, this is Volker writing to Giuliani, Hi, Rudy. Hope you made it back safely. Let's meet if you're coming to D.C. and would be good if you could convey results of your meeting in Madrid to the boss so we can get a firm date for the visit. So this is Ambassador Volker following up Giuliani. Giuliani's met with the top aide to the president of Ukraine in Madrid. And he wants Giuliani to convey to the boss, to Trump, how good that meeting in Madrid was about the investigations so they can get the president of Ukraine in the door at the White House. Now, think about how unusual this is. This is the president's personal lawyer who's on this personal mission on behalf of his client to get these investigations in Ukraine. The president of Ukraine can't get in the door of the Oval Office. And who are they going to? Are they going to the Security Council? No. Or are they going to the State Department? No. They tried all that. They're going to the president's personal lawyer. Does that sound like an official policy to try to fight corruption? Why would you go outside of the normal channel to do that? You wouldn't. No, you go to your personal attorney who's on a personal mission that he admits is not foreign policy when your objective has nothing to do with policy. When your, objection, when your objective is a corrupt one. Now, what does that mean, to have a corrupt objective? Well, it means an illicit one. It means an impermissible one. It means one that furthers your own interest at the cost of the national interest. The willingness to, to break the law, like the Impoundment Control Act, by withholding aid is indicative of that corrupt purpose, the lengths the president would go, not in furtherance of U.S. policy, but against U.S. policy. Not even a difference on policy at all. The mere pursuit of personal interest, the pursuit of an illegal 
effort to get foreign interference is the very embodiment of a corrupt intent. So here we are, August 7th, and Volker is saying, Rudy, if you're coming to D.C., let's get together. It would be good if you can talk to the boss, because we can't get a meeting other way. Around that time, Ambassador Volker received a text message from Yermak, who asked him, and this is Yermak, asking Volker, Hi, Kurt, how are you? Do you have some news about the White House meeting date? And Volker responds, Not yet. I texted Rudy earlier to make sure he weighs in following your meeting. Gordon, meaning Sondland, should be speaking with the president on Friday. We are pressing this. So there is Gordon Sondland is pressing this. This is the man you've heard from already, Gordon Sondland, the man who says it was absolutely a quid pro quo. You've asked about a quid pro quo. There was a quid pro quo about this White House meeting. This is what they're talking about right here. Gordon will be speaking with the president on Friday. We are pressing this. Ambassador Volker's contact with Giuliani spurred a flurry of communications. The patterns of calls from August 8th strongly suggest Giuliani's attempting to call the White House to speak to a senior White House official, left a message, then had a four-minute call with that official later that night. We don't know from the call records who that White House official was, but recall that Giuliani has publicly stated that when he spoke to the White House, he usually spoke to President Trump, his client. Also on August 8th, Yermak texts Volker that he had some news. Ambassador Volker replies that he can talk then, and Ambassador Volker updates Giuliani in a text the next day. Volker says to Giuliani in the text, Hi, Mr. Mayor. I had a good chat with Yermak last night. He was pleased with your phone call. Mentioned, he's referring to President Zelensky here, making a statement. Can we all get on the phone to make sure I advise, and here he's referring to President Zelensky, correctly as to what he should be saying? Want to make sure we get this done right. So here, August 9th, there's an effort by Volker to make sure that they get the statement right about the investigations. Because if they can't get the statement right, he ain't going to get in the door of the Oval Office. It also makes clear who is exactly in charge of this, and that's Rudy Giuliani. Ambassador Volker is checking with Rudy Giuliani about what he should advise President Zelensky. And we know that Giuliani is taking his orders from President Trump. Text messages and call records obtained by the committee show that Ambassador Volker and Giuliani connected by phone twice around noon on August 9th for several minutes each. Following the calls with Giuliani, Ambassador Volker created a three-way group chat using WhatsApp that included himself, Ambassador Sondland, and Yermak. Ambassador Volker initiated the chat around 2.20 that day. And this is Volker chatting with Sondland and Yermak. It's a three-way chat. And Volker says, hi, Andre, meaning Yermak. We have all consulted here, including with Rudy. Could you do a call later today or tomorrow your afternoon time? And Sondland says, I have a call scheduled at 3 p.m. Eastern for the three of us. Ops will call. Call records obtained by the committee show that on August 9th, Ambassador Sondland twice connected with phone lines associated with the White House. Once in the early afternoon for about 18 minutes and once in the late afternoon for about two minutes. We know that Ambassador Sondland had direct access to President Trump. After all this activity, Ambassador Sondland and Volker thought they had a breakthrough. Finally, a breakthrough. Minutes after this call, which was likely with Tim Morrison about a possible date for the White House meeting, Ambassador Volker and Sondland discussed the agreement they believed they'd reached. And it starts with Sondland in this text message. Morrison ready to get dates as soon as Yermak confirms. Volker says, excellent. How did you sway him? Not sure I did, says Sondland. I think POTUS really wants the deliverable. Well, we know what that deliverable is. It's the political investigations. Volker says, but does he know that? And Sondland says, yep. Clearly lots of convos, meaning conversations, going on. And Volker says, okay, then that's good. It's coming from two separate sources. 
Master Sondland told the committees that the deliverable required by President Trump was a press statement from President Zelensky committing to do the investigations into the Bidens and the allegation of Ukraine election interference that President Trump mentioned on July 25th. But Tim Morrison testified that he didn't know anything about the deliverable. He was just involved in trying to schedule the White House meeting, which everyone wanted to schedule as a sign of support for President Zelensky and our ally Ukraine. But Trump's agents wouldn't just accept Ukraine's word for it. Ambassador Sondland then recommended to Ambassador Volker that Yermak share a draft, a draft of the press statement to ensure that the statement would comport with the President's expectations. So here on August 9th, so we're still less than two weeks after the July 25th call, or about, I guess we're about two weeks. Sondland says in this message, to avoid misunderstandings, might be helpful to ask Andre for a draft statement, parentheses embargoed, so that we can see exactly what they propose to cover. Even though Z, referring to Zelensky, does a live presser, they can still summarize in a brief statement. Thoughts? And Volker says, agree. At his deposition, Ambassador Sondland said that he suggested reviewing a written summary of the statement because he was concerned that President Zelensky would say whatever he would say on live television and it still wouldn't be good enough for Rudy, slash the president, unquote. Yermak, in turn, was concerned that the announcement would still not result in the coveted White House meeting. On August 10th, Yermak texted Volker attempting to schedule a White House meeting before the Ukrainian president made a public statement in support of the investigations into Burisma and the 2016 election. So you can see what's going on here. The president and his agent, Giuliani, they want this public statement of the investigations before they'll give a date. And the Ukrainians want a date before they have to commit to making public they're going to do the investigations. And so you've had this standoff where each is trying to get the deliverable first. But there's no debate about what the deliverable is on either side. There's no debate about the quid pro quo here. You give me this, I'll give you that. You give me the White House meeting, I'll give you the public announcement of the investigation into your political rival. No, no, no. You give me the announcement of the investigation into my rival, and then I'll give you the meeting. The only debate here is about which comes first. So August 10th, Yermak text Volker, I think it's possible to make this declaration and mention all these things which we discussed yesterday, but it will be logic to do after we receive a confirmation of date. We inform about data visit, about our expectations, and our guarantees for future visit. Let's discuss it. Ambassador Volker responded that he agreed, but that first they would have to iron out a statement and use that to get a date, after which President Zelensky would give the statement. The two decided to have a call the next day and to include Ambassador Sondland. Yermak texts Ambassador Volker, Excellent. Once we have a date, we will call for a press briefing announcing upcoming visit and outlining vision for the reboot of U.S.-Ukraine relationship, including, among other things, Burisma and election meddling in the investigations. Yermak was also in direct contact with Ambassador Sondland regarding this revised approach. In fact, he sent Ambassador Sondland the same text message. Ambassador Sondland kept the leadership of the State Department in the loop. On August 10th, he told Ambassador Volker that he had reported to T. Ulrich Breckbull, counselor of the Department of State, who Sondland testified frequently consulted with Secretary Pompeo. Sondland wrote to Volker, I briefed Ulrich, all good. So Ulrich is in the loop. Sondland and Volker continued to pursue the statement from Zelensky on the investigations. The next day, Ambassador Sondland emails Breck Bull and Lisa Kenna, the State Department's executive secretary, about efforts to secure a public statement and a big presser from President Zelensky. Sondland hoped it might, quote, make the boss happy enough to authorize an investigation, an invitation. After first being evasive on the topic, Secretary Pompeo has subsequently acknowledged that he listened in on the July 25th call. 
Now, since he was on the call, Pompeo must have understood what would make the boss, that is the president, happy enough to schedule a White House meeting. Again, everyone was in the loop. On August 11th, Ambassador Volcker sent Giuliani a text message. This is Volcker to Giuliani. Hi, Rudy. We have heard back from Andre again. They are writing the statement now and will send it to us. Can you talk for five minutes before noon today? And Giuliani says, yes, just call. That's August 11th. On the next day, August 12th, Yermak sent Ambassador Volker an initial version of the draft statement by text. Notably, as we saw earlier, this statement from the Ukrainians doesn't explicitly mention Burisma, Biden, or 2016. Election investigations that the president has been seeking. So you can see what's going on here now. There was this game of chicken. You go first. No, we'll go first. You give us the date, we'll give you the statement. No, you give us the statement, we'll give you the date. And now, realizing, okay, they've got to give the statement first, Ukraine tries to give them a generic statement that doesn't really go into specifics about these investigations. And why? You can imagine why. Ukrainians don't want to have to go out in public and say they're going to do these investigations. Because they're not stupid. Because they understood this would pull them right into U.S. presidential politics. Because it was intended to. Which isn't in Ukraine's interest, it's not in our interest either. And Ukraine understood that. And so they resisted. First they resisted having to do the public statement. And then they wanted to make sure they'd get the deliverable. And then when they had to make the statement, they didn't want to be specific for one thing, for another thing. This was what Zelensky campaigned on. He was going to fight corruption. He was going to end political investigations. So he didn't want to be specific. So he sends the statement that doesn't have the specific references. And Ambassador Volker explained during his testimony that was not what Giuliani was requesting and it would not satisfy Giuliani or Donald Trump. Now, presumably, if the president was interested in corruption, that statement would have been enough. But all he was interested in was an investigation or an announcement of an investigation into his rival and this debunked theory about 2016. Now, the conversation that Volcker referred to in his earlier testimony took place on the morning of August 13th, when Giuliani made clear that the specific investigations related to Burisma, Code for Biden's, and the 2016 election had to be included in order to get the White House meeting. So the Americans sent back to the Ukrainian top aide a revised draft that includes now the two investigations, and you've seen the side by side. This was then the essence of the quid pro quo regarding the meeting, and this direction came from President Trump. Here is how Ambassador Sondland put it. Mr. Giuliani's requests were a quid pro quo for arranging a White House visit for President Zelensky. Mr. Giuliani demanded that Ukraine make a public statement announcing the investigations of the 2016 election DNC server and Burisma. Mr. Giuliani was expressing the desires of the President of the United States, and we knew these investigations were important to the President. Now, according to witness testimony, as you might imagine, Ukrainian officials were very uncomfortable with the draft that Giuliani, Volker, and Sondland were negotiated. They understood that the statement was the deliverable that President Trump wanted. But yielding to President Trump's demands would, in essence, force President Zelensky to break his promise to the Ukrainian people to root out corruption, because politically motivated investigations are a hallmark of the kind of corruption that Ukraine has been plagued with in the past. Mr. Yarmuk tried to get some confirmation that the requested investigations were legitimate. In response to the draft statement, Yarmuk asks Volker, quote, whether any request had ever been made by the U.S. to investigate election interference in 2016. In other words, whether any request had made, been made by any official U.S. law enforcement agency 
through formal channels as you would expect if it were a legitimate request. Ambassador Volker tried to find a satisfactory answer. On August 15th, Volker's assistant asked Deputy Assistant Secretary George Kent whether there was any precedent for such a request for investigations. At his deposition, Kent testified that um, if you're asking me, have we ever gone to the Ukrainians and asked them to investigate or prosecute individuals for political reasons, the answer is, I hope we haven't, and we shouldn't, because that goes against everything that we are trying to promote in the post-Soviet states for the last 28 years, which is the promotion of the rule of law. The next day, we're now on August 16th. In a conversation with Ambassador Bill Taylor, the U.S. Ambassador in Kiev, and Ambassador Taylor stepped in when Ambassador Yovanovitch was pushed out, Taylor, quote, amplified the same theme and told Kent that, quote, Yermak was very uncomfortable with the idea of investigations and suggested it should be done officially and put in writing. As a result, it became clear to Kent in mid-August that Ukraine was being pressured to conduct politically motivated investigations. Kent told Ambassador Taylor, that's wrong, and we shouldn't be doing it as a matter of U.S. policy. Ambassador Volker claimed that he stopped pursuing the statement from the Ukrainians around this time because of the concerns raised by Zelensky's aide. At his deposition, and despite all of his efforts to secure a statement announcing these very specific political investigations desired by the President, Ambassador Volker testified that he agreed with the Airmock's concerns and advised him that making those specific references was not a good idea because making those statements might look like it would play into our domestic politics. Without specific references to the politically damaging investigations that Trump demanded, the agreement just wouldn't work. Ukraine did not release the statement, and in turn, the White House meeting was not scheduled. As it turns out, Ambassador Sondland and Volker did not achieve the breakthrough after all. Now let's go into what finally breaks the logjam, because that involves the military aid. With efforts to trade a White House meeting for a press statement announcing the investigations temporarily scuttled, Sondland and Volker go back to the drawing board. On August 19th, Ambassador Sondland told Volker that he drove the larger issue home with Yermak, President Zelensky's top aide, particularly that this was now bigger than a White House meeting, bigger than just a White House meeting, and was about the relationship per se. The relationship per se. Not just about the meeting anymore. It's about everything. It's about everything. By this time in late August, the hold and security assistance had been in place for more than a month, and there was still no credible explanation offered by the White House, despite some, like Ambassador Sondland, repeatedly asking. There were no interagency meetings since July 31st, and the Defense Department had withdrawn its assurances that it could even comply with the law which indeed it couldn't. Every agency in the administration opposed the hold. As the Government Accountability Office confirmed, concerned DOD and OMB officials had been right that the President's holding of the aid was an unlawful act. But President Trump was not budging. At the same time, despite the persistent efforts of numerous people, President Trump refused to schedule the coveted White House visit for President Zelensky until the investigations were announced that would benefit his campaign. Here is what Ambassador Sondland said about the hold on funds and its link to the politically motivated investigations in Ukraine. In the absence of any credible explanation for the suspension of aid, I later came to believe that the resumption of security aid would not occur until there was a public statement from Ukraine committing to the investigations of the 2016 elections and Burisma, as Mr. Giuliani had demanded. From the embassy in Kyiv, 
David Holmes reached the same conclusion, a conclusion as simple as 2 plus 2 equals 4. Mr. Holmes, you have testified that by late August you, has, you had a clear impression that the security assistance hold was somehow connected to the investigations that President Trump uh, wanted. Um, how did you conclude that, how did you make, reach that clear conclusion? Uh, sir, we've been hearing about uh, the investigation since March, uh, months before, uh, and we've been, uh, President Zelensky had received a letter, congratulatory letter from the President saying he'd be pleased to meet him uh, following his inauguration uh, in May. Um, and uh, we hadn't been able to get that meeting, and then the security hold came up um, with no explanation. Um, and I'd, I'd be surprised if any of the Ukrainians, you said earlier, we discussed earlier, you know, sophisticated people, um, when they received no explanation for why that hold was in place, they wouldn't have drawn that conclusion. Because the investigations were still being pursued? Correct. And the hold was still remaining without explanation? Correct. So this, to you, was the only logical conclusion that you could reach? Correct. Sort of like 2 plus 2 equals 4? Exactly. Sondland explained the predicament he believed he faced with a hold on aid to Ukraine. As my other State Department colleagues have testified, this security aid was critical to Ukraine's defense and should not have been delayed. I expressed this view to many during this period, but my goal at the time was to do what was necessary to get the aid released, to break the logjam. I believe that the public statement we had been discussing for weeks was essential to advancing that goal. You know, I really regret that the Ukrainians were placed in that predicament, but I do not regret doing what I could to try to break the logjam and to solve the problem. On August 22nd, Ambassador Sondland tried to break that logjam, as he put it, regarding both the security assistance hold and the White House meeting. Ambassador Sondland described those efforts in his public testimony. Let's listen to him again. In preparation for the September 1 Warsaw meeting, I asked Secretary Pompeo whether a face-to-face -face conversation between Trump and Zelensky would help to break the logjam. And this was when President Trump was still intending to travel to Warsaw. Specifically, on August 22nd, I emailed Secretary Pompeo directly, copying Secretariat Kenna. I wrote, and this is my email to Secretary Pompeo, should we block time in Warsaw for a short pull aside for POTUS to meet Zelensky? I would ask Zelensky to look him in the eye and tell him that once Ukraine's new justice folks are in place in mid-September, that Zelensky, he Zelensky, should be able to move forward publicly and with confidence on those issues of importance to POTUS in the U.S. Hopefully that will help break the logjam. The secretary replied, yes. Sondland also explained that both he and Secretary Pompeo understood that issues of importance to the president were the two sham investigations the president wanted to help his reelection efforts. And that reference to the logjam meant both the security assistance and the White House meeting. At the end of August, National Security Advisor John Bolton arrived in Ukraine for an official visit. David Holmes took notes in Ambassador Bolton's meetings and testified about Ambassador Bolton's message to the Ukrainians. Shortly thereafter, on August 27th, Ambassador, Vol Ambassador Bolton visited Ukraine and brought welcome news that President Trump had agreed to meet President Zelensky on September 1st in Warsaw. Ambassador Bolton further indicated that the hold on security assistance would not be lifted prior to the Warsaw meeting, where it would hang on whether President Zelensky was able to, quote, favorably impress President Trump. Well, let's think about that for a minute. I took. Unless you have something further to say. Um, let's think about that for a minute. 
Bolton further indicated that the hold on security assistance would not be lifted prior to the Warsaw meeting, where it would hang on whether President Zelensky was able to favorably impress President Trump. Well, what do you think would favorably impress President Trump? What were the only two things that President Trump asked of President Zelensky? What were the two things that Rudy Giuliani was asking of President Zelensky and his top aides? What would favorably impress Donald Trump? Would Donald Trump be favorably impressed if President Zelensky were to tell him about this new corruption court or new legislation in the RADA or how negotiations with the Russians were going or how they're bringing about defense reform. Had any of those things ever come up in any of these text messages, any of these emails, any of these phone calls, any of these conversations? Of course not. Of course not. There was only one thing that was going to favorably impress President Trump in Warsaw, and that is if Zelensky told him to his face, I'm going to do these political investigations. I don't want to do them. You know I don't want to do them. I've resisted doing them. But I'm at war with Russia, and I can't wait anymore. I can't wait anymore. I'm sure that would have impressed Donald Trump. But the meeting between the, between the two presidents never happened in Warsaw. President Trump canceled the trip at the last moment. Before Bolton left Kiev, Ambassador Taylor asked for a private meeting. Ambassador Taylor explained that he was extremely concerned about the hold on security assistance. He described the meeting to us during his testimony. Near the end of Ambassador Bolton's visit, I asked to meet him privately, during which I expressed to him, my serious concern about the withholding of military assistance to Ukraine while the Ukrainians were defending their country from Russian aggression. Ambassador Bolton recommended that I send a first-person cable to Secretary Pompeo directly, relaying my concerns. Now, in the State Department, sending a first-person cable is an extraordinary step. State Department, State Department cables are ordinarily written in the third person as Ambassador Taylor testified at his deposition, sending a first-person cable gets attention because there are not many first-person cables that come in. In fact, in his decades of service in the diplomatic corps, he had never written a single one until now. Taylor sent that cable on August 29th. Would you like me to read that to you right now? I would like to read it to you right now, except I don't have it because the State Department wouldn't provide it. But if you'd like me to read it to you, we can do something about that. We can insist on getting that from the State Department. If you'd like to know what John Bolton had in mind when he thought that Zelensky could favorably impress the President in Warsaw, we can find that out too, just for the asking, and a document called a subpoena. So Taylor sends that cable August 29th, the State Department did not provide that cable to us in response to the subpoena. But witnesses who reviewed it described it as a powerful message that described the folly, the folly of withholding military aid from Ukraine at a time when it was facing incursion from Russian forces in eastern Ukraine. That cable also sought to explain that U.S. assistance to Ukraine was, in, was vital to U.S. national security as well. Now, why don't they want us to see that cable? Why don't they want us to see that cable? Maybe they don't want you to see that cable because that cable from a Vietnam veteran describes just how essential that military assistance was, not to just to Ukraine. Maybe they don't want you to see that cable because it describes just how important that military assistance is to us. To us. President's Council would love you to believe this is just about Ukraine. You don't need to care about Ukraine. Who cares about Ukraine? How many people could find Ukraine on a map? Why should we care about Ukraine? Well, we should care about Ukraine. They're an ally of ours. If it matters to us, we should care about the fact that in 1994, when we asked them to give up their nuclear weapons that they had inherited from the Soviet Union, and they didn't want to give them up, and we were worried about proliferation. 
We said, hey, if you give them up, which you don't want to do because you're worried the Russians might invade, if you give them up, we will help assure your territorial integrity. We made that commitment. I hope we care about that. I hope we care about that because they did give them up. And you know what? Just what they feared took place. The Russians moved across their border, and they remain occupying part of Ukraine. That's the word of America we gave. And we're breaking that word. Why? For help with a political campaign? Ambassador Taylor was exactly right. That's crazy. It's worse than crazy. It's repulsive. It's repugnant. It breaks our word. And to do it in the name of, of these corrupt investigations is also contrary to, to everything we espouse around the world. I used to be part of a commission in the House on Democracy Assistance, where we would meet with parliamentarians. And I know my Senate colleagues do much the same thing. And we would, we would urge our colleagues to observe the rule of law, not to engage in political investigations and prosecutions. I don't know how we make that argument now. I don't know how we look our allies or these burgeoning democracies in the face, our fellow parliamentarians, and make that argument now. How do we make that argument now? Now, testimony indicated that uh, Secretary Pompeo eventually carried that cable into the White House. But there's no evidence that those national security concerns that they don't want you to see were able to outweigh the president's personal interest in his getting foreign help in his reelection campaign. There's no evidence at all. Now we get to August 28th. Politico was the first to publicly report, publicly report that President Trump had implemented a hold on nearly $400 million of U.S. military assistance to Ukraine that had been appropriated by Congress. Now that the worst-kept secret was public, Ukrainian officials immediately expressed their alarm and concern to their American counterparts. As witnesses explained, the Ukrainians had two serious concerns. One, of course, was the aid itself, which was vital to their ability to fight off Russia. But in addition, they were worried about the symbolism of the hold, that it signaled to Russia and Vladimir Putin that the United States was wavering in its support for Ukraine. Witnesses testified that this was a division that Russia could and would exploit to drive further wedge between the United States and Ukraine to its advantage. The second concern was why, likely why, Ukrainian officials had wanted the hold to remain a secret in the first place, because it would add to the negative impact to Ukraine if the hold itself became public. It was bad enough that the President of the United States put a hold on their aid. It was going to be far worse if it became public, as indeed it did. Andre Yermak, the same Zelensky aide, sent Ambassador Volker a link to the political story, Politico story, and then texted, need to talk with you. Other Ukrainian officials also expressed concerns to Ambassador Volker that the Ukrainian, Ukrainian government was being singled out and penalized for some reason. Well, what do we think that reason was? Why were they being singled out? Why was that country being singled out? That was the one country that this president could leave her for help against an opponent he feared. That's why Ukraine was being singled out. On August 29th, Yermak also contacted Ambassador Taylor. Yermak said the Ukrainians were very concerned about the hold of military assistance. He said that he and other Ukrainian officials would be willing to travel to Washington to explain to U.S. officials the importance of this assistance. Ambassador Taylor, who was on the ground in Ukraine, explained the Ukrainian viewpoint and, frankly, their desperation. In September, the Minister of Defense, for example, came to me, I would use the word desperate, to figure out why the assistance was being held. He thought that perhaps if he went to Washington to talk to you, to talk to the, to the Secretary of Defense, to talk to the President, he would be able to find out and, and reassure 
provide whatever answer was necessary to have that assistance released. Without any official explanation for the hold, American officials could provide little reassurance to their Ukrainian counterparts. It has been publicly reported that President Trump, Secretary Esper, and Secretary Pompeo met in late August and that they all implored the president to release the aid. But President Trump continued to refuse to release the aid. As of August 30th, the president was clearly directing OMB to continue the hold on security assistance. In documents reviewed by Just Security but withheld from the Congress by OMB on the president's instructions, OMB official Michael Duffy emailed DOD controller Elaine McCusker that there is, quote, clear direction from POTUS to continue the hold. So here we are, August 30th. A month after that July 25th call, aid still being withheld, Ukrainians still holding on, still not willing to capitulate, not willing to violate Zelensky's whole campaign pledge about not engaging in corrupt investigations. That same day, August 30th, Republican Senator Ron Johnson spoke with Ambassador Sondland to express his concern about President Trump's decision to withhold military assistance to Ukraine. Senator Johnson described that call in an interview with the Wall Street Journal. According to Senator Johnson, Ambassador Sondland told him that if Ukraine would commit to, quote, get to the bottom of what happened in 2016, if President Trump has that confidence, then he'll release the military spending. Senator Johnson added, at that suggestion, I winced. My reaction was, oh God, I don't want to see those two things combined. The next day, August 31st, Senator Johnson spoke by phone with President Trump regarding the decision to withhold aid to Ukraine. According to the Wall Street Journal, President Trump denied the quid pro quo that Senator Johnson had learned of from Ambassador Sondland. At the same time, however, President Trump refused to authorize Senator Johnson to tell Ukrainian officials on his upcoming trip to Kyiv that the aid would be forthcoming. The message that Ambassador Sondland communicated to Senator Johnson mirrored that used by President Trump during the July 25th call with President Zelensky, in which President Trump twice asked the Ukrainian leader to get to the bottom of it, including in connection to an investigation into the debunked conspiracy theory of Ukrainian interference in the 2016 election. It also mirrored the language of the text message that Ambassador Volker sent to President Zelensky's aide just before the July 25th call. Indeed, despite the President's self-serving denials, the message was clear. President Trump wanted the investigations, and he would withhold not one but two acts vested in him by the power of his office in order to get them. Now begins September. September 1st. The president was supposed to go to Warsaw, as we know, but he doesn't go to Warsaw. Mike Pence goes to Warsaw. Jennifer Williams, special advisor to the vice president for Europe and Russia, learned of the change in the president's travel plans on August 29th. The vice president's national security advisor asked at the request of Vice President Pence for an update on the status of the security assistance that had just been publicly revealed in Politico and would be a critical issue during the bilateral meeting between the Vice President and President Zelensky in Warsaw. The delegation arrives in Warsaw and gathers in a hotel room to brief Vice President Pence before he met with the Ukrainian President. National Security Advisor Bolton led the meeting. As Williams described it, advisors in the room quote, agreed on the need to get a final decision on security assistance as soon as possible so that it could be implemented before the end of the year. But Vice President Pence did not have authority from the president to release the aid. Ambassador Sondland also attended that briefing. At the end of it, he expressed concern directly to Vice President Pence about the security assistance being held until the Ukrainians announced the very same politically motivated investigations at the heart of the scheme. You mentioned that uh, you also had a conversation with Vice President Pence 
before his meeting with President Zelensky in Warsaw, and that you raised the concern you had as well that the security assistance was being withheld because of the President's desire to get a commitment from Zelensky to pursue these political investigations. What did you say to the Vice President? I was in a briefing uh, with several people, and I just spoke up and I said, it appears that everything is stalled until this statement gets made, something that words to that effect, uh, and that's what I believe to be the case based on, uh, you know, the work that the three of us had been doing, Volker, Perry, and myself, and the Vice President nodded like, you know, he, he heard what I said, and that was pretty much it, as I recall. Everyone was in the loop. Ambassador Sondland testified that Vice President Pence was neither surprised nor dismayed by the description of this quid pro quo. At the beginning of the bilateral meeting between President Zelensky and Vice President Pence, as expected, the first question from President Zelensky related to the status of the security assistance. As Vice President Pence's aide, Jennifer Williams, testified, President Zelensky explained that just equally with the financial and physical value of the assistance, that it was the symbolic nature of that assistance that really was the show of U.S. support for Ukraine and for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Later that day, Vice President Pence spoke to the President about his meeting with President Zelensky. But the hold on security assistance remained in place well after President Pence, Vice President Pence returned from Warsaw. And after the meeting, the Warsaw meeting with Vice President Pence, Ambassador Sondland quickly pulled aside Andrei Yermak, Zelensky's top aide, and informed him that the aide would not be forthcoming until Ukraine publicly announced the two investigations that President Trump wanted. So here we are, after the meeting, right after the meeting, they're still in Warsaw, and Zelensky pulls aside his Ukrainian counterpart, Yermak, and explains the aid is not coming until the investigations are announced. Based on my previous communication with Secretary Pompeo, I felt comfortable sharing my concerns with Mr. Yermak. It was a very, very brief pull-aside conversation that happened within a few seconds. I told Mr. Yermak that I believed that the resumption of U.S. aid would likely not occur until Ukraine took some kind of action on the public statement that we had been discussing for many weeks. I mean, let's let that sink in for a minute, too. You've heard uh, my colleagues at the other table say, Ukrainians felt no pressure. There's no evidence they felt any pressure. Of course, we've already had testimony about how they did feel pressure and they didn't want to be drawn into this political campaign. And you saw over and over in these text messages and emails, no, you go first, you announce, no, you go first. And we're supposed to believe they felt no pressure. And there it is, it breaks out in the open. The military is being, aid is being withheld. And there's a connection between the holding of the military aid and these investigations. And the first thing they're asking about, they send the copy of the article, what's happening with this aid? They're ready to come to D.C. to plead for the aid. They go to Warsaw. They meet with the vice president. It's the first question is the aid. And what happens after that meeting? Now, that's a big meeting, by the way, with the vice president, the Ukrainian delegation. It's not like in front of all those people, the vice president is going to bring it up. And so Sondland goes up to his counterpart right after that on the sidelines of that meeting, and he says, basically, you ain't getting the money until you do the investigations. And we're to believe they felt no pressure. Folks, they're at war. They're at war and they're being told you're not getting $400 million in aid you need unless you do what the president wants. And what the president wants are these two investigations. If you don't believe that's pressure, that's $400 million worth of pressure. I've got a bridge I want to sell you. And it's hard for us to put ourselves in the Ukrainians' position. I mean, imagine the eastern third of our country were occupied by an enemy force. And we're beholden to another country for military aid. 
and they're saying you're not going to get it until you do what we want, do you think we'd feel pressured? I think we'd feel pressured. And that's exactly the situation the Ukrainians were in now. You've heard my counsel, the other counsel say before, well, but they say they don't feel pressure. Like they're going to admit they were being shaken down by the President of the United States. You think they feel pressure now? You should see what kind of pressure they feel if they admitted that. Tim Morrison, the NSC official, witnessed the conversation between Sondland and Yermak from across the room and immediately thereafter received a summary from Ambassador Sondland. He reported the substance of that conversation to his boss, Ambassador, Ambassador Bolton, who told Morrison to consult with the lawyers. Go talk to the lawyers. You know, if, if you keep getting told you got to go talk to the lawyers, there's a problem. If things are perfect, you don't get told, go talk to the lawyers time and time again. Morrison confirmed that he did talk to the lawyers, in part to ensure there was a record of what Ambassador Sondland was doing. That record exists within the White House. Would you like me to read you that record? I'd be happy to read you that record. It's, it's there for your asking. Of course, the President has refused to provide that record. Precisely why did Ambassador Bolton direct Morrison to tell the lawyers, to talk to the lawyers? Would you like Ambassador Bolton to tell you why he said that? He'd be happy to tell you why he said that. He's there for your asking. What did Bolton know about the freeze and aid prior to this meeting in Warsaw? What, what did he mean that if he can press Zelensky, it's going to depend on whether he can press Zelensky? Would you like to know what that meant? I'd like to know what he meant by that. I think we know what he meant by that. Tim Morrison also conveyed the substance of the Sondland Yermak pull aside to his colleague, Ambassador Taylor. So this is now Tim Morrison, told by Bolton, go talk to the lawyers, and he talks to also Ambassador Taylor, our ambassador in Ukraine. On the evening of September 1st, I received a readout of the Pence Zelensky meeting over the phone from Mr. Morrison, during which he told me that President Zelensky had opened the meeting by immediately asking Vice President about the security cooperation. The Vice President did not respond substantively, but said that he would talk to President Trump that night. The Vice President did say that President Trump wanted the Europeans to do more to support Ukraine and that he wanted the Ukrainians to do more to fight corruption. During the same phone call with Mr. Morrison, he described a conversation Ambassador Sondland had with Mr. Yermak in Warsaw. Ambassador Sondland told Mr. Yermak that the security assistance money would not come until President Zelensky committed to pursue the Burisma investigation. I was alarmed by what Mr. Morrison told me about the Sondland-Yermak conversation. Ambassador Taylor then explained why he was so alarmed by this turn. Let's hear that as well. You said previously that you were alarmed to learn this. Why were you alarmed? It's one thing to try to leverage a meeting in the White House. It's another thing, I thought, um, to leverage security assistance, security assistance to a country at war, um, dependent on both the security assistance and the demonstration of support. It was, it was much more alarming. The, the, the White House meeting was one thing, security assistance was much more alarming. Upon learning from Mr. Morrison that the military aid may be conditioned on Ukraine publicly announcing these two investigations, Ambassador Taylor sends an urgent text message to Ambassador Sondland asking, are we now saying that security assistance and White House meeting are conditioned on investigations? And the response by Ambassador Sondland, call me. Well, you know what that means, right? You get a text message that's putting it in black and white. Are we saying security assistance and the White House meeting are conditioned on investigations? 
Call me. In other words, don't put this in writing. Call me. Ambassador Taylor did, in fact, call Sondland. Informed by notes he took at the time of the call, he summarized that conversation as follows. During that phone call, Ambassador Sondland told me that President Trump had told him that he wants President Zelensky to state publicly that Ukraine will investigate Burisma and alleged Ukrainian interference in the 2016 election. Ambassador Sondland also told me that he now recognized that he had made a mistake by earlier telling Ukrainian officials that only a White House meeting with President Zelensky was dependent on a public announcement of the investigations. In fact, Ambassador Sondland said, everything was dependent on such an announcement, including security assistance. He said that President Trump wanted President Zelensky in a public box by making a public statement about ordering such investigations. Ambassador Taylor testified that his contemporaneous notes of the call reflect that Sondland used the phrase public box to describe President Trump's desire to ensure that the initiation of his desired investigations was announced publicly. A private commitment was not good enough. The State Department has Ambassador Taylor's extensive notes, and of course, we would like to show them to you to corroborate his testimony. But pursuant to the President's instructions, the State Department will not turn them over. You might recall from the tape yesterday, Ambassador Taylor said, they'll be shortly coming, I'm told. Well, somebody countermanded that instructions. Who do we think that was? But you should see them. If you have any question about what Sondland told Ambassador Taylor, if, if the President's counsel tries to create any confusion about what Sondland told Taylor about his conversation with the President, and look, Sondland had one recollection in his deposition and another recollection in the first hearing and another recollection in the declaration. You want to know exactly what happened in that conversation when it was fresh in Sondland's mind and he told Taylor about it and Taylor wrote it in its notes, you're going to want Taylor's notes. In any courtroom in America holding a fair trial, you would want to see contemporaneous notes. This Senate should be no different. Demand those notes. Demand to see the truth. We're not afraid of those notes. We haven't seen them. We haven't seen them. Maybe those notes say something completely different. Maybe those notes say no quid pro quo. Maybe those notes say it's a perfect call. I'd like to see them. I'm willing to trust Ambassador Taylor's testimony and his recollection. I'd like to see them. I'd like to show them to you. They're yours for the asking. On September 25th, the Washington Post editorial board reported concerns that President Trump was withholding military assistance for U Ukraine and a White House meeting in order to force President Zelensky to announce investigations of Vice President Biden and purported Ukrainian interference in the U.S. election. The Post editorial board wrote, we're reliably told that the President has a second and more venal agenda. He is attempting to force Mr. Zelensky to intervene in the 2020 presidential election by launching an investigation of the leading Democratic candidate, Joe Biden. Mr. Trump is not just soliciting Ukraine's help with, this, with his presidential campaign. He is using U.S. military aid the country desperately needs in an attempt to extort it. So that's September 25th. President on notice, scheme discovered, September 5th. September 7th, the evidence shows President Trump has a call with Ambassador Sondland, where the president made the corrupt bargain for military aid in the White House meeting even more explicit. On September 7th, Ambassador Sondland spoke to President Trump on the telephone. After that conversation, Ambassador Sondland called Tim Morrison, to update him on that conversation. Unlike Sondland, who testified that he never took notes, Morrison took notes of the conversation and recalled it during his public testimony. Let's listen. Now, a few days later, on September 7th, you spoke again to Ambassador Sondland, who told you that he had just gotten off the phone with President Trump. Isn't that right? That, that sounds correct, yes. 
What did Ambassador Sondland tell you that President Trump said to him? Uh, if I recall this conversation correctly, this was where um, Ambassador Sondland related that um, there was no quid pro quo, but President Zelensky had to make the statement and that he had to want to do it. And by that point, did you understand that the statement related to the uh, Biden and 2016 investigations? I, th I think I did, yes. And that that was a, a essentially a condition for the security assistance to be released? I understood that that's what Ambassador Sondland believed. After speaking with President Trump? That's what he represented. Now, you should bear in mind when Mr. Morrison says that's what he represented, that we asked Mr. Morrison about the president's calls with Ambassador Sondland, and he testified that every time he checked to see did Ambassador Sondland, in fact, talk with the president when he said that he did, that yes, in fact, he talked with the president. Every time he checked, he was able to confirm it. Now, let's let this sink in for a minute. According to Mr. Morrison's testimony, former Republican staffer on the Armed Services Committee, he speaks with Sondland on September 7th, and Sondland says he's just gotten off the phone with Trump, okay? So this is contemporaneous. Just got off the phone. Call is fresh in everybody's mind. And what was said? Morrison says, Ambassador Sondland related there was no quid pro quo, but President Zelensky had to make the statement, and he had to want to do it. No quid pro quo, but there's a quid pro quo. Now, there are notes that show this. There's a written record of this. There's a written record of what President Trump told Ambassador Sondland right after that call. Would you like to see that written record? It's called Mr. Morrison's Notes. It's right there for the asking. If these fine lawyers over here want to persuade you that call didn't happen or it wasn't said or all he said was no quid pro quo, he never said, but you have to go to the mic and you have to want to do it. Well, there's a good way to find out what happened on that call because it's in writing. Is there any question why they're withholding this from Congress? Is there any question about that? Uh, they didn't claim, well, Mr. Morrison didn't claim absolute immunity, and Mr. Sondland didn't claim absolute immunity. There's no absolute immunity over these notes, no executive privilege over these notes. The notes have already been described. The conversation's already been released. There's no even plausible, arguable, invented even excuse for withholding these notes. Wouldn't you like to see them? I tell you, in any courtroom in America, you'd get to see them. It should be no different. Wouldn't be any different in a fair trial anywhere in America. Morrison again informed Ambassador Bolton of this September 7th conversation, and guess what Ambassador Bolton said? I think you could probably figure this out by now. Go talk to the lawyers. Go talk to the lawyers. And yet again, for the third time, Morrison went to talk to the lawyers about this conversation with the Master Sondland. Morrison also called Ambassador Taylor to inform him about the conversation, and we have the testimony from Ambassador Taylor about their conversation, which is also based on his contemporaneous notes. Let's look at the conversation now between Mr. Morrison and Ambassador Taylor. According to Mr. Morrison, President Trump told Ambassador Sondland he was not asking for a quid pro quo. But President Trump did insist that President Zelensky go to a microphone and say he is opening investigations of Biden and 2016 election interference, and that President Zelensky should want to do this himself. Okay, so here we have two witnesses taking contemporaneous notes, both reflecting the same conversation. Conversation between Sondland and the President in which the
The president says no quid pro quo, but quid pro quo. There are documents that prove this, documents that prove this, that are yours for the asking. The following day, September 8th, Sondland texts Taylor and Volcker to bring them up to speed on the conversations with President Trump and subsequently President Zelensky, whom he spoke to after President Trump. Guys, multiple conversations with Z, meaning Zelensky, POTUS, let's talk. Sondland spoke to Taylor, but not Volcker shortly after this text. Ambassador, according to Ambassador Taylor, who testified again on his real-time notes, Let's hear what, that, what he said. The following day, on September 8th, Ambassador Sondland and I spoke on the phone. He confirmed that he had talked to President Trump, as I had suggested a week earlier, but that P President Trump was adamant that President Zelensky himself had to clear things up and do it in public. President Trump said it was not a quid pro quo. So it's all very consistent here, what the President said. No quid pro quo, but Zelensky must announce the investigations publicly, was what he was telling Sondland. No quid pro quo except for the quid pro quo. The president's attorneys rely on the first half of that sentence and would like you to forget the second half ever happened. But we don't have to leave our common sense at the door. We don't have to rely on an incomplete description of that call. We have instead the detailed notes of Mr. Morrison and Ambassador Taylor. But we also know what President Trump told Sondland because Sondland relayed that message to President Zelensky. During the same September 8 conversation with Taylor, Sondland described his conversation with President Zelensky. Here's Ambassador Taylor's account of it. Ambassador Sondland also said that he had talked to President Zelensky and Mr. Yermak and had told them that although this was not a quid pro quo, President Zelensky did not clear things up in public, we would be at a stalemate. I understood a stalemate to mean that Ukraine would not receive the much needed military assistance. Ambassador Sondland said that this conversation concluded with President Zelensky agreeing to make a public statement in an interview on CNN. So not only did he relate, Ambassador Sondland relate this conversation to Mr. Morrison, and Mr. Taylor, not only did Mr. Taylor, Ambassador Taylor, Mr. Morrison talk about it, but Sondland confirms that he's relayed this conversation to Zelensky himself. Everyone was now in the loop on the military aid being withheld for the political investigations. Taylor continued recalling the startling analogy Ambassador Sondland used to describe President Trump's approach to Ukraine. During our meeting, during our call on September 8th, Ambassador Sondland tried to explain to me that President Trump is a businessman. When a businessman is about to sign a check to someone who owes him something, the businessman asks that person to pay up before signing the check. Ambassador Volker used the same language several days later while we were together at the Yalta European Strategy Conference. I argued to both that the explanation made no sense. Ukrainians did not owe President Trump anything. Ambassador Taylor testified that at the end of the sondland zelensky conversation, President Zelensky said that he had relented and agreed to do a CNN interview to announce the investigations. So there was a breakthrough after all. The promised meeting wasn't enough. The withheld security assistance broke the logjam. Zelensky was going to go on CNN and announce the investigations. Taylor, though, remained concerned that even if the Ukrainian leader did as President Trump required, President Trump might continue to withhold the vital U.S. security assistance in any event. Ambassador Taylor texted his concerns to Ambassador Volker and Sondland, stating, the nightmare is they give the interview and don't get the security assistance the Russians love it, and I quit. I mean, that's quite telling, too. What's Ambassador Taylor worried about? He's worried the Ukrainians are finally going to agree to do it. They're going to make the announcement, and they're still going to get stiffed on the aid. 
At his deposition, Ambassador Taylor elaborated, the nightmare scenario, the nightmare is the scenario where President Zelensky goes out in public, makes an announcement that he's going to investigate Burisma and the interference in the 2016 election, maybe among other things, he might put that in some series of investigations, but the nightmare was he would mention those two, take all the heat from that, get himself in big trouble in this country, meaning Ukraine, or this country, meaning the United States, and probably in this country as well, meaning both, I guess, and the security assistance would not be released. That was the nightmare. If it were to happen, Taylor testified he would quit. Early in the morning in Europe on September 9th, which was 12.47 a.m. in Washington, D.C., Ambassador Taylor reiterated his concerns about the President's quid pro quo for security assistance in another series of text messages with Ambassadors Volker and Sondland. So here are the September 9th text messages. Taylor texts to Sondland, the message to the Ukrainians, parentheses, and Russians, we send with the decision on security assistance is key. With the hold, we have already shaken their faith in us. Thus, my nightmare scenario. And Taylor goes on and says, counting on you to be right about this interview, Gordon, meaning if they do it, you darn well better come through with the military aid. And Sondland says, Bill, I never said I was right. I said we are where we are and believe we have identified the best pathway forward. Let's hope it works. And Taylor said, as I said on the phone, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with a political campaign. Ambassador Taylor testified about what he meant. He said that to withhold that assistance for no good reason other than help with a political campaign made no sense. It was counterproductive to all of what we've been trying to do. It was illogical. It could not be explained. It was crazy. In response to Ambassador Taylor's text message, Sondland replies at about 5 a.m. in Washington. So the message from Taylor goes out at 12.47 a.m. The message back from Sondland comes at 5 a.m. So it looks like it may be five hours later. So Taylor has texted at 12.47 a.m. As I said on the phone, I think it's crazy to withhold security assistance for help with the political campaign. There he is again putting it in writing for crying out loud. Hadn't Sondland said to call him about this stuff? And so five hours later, you get this really interesting message from Sondland. Bill, I believe you're incorrect about President Trump's intentions. The president has been crystal clear. No quid pro quos of any kind. The president is trying to evaluate whether Ukraine is truly going to adopt the transparency and reforms that President Zelensky promised during his campaign. I suggest we stop the back and forth by text. In other words, can you please stop putting this in writing? Congress may read this one day. If you still have concerns, I recommend you give Lisa Kenna or S a call to discuss them directly. Thanks. Now, as you can see, Ambassador Sondland's subsequent testimony revealed that this text and other denials of a quid pro quo were intentionally false and simply designed to provide a written record of a false explanation that could later be used to conceal wrongdoing. The text message says there were no quid pro quos of any kind, but you've seen his testimony. He swore under oath he was crystal clear when he said there was a quid pro quo for the White House meeting, and he subsequently testified there was a quid pro quo for the security assistance as well, as confirmed by President Trump's direction to him on September 7th. Sondland's recollection of his conversation with President Trump, as I mentioned, has evolved over time. Initially in his deposition, he testified that the conversation with the President occurred between Taylor's text of September 9th at 12.47, Washington time in his response at 5 a.m. He recalled very little of the conversation at that time other than his belief that his text message reflected President Trump's response. Subsequently, though, and again, this is one of the reasons why you do depositions in closed session. Subsequently, after the opening statements of the testimony of Ambassador Taylor and Mr. Morrison were released, which described in overlapping and painful detail Sondland's conversation with President Trump on September 7th, Ambassador Sondland submitted an addendum 
to his deposition testimony, which in relevant part said this. Finally, as of this writing, I cannot specifically recall if I had one or two calls, phone calls with President Trump in the September 6 to 9 time frame. Despite repeated, repeated requests to the White House and the State Department, I have not been granted access to all of the phone records, and I would like to review those phone records along with any other notes and other documents that may exist to determine if I can provide a more complete testimony to assist Congress. However, although I have no specific recollection of phone calls during this period with Mr. Taylor, Ambassador Taylor, Mr. Morrison, I have no reason to question the substance of their recollection about my September 1 conversation with Mr. Yermak. During his public testimony, Ambassador Sondland purported to remember more of this conversation with President Trump. Although he stood, still couldn't or maintained he couldn't remember if it was on September 7th or September 9th. And according to his testimony, President Trump did not specifically say there was a quid pro quo, but when Sondland simply asked the President what he wanted from Ukraine, President Trump immediately brought up a quid pro quo. According to Sondland, President Trump said, I want nothing, I want no quid pro quo, I want Zelensky to do the right thing. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, I want him to do what he ran on. In his subsequent testimony, Ambassador Sondland explained that President Trump's reference to what he ran on was a nod to rooting out corruption. Here, however, corruption like Burisma has become code for the investigations that President Trump has sought. So you've got Ambassador Sondland's emerging recollection. But what you've got is actually written notes taken at the time that he does not contest. Written notes of Ambassador Taylor and Mr. Morrison. Notes which I believe will reflect quite clearly the understanding of dirt for dollars that was confirmed by this telephone call with President Trump. Well, you weren't dissuaded then, right? Because you still thought that the aid was conditioned on the public announcement of the investigations after speaking to President Trump. By September 8th, I was absolutely convinced it was. And President Trump did not dissuade you of that in the conversation I, that you acknowledged you had with him? I don't ever recall because that would have changed my entire calculus. If President Trump had told me directly, I'm not That's not what I'm this. asking, Ambassador Sondland. I'm just saying, you still believed that the security assistance was conditioned on the investigation after you spoke to President Trump, yes or no? From a time frame standpoint, yes. Okay, so, so here we have Sondland saying that whatever his recollection may be about that call, he was still very clear what the president wanted, and he was very clear there was a quid pro quo. That is consistent, obviously, with what Mr. Morrison has had to say and Ambassador Taylor. In other words, he didn't believe President Trump's denial of a quid pro quo, and neither should you. Sondland's understanding was further confirmed by President Trump's own chief of staff. On October, October 17, at a press briefing in the White House, Mick Mulvaney admitted that President Trump withheld the essential military aid for Ukraine as leverage to pressure Ukraine to investigate the conspiracy theory that Ukraine had interfered in the 2016 election. So um, that was, those were the driving factors. Did he also mention to me in the past that the, 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 the corruption related to the DNC server? Absolutely, no question about that. Um, but that's it, and that's why we held up the money. When pressed that he had just convinced of the very quid pro quo that President Trump had been denying, Mulvaney doubled down. Let's listen to that. But to be clear, what you just described is a quid pro quo. It is funding will not flow unless the investigation into the, into the Democratic server uh, happens as well. We, we, do, we do that all the time with foreign policy. This evidence demonstrates that President Trump withheld the security assistance in the White House meeting with President Zelensky until Ukraine made a public statement announcing the two investigations targeted to help his political reelection efforts. But as you will learn next, he got caught, and the cover up ensued.
Mr. Chief Justice and Senators, thank you for your patience. This is a lot of information, but you have a very important obligation, and that is ultimately to decide whether the President committed impeachable offenses. And in order to make that judgment, you have to have all of the facts. And so we're going through this chronology. We're close to being done. But it's important to know that uh, while all of this material was going on, these deals were being made, there were other forces at work. Even before the President's freeze on U.S. military assistance to Ukraine became public on August 28th, members of both houses of Congress began to express concern. On August 9th, the Democratic leadership of the House and Senate Appropriations Committee <clears throat> wrote to the OMB and the White House warning that a hold on assistance might constitute an illegal impoundment of funds. They urged the Trump administration to follow the law and obligate the funding. When the news of the frozen aid broke, on August 28th, congressional scrutiny of President Trump's decision increased. On September 3rd, a group of senators, both Republicans and Democrats, including Senator Gene Shaheen, Senator Rob Portman, Senator Dick Durbin, Senator Ron Johnson, Senator Richard Blumenthal, sent a letter to acting White House Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney expressing and I quote, deep concerns that the administration is considering not obligating the Ukraine Security Initiative Funds for 2000, uh, 2019. Two days later, as has been mentioned, on September 5th, a Washington Post editorial expressed concern that President Trump was, was withholding military assistance to Ukraine in order to pressure President Zelensky to announce these investigations. That was the first public report linking the frozen security aid to the investigations that Mr. Giuliani had been publicly pressing for and that President Trump, uh, Trump as we've heard, had privately urged President Zelensky to conduct on the July 25th call. That same day, Senators Murphy and Johnson met with President Zelensky in Kiev. Ambassador Taylor went with them, and he testified, Mr. Taylor testified, that President Zelensky's, quote, first question to the senators was about withheld security assistance. Ambassador Taylor testified that both senators, quote, stressed that bipartisan support for Ukraine and Washington was Ukraine's most important strategic asset, and that President Zelensky should not jeopardize that bipartisan support by getting drawn into U.S. domestic politics. Now, Senator Johnson and Senator Murphy later submitted letters where they explained that they sought to reassure President Zelensky that there was bipartisan support in Congress for providing Ukraine with military assistance and that they would continue to urge President Trump to lift the hold. Here is what they said in that letter. Senator Murphy said, Senator Johnson and I assured Zelensky that Congress wanted to continue this funding and would press Trump to release it immediately. And Senator Johnson in the letter said, I explained that I'd tried to persuade the President to authorize me to announce the hold was released, but that I was unsuccessful. Now, as news of the President's hold on military assistance to Ukraine became public at the end of August, Congress, the press, the public started to pay more attention to President Trump's activities with Ukraine. This risked exposing the scheme that you've heard so much about today. By now, the White House had learned that the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community had found that a whistleblower complaint related to the same Ukraine matter was, quote, credible and, quote, an urgent concern and was therefore, uh, that they were therefore required to send that 
complaint to Congress. On September 9th, three House investigating committees sent a letter to White House counsel Pat Cipollone stating that President Trump and Giuliani, quote, appear to have acted outside, pres outside legitimate law enforcement and diplomatic channels to coerce the Ukrainian government into pursuing two politically motivated investigations under the guise of anti-corruption activity. The letter also said this, if the president is trying to pressure Ukraine into choosing between defending itself from a Russian aggression without U.S. assistance or leveraging its judicial system to serve the ends of the Trump campaign, this would represent a staggering abuse of power, a boon to Moscow, and a betrayal of the public trust. The chairs requested that the White House preserve all relevant records and produce them by September 16th. This included the transcript, or actually the call record, of the July 25th call between President Trump and President Zelensky. Now, based on witness testimony, it looks like the White House Counsel's Office circulated the committee's document request around the White House. Tim Morrison, a senior director at the National Security Council, remembered seeing a copy of this letter. He also recalled that the three committee's Ukraine investigation was discussed at a meeting of senior level NSC staff soon after it was publicly announced. Lieutenant Colonel Vindman recalled discussions among, uh, among the NSC staff members that the investigation, and here is a quote, might have the effect of releasing the hold on Ukraine military assistance because it would be, quote, potentially politically challenging for the administration to justify that hold to Congress. Later that same day on September 9th, the Inspector General informed the House and Senate Intelligence Committees he determined that the whistleblower complaint that had been submitted on, Oct on August 12th appeared to be credible, met the definition of urgent concern under the statute, and yet he reported that for the first time ever, the acting director of national intelligence was withholding this whistleblower complaint from Congress. That violated the law, which required him to send it in seven days. The acting director later testified that his office initially withheld the complaint based on the advice from the White House and an unprecedented intervention by the Department of Justice. Now, according to public reporting and testimony from the acting DNI at a hearing before the House Intelligence Committee on September 26th, the White House had been aware of the whistleblower complaint for weeks prior to the IG's September 9th letter to the Intelligence Committees. Acting DNI McGuire testified that when he received the whistleblower complaint from the Inspector General, his office contacted the White House Counsel's Office for guidance. Consistent with acting DNI McGuire's testimony, the New York Times has reported that in late August, the President's current defense counsel, Mr. Cipollone, and NSC lawyer John Eisenberg personally briefed President Trump about the complaint's existence and told the President they believed the complaint could be withheld from Congress on executive privilege grounds. Now, on September 10th, the next day, Ambassador Bolton resigned from his position as National Security Advisor. On that same day, September 10th, Chairman Schiff of the House Intelligence Committee wrote a letter to the acting director demanding that he provide the complaint as the law required. The next day, on September 11th, President Trump lifted the hold on the security existence uh, to Ukraine. Now, numerous witnesses have testified that they weren't aware of any reason why the hold was lifted, just as there was no explanation for the hold being implemented. There was no additional review, no additional European contribution, nothing to justify the President's change in position except he got caught. Just as there was no official explanation for why the hold on Ukrainian assistance was implemented, 
Numerous witnesses testified that they were not provided with any reason for why the hold was lifted on September 11th. For example, Jennifer Williams, who was the special advisor to Vice President Pence, testified that she was never given a reason for that decision. Neither was Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. Here's what he told us during the hearing. Are you also aware, however, that the security assistance hold was not lifted for another 10 days after this meeting? That's correct. And am I correct that you ne didn't learn the reason why the hold was lifted? That's correct. Uh, Colonel Vindman, you didn't learn a reason why the hold was lifted either, is that right? Correct. Colonel Vindman, are you aware that the committees launched an investigation into Ukraine matters on September 9th, two days before the hold was lifted? I am aware, and I was aware. Ambassador Taylor, the person in charge at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev, who communicated the decision to the Ukrainians, also never got an explanation. Here's what he said. Are you also aware, however, that the security assistance hold was not lifted for another 10 days after this ninth. Finally, on September 11th, I learned that the hold had been lifted and security assistance would be provided. I was not told the reason why the hold had been lifted. Mark Sandy, a career officer at OMB, testified he only learned of a possible rationale for the hold in early September after the acting DNI had informed the White House about the whistleblower complaint. Now, Sandy testified that sometime in early September, he received an email from his boss, Michael Duffy. Approximately two months after the hold had been placed, the email, quote, attributed the hold to the president's concern about other countries not contributing more to Ukraine and requested, quote, information about what additional countries were contributing to Ukraine. This was a different explanation than OMB had provided at the July 26th interagency meeting that referenced concerns about corruption. Lieutenant Colonel testified that none of the facts on the ground about Ukrainian efforts to combat corruption or other countries' contribution to Ukraine had changed before President Trump lifted the hold. According to a press report, after Congress began investigating President Trump's scheme, the White House Counsel's Office opened an internal investigation relating to the July 25th call. The following slides provide excerpts from a report in the Washington Post. As part of that internal investigation, White House lawyers reportedly gathered and reviewed hundreds of documents that reveal extensive efforts to generate an after-the-fact justification for the hold on military assistance for Ukraine that had been ordered by the president. These documents reportedly include, quote, early August uh, email exchanges between Acting Chief of Staff Mick Mulvaney and White House budget officials seeking to provide an explanation for withholding the funds after the president had already ordered a hold in mid-July on the nearly $400 million in security assistance. The Washington Post article also reported that, and this, this is a quote, emails show OMB director Vought and OMB staffers arguing that withholding the aid was legal while officials at the National Security Council and State Department protested. OMB lawyers said that it was legal to withhold the aid as long as they deemed it a temporary hold. You should be able to see these documents, but the White House has withheld them from Congress. So the House can't verify the news report, but you could. You, you, you could do that if you could see these documents. You should subpoena them and there's no reason not to see all the relevant documents. Now, the lengthy delay created by President Trump's hold prevented the Department of Defense from spending all congressionally appropriated funds by the end of the fiscal year, as we've mentioned before. That meant the funds were going to expire on September 30th because, as we know, unused funds do not roll over 
to the next fiscal year. This confirmed the fears expressed by Cooper, Sandy, and others, concerns that were discussed within the relevant agencies in late July and throughout August, approximately, ultimately, $35 million of Ukraine military assistance, that's 14 percent of the DOD funds, remained unspent by the end of the fiscal year in order to make sure that Ukraine did not permanently lose the $35 million of critical military assistance that had been frozen by the White House, Congress had to pass a provision on September 27th, three days before the funds were to expire, to ensure that the remaining $35 million uh, could be sent to U Ukraine. Now, George Kent is an anti-corruption and rule of law expert. He told us that American anti-corruption efforts pri prioritize building institutional capacity, support for the rule of law, not the pursuit of individual investigations, particularly of political rivals. Here's how he explained their approach. U.S. efforts to counter corruption in Ukraine focus on building institutional capacity so that the Ukrainian government has the ability to go after corruption and effectively investigate, prosecute, and judge alleged criminal activities using appropriate institutional mechanisms. That is, to create and follow the rule of law. That means that if there are criminal nexuses for activity in the United States, U.S. law enforcement should pursue the case. If we think there has been a criminal act overseas that violates U.S. law, we have the institutional mechanisms to address that. It could be through the Justice Department and FBI agents assigned overseas, or through treaty mechanisms, such as the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty. As a general principle, I do not believe the United States should ask other countries to engage in selective politically associated investigations or prosecutions against opponents of those in power, because such selective actions undermine the rule of law, regardless of the country. Now, David Holmes concurred during his testimony. Holmes also compared the official approach that we believe in, that we uh, promulgate across the world, with what the President and Mr. Giuliani actually were doing. So our longstanding policy is to encourage them to establish and build uh, rule of law institutions that are capable and that are independent and that can actually pursue credible allegations. Uh, that's our policy. We've been doing that for quite some time with some success. Um, so focusing on particular cases, including particular cases where there is a, a, a interest of the president's, um, it's just not part of what we've done. Uh, it's hard to explain why uh, we would do that. Unfortunately, we do know the explanation. We know why President Trump wanted President Zelensky to announce investigations because it would help him in his election. Now, on September 18th, approximately a week before he was supposed to meet with President Trump at the United Nations General Assembly in New York, President Zelensky spoke by telephone with Vice President Pence. During her deposition, Jennifer Williams testified, and she is the, was Vice President Pence's um, assistant. She had testified that P Vice President Pence basically reiterated that the hold on aid had been lifted and asked a bit more about how Zelensky's efforts were going. Now, following her deposition and while preparing for her testimony at the open hearing on November 19th, Williams reviewed the documents. They've not been produced to us by the White House, and those documents refreshed her recollection of Vice President Pence's call with President Zelensky. Now, the White House blocked Williams from testifying about her refreshed recollections of the Vice President's call when she appeared at the open public hearing. They claimed that certain portions of the September 8th, 18th call, including the information that Williams wanted to tell us about, were classified. On November 26th, she submitted a classified addition to her hearing testimony, where she provided additional information about the Vice President's September 18th telephone call with President Zelensky. The Intelligence Committee provided this classified addition to the Judiciary Committee. 
It has been sent to the Senate for your review. Now, I've read that testimony. I'll just say that a cover-up is not a proper reason to classify a document. Vice President Pence has repeatedly said publicly that he has no objection to the White House releasing the actual transcript of his calls with President Zelensky, and yet his office has refused many requests by the committee to declassify William's addendum so the American people could also see the additional evidence about this call. We urge the senators to review it, and we ask again that the White House declassify it. As the House wrote in two separate letters, there is no basis to keep it classified. And again, in case the White House needs a reminder, it's improper to keep something classified just to avoid embarrassment or to conceal wrongdoing. Now, we've been through uh, a lot of facts today. We've seen uh, the President's scheme, a shakedown of Ukraine for his personal benefit. Uh, was, I believe, an obvious abuse of his power. But this misconduct, the scheme, became exposed. Congress asked questions. The press reported. Non-political officers in the government expressed concern. The whistleblower laws were activated. As this happened, there was an effort to create an after-the-fact misleading record to avoid responsibility for what the president had actually been doing. These were not the only efforts to hide misconduct, and the misconduct continued. Congressman Schiff will review some of those items. So we have about 20 minutes left in the presentation uh, tonight. I'd like to now go through with you the President's efforts to hide this corrupt scheme, even as it continued well into the fall of last year. On August 12th, a whistleblower in the intelligence community submitted a complaint addressed to the Congressional Intelligence Committees. This explosive document stated that President Trump had solicited foreign interference from Ukraine to assist in his 2020 re-election bid. The complaint alleged a scheme by President Trump to, quote, use the power of his office to solicit interference from a foreign country in the 2020 U.S. election. The complaint stated that the President had applied pressure on Ukraine to investigate one of the President's main domestic political rivals, and detail the involvement of the President's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. The complaint also stated that the whistleblower believed that the President's activities, quote, pose risk to U.S. national security and undermine the U.S. government's efforts to deter and counter foreign interference in U.S. elections. Under the law, the whistleblower was required to file the complaint with the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, which was then required to vet and assess the complaint and determine if it warranted reporting to the intelligence committees. The law gives the Inspector General 14 days to conduct an initial review and then inform the Director of National Intelligence about his findings. On August 26, the Inspector General sent the whistleblower complaint and the Inspector General's preliminary determination to the Acting Director of National Intelligence. The Inspector General wrote that based on a review, his review of the complaint, its allegations constituted an urgent concern and appeared credible under the statute. The Inspector General confirmed that the whistleblower acted lawfully in bringing the complaint and credibly raised a legitimate concern that should be communicated to the Intelligence Committees of Congress. The Director of National Intelligence quickly informed the White House about the complaint. Under the law, the acting director of national intelligence was required to forward the complaint and the inspector general's determination to the congressional intelligence committees no later than seven days after he received it. The legal requirement is extremely clear. 
Upon receipt of the transmittal from the ICIG, that is the Inspector General of the Intelligence Community, the director shall, within seven calendar days of such receipt, forward such transmittal to the Congressional Intelligence Committees together with any comments the director considers appropriate. Yet, despite the clear letter of the law, the White House mobilized to keep the information in the whistleblower complaint from Congress, including by inviting the Department of Justice to render an opinion as to whether the complaint could be withheld from Congress. The statutory deadline of September 2nd, when the inspector, when the Director of National Intelligence was required to turn it over to Congress, came and went, and the complaint remained hidden from Congress. Finally, on September 9th, a full week after the complaint was required to be sent to Congress, and once again, an urgent concern, the Inspector General, one week after it was required to be sent to Congress, the Inspector General wrote to the leaders of the intelligence committees to inform them that the Director of National Intelligence was withholding a whistleblower complaint in direct contravention of past practice and the law. On September 24th, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi announced that the House of Representatives is moving forward with an official impeachment inquiry. The next day, the House of Representatives passed a resolution calling on the Trump administration to provide the whistleblower's complaint immediately to the Congressional Intelligence Committees. Later that day, the White House publicly released the summary of the July 25th call between President Trump and President Zelensky and permitted the acting Director of National Intelligence to provide the whistleblower's complaint and related to documents to the Congressional Intelligence Committees. The President himself was happy to discuss the motivations for the scheme in public. That day, in a joint press availability with President Zelensky at the United Nations General Assembly, President Trump reiterated that he wanted Ukraine to investigate the Bidens. To do more on Joe Biden and investigate. No, I want uh, him to do whatever he can. This was not his fault. He wasn't there. He's just been here recently. But whatever he can do in terms of corruption, because the corruption's massive. Now, when Biden's son walks away with millions of dollars from Ukraine and he knows nothing, and they're paying him millions of dollars, that's corruption. When Finally, the day after President Trump explained to the public that he wanted Ukraine to investigate former, President, Vice, Pres former Vice President Biden, on the morning of September 26th, the Intelligence Committee publicly released declassified redactions of two documents, the whistleblower's August 12th complaint and the Inspector General's August 26th transmittal to the Acting Director of National Intelligence. Even after the impeachment inquiry into the Ukraine matter began, President Trump and his proxy, Rudy Giuliani, have continued to publicly urge President Zelensky to launch an investigation of Vice President Biden and alleged 2016 election interference by Ukraine. On September 30, during his remarks at the swearing-in of the new Labor Secretary, President Trump stated, Now, the new president of Ukraine ran on the basis of no corruption. That's how he got elected. And I believe that he really means it. But there was a lot of corruption having to do with the 2016 election against us. And we want to get to the bottom of it. And it's very important that we do. Thank you very much. So here he is. This meeting at the United Nations, September 30. And he's still pursuing this bogus crowd strike conspiracy theory with the president of Ukraine. On October 7, uh, 2nd, in a public press availability, President Trump discussed the July 25th call with President Zelensky and stated the conversation was perfect, it couldn't have been nicer. He then linked his notion of corruption with the Biden investigation. On October 3rd, in remarks before he departed on Marine One, President Trump expressed his hope that Ukraine would investigate Vice President Biden and his son. President Trump actually escalated his rhetoric, urging not only Ukraine to investigate the Bidens, but China too. Well, I would think that if they were honest about it, they'd start a major investigation into the Bidens. It's a very simple answer. Uh, they should investigate the Bidens, because how does a company 
that's newly formed and all these companies, if you look at, and by the way, likewise, China should start an investigation into the Bidens. Because what happened in China is just about as bad as what happened with, uh, with Ukraine. So I would say that President Zelensky, if it were me, I would recommend that they start an investigation into the Bidens. The same day, President Trump tweeted that he has an absolute right to investigate corruption. That really means is he feels he has an absolute right to investigate or get foreign countries to investigate his political opponents. The president sent a similar tweet the next day, once again linking corruption with the Biden investigation. As president, I have an obligation to end corruption, even if that means requesting the help of a foreign country or countries. It is done all the time. This has nothing to do with politics or a political campaign against the Bidens. This does have to do with corruption. I give him credit for being so obvious. This has nothing to do with politics or a political campaign against the Bidens, but you've got to investigate the Bidens. I guess that's just a coincidence. President Trump continued to demonstrate his eagerness to solicit foreign assistance related to his personal interest. Here's what's okay. He said, if we feel there's corruption, like I feel there was in the 2016 campaign, there was tremendous corruption against me. If we feel there's corruption, we have a right to go to a foreign country. President Trump added that asking President Xi of China to investigate the Bidens is certainly something we can start thinking about. Even last month, even last month, the president and Giuliani's scheme continued. During the first week of December, Giuliani traveled to Budapest, Kyiv, and Vienna to meet with the former Ukrainian government officials as part of a continuing effort to dig up dirt, political dirt, on Vice President Biden and advance the theory that Ukraine interfered in the 2016 election. Asked about his interviews of foreign Ukrainian prosecutors, Giuliani told the New York Times that he was acting on behalf of his client, President Trump. Quote, like a good lawyer, I am gathering evidence to defend my client against the false charges being leveled against him. Indeed, evidence obtained by the House from Giuliani's associate confirms that he had been representing himself in as early as May 2019 as President Trump's personal lawyer, doing Donald J. Trump's personal bidding in his dealings with Ukraine. This letter... May 10th, 2019, from Giuliani to Zelensky, says, among other things, however, I have a more specific request. In my capacity as personal counsel to President Trump and with his knowledge and consent, I request a meeting with you on this upcoming Monday, May 13th or Tuesday, May 14th. I will need no more than a half an hour of your time, and I will be accompanied by my colleague, Victoria Tensing, a distinguished American attorney who is very familiar with this matter. Please have your office let me know what time or times are convenient for you, and Victoria and I will be there. Well, this is evidence recently obtained showing his effort to get that meeting in May with Zelensky. Giuliani told the Wall Street Journal that when he returned to New York from this most recent trip on December 7th, President Trump called him as his plane was still taxiing down the runway. What did you get? He said, President Trump asked. More than you can imagine, Giuliani replied. Giuliani claimed that he was putting his findings into a 20-page report that the president had asked him to brief the attorney general and the Republicans in Congress. Shortly thereafter, on the same day, President Trump told reporters before departing on Marine One that he was aware of Giuliani's efforts in Ukraine and that Giuliani was going to report his purported findings to the Attorney General and Congress. Well, I just know he came back from someplace and he's going to make a report, I think, to the Attorney General and to Congress. He says he has a lot of good information. I have not spoken to him about that information, but Rudy, as you know, has been one of the great crime fighters of the last 50 years. And he did get back from Europe just recently. And I know he has not told me what he's found, 
but I think he wants to go before Congress and say, and also to the Attorney General and the Department of Justice, I hear he's found plenty. Yeah. Three days after that, uh, those remarks on December 10th, Giuliani confirmed to the Washington Post that President Trump had asked him to brief the Justice Department and Republican senators on his, quote, findings, unquote, from his trip to Ukraine. Giuliani stated, he wants me to do it. I'm working on pulling it together and hope to have it done by the end of the week. That Friday, December 13th, Giuliani reportedly met with President Trump at the White House. And on December 17th, Giuliani confirmed to CNN that President Trump has been very supportive of his efforts to dig up dirt on Vice President Biden in Ukraine and that they are on the same page. The following day, on December 18, 2019, the House of Representatives approved the two articles of impeachment you are considering in this trial. Since the House voted on these articles, evidence has continued to come to light related to the President's corrupt scheme. Among other things, Freedom of Information Act lawsuits, press reporting and documents provided to Congressman Rudy Giuliani, Associate Lev Parnas, further corroborate what we already know about the President's scheme. As Giuliani again said on December 17th, President Trump has been, quote, very supportive, unquote, of his efforts to dig up dirt on Vice President Biden, and they are, quote, on the same page. Harness further corroborated what we already know about President Trump's scheme, that he was responsible for withholding military aid and sustaining that hold, and that his personal attorney, Mr. Giuliani, was working at the direction of President Trump himself. On December 20th, new emails were released showing that 91 minutes after President Trump's call with the Ukrainian President Zelensky, a top Office of Management and Budget aide, asked the Department of Defense to withhold, to hold off on sending military aid to Ukraine. So those were new documents that came on December 20th. On December 29th, revelations emerged from OMB Director and Acting Chief of Staff McMulvaney's role about them, about that role in the delay of aid and efforts by lawyers at OMB, the Department of Justice, and the White House to justify the delay and the alarm that the delay caused within the administration. Those records just became available on December 29th. On January 2nd, newly unredacted Pentagon emails which raised serious concerns by Trump administration officials about the legality of the President's hold on aid became available. On January 6th, Former Trump National Security Advisor John Bolton announced that he would comply with a Senate subpoena compelling his testimony. His lawyers stated that he has new relevant information. On January 13th, reports emerged that the Russian government hacked the Ukrainian gas company Burisma, almost certainly in an effort to find information about Vice President Joe Biden's son in order to weaponize that information against Mr. Biden and in favor of Mr. Trump, just as Russia did against Secretary Clinton in favor of then-candidate Trump in 2016. That brings us up to January 13th of this year. Last week, House committees received new evidence from Lev Parnas that further demonstrates that the President was a central player in this scheme to pressure Ukraine for his political gain. And also last week, the Government Accountability Office found that President Trump violated the law when he withheld that aid. Last night, we had a further development when more redacted emails from the Office of Management and Budget were produced. I think Representative Crow showed you these. These are among the documents that were just released. I'm sure that if we could read under those redactions, it would be a very perfect email. But you have to ask, what is being redacted here? What is so important to keep confidential during the course of an impeachment inquiry? As you can see, right up until last night, evidence continues to be produced. The truth is going to come out. Indeed, the truth has already come out. But more and more of it will. 
More emails are going to come out. More witnesses are going to come forward. They're going to have more relevant information to share. And the only question is, do you want to hear it now? Do you want to know the full truth now? Do you want to know just who was in the loop? Sounds like everyone was in the loop. Do you want to know how broad this scheme was? We have the evidence to prove that President Trump ordered the aid withheld. He did so to coerce Ukraine to help his reelection campaign. He withheld a White House meeting to coerce the same sham investigations. We can and will prove President Trump guilty of this conduct and of obstructing the investigation into his misconduct. But you and the American people should know who else was involved in this scheme. You should want the whole truth to come out. You should want to know about every player in this sordid business. It is isn't within your power to do so. And I would urge you, even if you're prepared to vote to convict and impeach and remove this president, to find out the full truth about how far this corruption goes. Because I think the public has a right to know. Now, today, well, yesterday we made the case for why you should hear this additional evidence and testimony. This morning I introduced you to the broad sweep of the President's conduct. And then during the course of today, we walked you through a factual chronology uh, in real time about how this plot unfolded. And during that factual chronology today, you saw that in March of this year, Giuliani began that smear campaign against Ambassador Yovanovitch in order to get her fired by President Trump, something he would later admit was necessary to get her out of the way because she was going to be in the way of these two investigations. This is the supposed anti-corruption effort by the president to get rid of a woman who has dedicated her career to representing the United States, often in dangerous parts of the world, to fighting corruption and to promoting the rule of law. This plot begins with getting her out of the way, with the president saying that she's going to go through some things. This anti-corruption reformer, this U.S. patriot, this plot begins with getting her out of the way. And tellingly, and this says so much about the administration, tellingly, it wasn't enough just to recall her or fire her. The president could have done that, done that any time. No they wanted to destroy her because she had the audacity to stand in their way. So we heard in March about the effort to get rid of her, and it succeeded. And guess what message that sent to the Ukrainians about the power the president's lawyer has. The Ukrainians were watching this whole saga. They were hearing his interviews. They were seeing the smears that he was putting out. And this attorney for the president, working hand in hand with these corrupt Ukrainians, was able to get a U.N. ambassador yanked out of her job. Proof positive. You want a window to this president. You want an entree to this president. You want to make things happen with this president. You go through his lawyer. Never mind the State Department. Never mind the National Security Council. Never mind the Defense Department. You go through his lawyer. That's March. April. Zelensky has this huge victory in the presidential election. He gets a congratulatory call from the president. The president assigns Vice President Pence to go to the inauguration. May, Giuliani is rebuffed by Zelensky, cancels the trip to Ukraine, the one where he wanted to go, remember, meddle in the investigation. Because, Giuliani says, enemies of Trump surround Zelensky. 
guess that means he didn't get the meeting and they must be enemies of the president. Of course, the Ukrainians know why he wants that meeting. May, Trump disinvites Pence to the inauguration. Pence is going. Giuliani's rebuffed. Pence ain't going. That's May. Instead, May 23rd, we have this meeting at the White House, and there's a new, a new party in town, the Three Amigos. They're going to be handling the Ukraine portfolio. And they're told, work with Rudy. Work with Rudy. Ambassador Sondland, Ambassador Volker, Secretary Perry. Work with Rudy. And as you saw in June, Giuliani's pushing for these investigations. And they're trying to arrange these meetings and trying to make this happen. And also in June, the Defense Department announces they're going to release the military aid. And the President reads about this. And then he stops it. He stops the aid. In July, on July 10th, you heard in the chronology, there's that meeting at the White House. The meeting in which Sondland blurts out in this meeting between Ukrainians and Americans, hey, they've got a deal. They're trying to get this meeting, and there's a debate about whether the meeting's going to happen and when it's going to happen, and Sondland says, hey, we've got a deal with Mulvaney here. We're going to get this meeting, and you're going to do those investigations. And Bolton stiffens and abruptly ends the meeting. That was the first meeting that day, and then Sondland brings the delegation to a different part of the White House, and they have the follow-up meeting where he makes it even more explicit. This drug deal is made even more explicit. And Dr. Hill is told by Ambassador Bolton, you need to go talk to the lawyers. I don't want any part of this drug deal they're cooking up. That's July. July is the month where that email goes from Sondland to Pompeo and others and everybody is in the loop. July is the month where the hold is implemented with no explanation. July is the month where Mueller testifies about Russia's systemic interference in our affairs. July is the month after Mueller testifies that the president believes he has escaped accountability. The next day in July is, of course, the July 25th call in which the president asks for his favor. And July is the month, July 26th is the date of the call between President Trump and Ambassador Sondland. You know the one. Zelensky loves your ass. He'll do anything you want. Is he going to do the investigation? Yeah, he's going to do the investigation. July is the month of that conversation between Sondland and David Holmes, where Holmes says, can you, can you tell me candidly here what the president thinks of Ukraine? Does he give a blank about Ukraine? No, he doesn't give a blank about Ukraine. He only cares about the big stuff. Well, there's kind of big stuff here in Ukraine, like a war with the Russians. No, no, no. Big stuff that affects him personally, like the Biden investigation that Giuliani wants. That's the month of July. August, we have that meeting between Giuliani and Yermak in Madrid. August, we have the back and forth about the statement. No, you go first. And you commit and publicly announce the investigations, and then we'll give you a date. No, you go first. You give us the date, and then we'll announce the investigations. Well, we'll give you a statement that doesn't mention the specifics. No, no, you give us a statement that mentions the invest investigations. That's the month of August. August is also the month where it becomes clear that it's not just the meeting anymore. It's everything. Everything is conditioned on these investigations. The relationship, the money, the meeting. Sondland and Holmes testify. It's as simple as 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's August. September, Sondland says to Yermak, everything is conditioned on public announcement. So message delivered, no ambiguity. The Ukrainians are told quid pro quo. Taylor texts, this is crazy to withhold aid. 
September's the month, September 7th in particular, Trump and Sondland talk on the phone, and the president has that conversation where he says, no quid pro quo, except here's the quid pro quo. Zelensky's got to go to the mic, and what's more, he should want to do it. September is also the month where the investigations begin in Congress. September's the month where after those investigations begin, after the president knows he's been caught, the aid is finally released. And September is the month where Pence and Zelensky are on the phone and Jennifer Williams has classified information to share with you that I hope you will take a look at because it is relevant to these issues. That's September. October, Trump admits, yes, if it wasn't obvious enough, he wants Ukraine to investigate his political opponent. October is the month where he invites another nation, China, to investigate his opponent. This is the broad outline of the chronology that we went through today. Tomorrow, we will go through the law, the Constitution, and the facts as they apply to Article I. That is the plan for tomorrow. We've introduced the case. We've gone through the chronology, and tomorrow we will apply the facts to the law as it pertains to the president's abuse of power. And let me just uh, conclude this evening by remarking again on what brought us here. What brought us here is that some courageous people came forward. Courageous people that risked their entire careers. And one of the things that's been so striking to me about that is I watch these witnesses like Maria Ivanovich and Ambassador Taylor and David Holmes and others, Dr. Hill, is how much these dedicated officials were willing to risk their career, the beginning of their career or the middle of their career or late in their career, when they had everything to lose. But people senior to them who have every advantage, who sit in positions of power, lack that same basic commitment, lack that same basic willingness to put their country first and expose wrongdoing. Why is it that Colonel Vindman, who worked for Fiona Hill, who worked for John Bolton and Dr. Kupperman, why is it that they were willing to stick their neck out and answer lawful subpoenas when their bosses wouldn't? I don't know that I can answer that question, but I just can tell you I have such admiration for the fact they did. I think, and, 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 I, and I think this is some form of cosmic justice that this ambassador that was so ruthlessly smeared is now a hero for her courage. There is justice in that. But what will really vindicate that leap of faith that she took is if we show the same courage. They risked everything, their careers. And yes, I know what you're asked to decide may risk yours too. But if they could show the courage, so can we. I yield back. Uh, pursuant to the provisions of Senate Resolution 243 of the 100th Congress, 
a single one-page classified document identified by the House managers for filing with the Secretary of the Senate that will be received on January 22, 2020, shall not be made part of the public record and shall not be printed, but shall be made available pursuant to the standing order from the 100th Congress. The Majority Leader is recognized. Mr. Chief Justice, colleagues, we're almost through for the evening. Uh, we'll convene again at 1 o'clock uh, tomorrow. Before we adjourn, I'd like to acknowledge that tomorrow is the official last day for this term Senate pages. This group of... <laughs> in, in addition to witnessing this uh, unusual event that we're all experiencing, they're, they're studying for their final exams as well, and we wish them well as they head off uh, back to boring, normal high school. <laughs> uh, Mr. Leader, let me just add my thanks and gratitude for all of us. It is rare, particularly these days, when 100 senators from both sides of the aisle of every political persuasion get up and give someone a standing ovation. <laughs> But you deserve it. Thank you for your good work, and we hope you have beautiful and successful lives. <clears throat> so, Mr. Uh, Chief Justice, I ask unanimous consent that on Tuesday, January the 28th, from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m., while the Senate is sitting as a court of impeachment, and that notwithstanding the Senate's adjournment, <clears throat> the Senate can receive House messages and executive matters committees be authorized to report legislation and executive matters, and senators be allowed to submit statements for the record, bills, resolutions, and co-sponsor requests, and where applicable, the Secretary of the Senate on behalf of the printing of the presiding officer be permitted to refer such matters. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, finally, I ask unanimous consent that the trial adjourn until 1 p.m. Thursday, January 23rd, and this also constitute the adjournment of the Senate. Without objection, so ordered. Senate is adjourned. <laughs>